he, he texted. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to our 8.30 a.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the December 11th, 2018 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the City Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the Council members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for the closed session. I'd now like to ask the Clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Crone is absent. Matthews is currently absent. Chase? Here. Brown? Here. Norian? Here. Vice Mayor Watkins is currently absent, and Mayor Terrasa. Here. Before we open public comment, I have a brief announcement. The city attorney will provide a report on items listed on the closed session agenda at the beginning of the 9 a.m. session. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to any items listed on the closed session agenda? Now I'd like to turn it over to the city attorney for any additional comments. Yes, thank you, Mayor Terrazas, members of the city council. Um, I, I would request that by motion, the council add three subsequent need items to the closed session agenda. The first two are uh, threatened litigation items. Uh, you've received correspondence relating to both items 26 and 27 on your afternoon, morning, afternoon agenda, uh, threatening litigation uh, relating to those two items. The third is a pending litigation matter uh, entitled State of California X Rel Martinez versus Monterey Peninsula Engineering. Um, the, the basis for adding those is that the need for action uh, arose subsequent to the posting of the agenda and um, there is also a necessity for the council to take action or give direction um, prior to the next regularly scheduled meeting. Thank you. Is there a motion to add those three subsequent need items to the closed session agenda? So moved by Councilman Matthews, and I'll second that. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. See no public comment, we'll, we'll now um, recess to the public, uh, to our closed session. Passes with? Unanimous with um, Council Member Crone and Vice Mayor Watkins absent. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our now 904 session of the December 11th, 2018 meeting of the City Council. I'd now like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Crone. He's here. Here. Matthews. Here. Chase. Here. Brown. Here. Noroyan. Here. Vice Mayor Watkins is currently absent. And Mayor Terrazzo. Here. And if the clerk would now please uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are, there are no um, new employees to introduce, so at this time it is my pleasure to um, introduce the Jim House Community Service Award. Um, the Officer Jim Howe's Community Service Award. It's an annual award that is uh, given to community members and city employees for outstanding service to the city of Santa Cruz. The award was created in honor of Officer Jim Howe, who retired in 2007 after serving as a Santa Cruz police officer for nearly two, 26 years. He was known throughout the city for his positive approach and partnership building between the city and Santa Cruz community. The Officer Jim Howe's Community Service Award honors his legacy of positive collaborative problem solving. Recipients of this award are found to, one, exhibit extraordinary dedication and efforts towards improving the quality of life in Santa Cruz. Through constructive, solution-oriented work. They also work in collaboration with the city or city departments and other community stakeholders. 
and embody a spirit of cooperation between the city and community and set a positive tone that inspires and motivates others. After this year's nomination process in which many impressive and worthy community members and city employees were nominated, a sec selection committee, which consisted of Deputy Chief uh, Rick Martinez and Santa Cruz Warriors President Chris Murphy and myself, um, chose two honorees in each categories for 2018. In the city employee category, um, we uh, recognize Sergeant Scott Garner and Susie O'Hara. Yeah. And in the community member category, we recognize Paul Martin and Robert Arizzi. At, at this point in the agenda, I'm gonna turn it over to, in just a moment, to Vice Mayor Watkins, and um, we'll step down and hear a little bit about each of those uh, recipients. Um, I can tell you that um, one, I was uh, grateful, I received the Jim Howes Award, I think in 2008, and it's really something where I feel very proud and honored, and I'm really happy that to be here to, to recognize each of the recipients today. So, I will step down and, Good morning. So it's my honor to um, first recognize Scott Garner, city employee recipient. <laughs> Sergeant Garner has been with the police department for more than 20 years. Colleagues, neighbors, and community members share their experiences of, of Sergeant Garner's willingness to step up and lead complex projects and volunteer his time in the community. Whether partnering with neighbors to address issues, training new PD volunteers, serving as a criminal justice instructor in the county schools, volunteering with youth for Special Olympics, or dedicating countless hours of off-duty time to organize and run the annual Police Officers Association Golf Tournament to benefit our local youth, Sergeant Goner works tirelessly to collaborate with community stakeholders. Thank you so much for your service, Sergeant Connor. Thank you. I just want to say thank you. This is an honor. Uh, we all work very hard, and it takes a village. It really does. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> the city employee recipient is Susie O'Hara. has been with the city for eight years. When the city was facing the challenges, challenging task of sitting, establishing, and managing the River Street Camp to offer stability and services to the homeless members of our community, Susie stepped up and she got it done. She spent countless hours planning and managing the River Street Camp, making sure the, res the residents had meals, access to services, and bathroom and shower facilities. As a result of Susie's outstanding work, Many members of the River Street Camp community went on to successful outcomes, with 56% of the 130 people who lived in the River Street Camp at one time or another moving on to better living situations. Thank you for your service, Susie. do have a few prepared remarks. Um, 
Bonnie, you can put the timer on for three minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, written, but no less heartfelt. I want to thank Mayor Tarasas and Vice Mayor Watkins and the entire council for this honor. Thank you to Amanda for the nomination and the selection team for um, their recommendation. I'm so happy to share this recognition with two friends and colleagues, Scott and Robert, and Mr. Martin, who I don't know, but I know is well-deserving and has certainly, they all have served the community with honor and dignity. I won't take much time because I know that our, our today's agenda is very full, but I do have a few words to share. And I'm gonna get emotional like Chip last year. It's his fault. <laughs> After a long year of dedicating myself and my work to some frankly monstrous tasks, I've learned a few things that I think are important to reflect on. First, never be afraid of tackling even uh, really difficult and even unimaginable, ta unimaginable tasks, even if you basically have no idea what you're doing, <laughs> when you have the potential of doing something good and something lasting. Spending this year building the River Street Camp, being immersed in his community of staff and campers, and learning about how best to tackle this vexing challenge of around homelessness has been the singularly most gratifying and painful experience of my career and taught me to be brave, uh, learn from others, and lean on my colleagues to help. I thank Mike Hopper, who I don't think is here, but hopefully he will hear this, especially for being an exceptional partner in this process from conception to breakdown. To all my, <coughs> the other countless city staff who lent their expertise along the way, and to the River Street Camp Managers, Chris Monteith, and Adam Carruthers, along with many other staff, some of whom are here today, who I relied so heavily on, to share their skills and experiences as the camp was built and flourished. Second, it's easy for you to have, uh, for people to have faith in you when you have faith in yourself. To this end, I thank Martine and Tina <laughs> uh, for saying, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. When I said, I think we can run this camp. <laughs> what a leap, leap of faith. In fact, Tina and Martine have been gently nudging my path in this direction since my fellowship year in 2013 and have always been supportive of, of me as I've navigated my career from water engineer to analyst to assistant to the city manager. It's their leadership that has given me this faith in myself. Uh, third, modeling honest, strong, and compassionate leadership goes a long way in building trust, trusting relationships with those that you work with in the community. No better example is my relationship with the Downtown Streets team. <laughs> I mean, their amazing staff and team members I've had the honor of working with for the last 18 months. The team not only has made a huge difference in our town, and they came over with their pickers to be here today, but also helped make the River Street Camp a success through serving as camp hosts and making and maintaining the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you especially to Greg Penzinger, who just last week announced that he's moving on to Modesto to start a new team there, and to Brooke Newman for taking the reins and being my CAPVA chair for the last couple years. Their partnership means the world to me. And lastly, public service is an honorable profession and we should be grateful for to serve in the ways that we do and share those experiences with those we love. I've been able to share, <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been able to share my work with my daughters this last year in several in ways that I never would have imagined. Casey, don't cry. <laughs> they spent time with me at the camp, had long conversations with campers, and learned about their lives, and saw many lives transformed before their eyes. Those are important experiences that may give them inspiration to serve others and the communities they build their lives in. I think Maeve, who's not here, She's taking the geometry test. Bridget and Farron, who are here, um, for being curious and open to learning and listening. And most importantly, I want to thank my husband, Matt, <laughs> for his steadfast, steadfast support of my career and aspirations along a pretty windy path. I'm so lucky to have your partnership for the last 30 plus years. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susie, that was beautiful. So now I um, have the honor to um, recognize Paul Martin, the community recipient. Paul has volu been voluntarily removing and cleaning graffiti in the city of Santa Cruz for the past 20 years. Each day, Paul sets out on his bike, tirelessly looking for and repairing graffiti. He spends four to eight hours a day on repairs, paying for the materials out of his own pocket. Paul is an inspiration to public service. Thank you so much for your service to our city, Paul.
Yes, it is an ongoing activity, that is for sure. It's, um, uh, anyone can participate. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, I wanna thank Damon Bruder who uh, nominated me and uh, of course, uh, economic development, they, they do supply me. I don't buy all my own goods, they supply me. And it is, uh, <laughs> it's hard to describe just how much is out there until uh, you really get in and see uh, the depth and the breadth of it. it uh, I would like to see the city actually put a little more emphasis on uh, correction and possibly apprehension. <laughs> But it is, uh, I wanna thank the city for this award and it is, uh, uh, it does occupy about 20 hours a week uh, for me. So it is, uh, it's meaningful. And uh, I would, again, emphasize that we could use more volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for that and um, for making our community experience cleaner and for your time. At this time, it's my honor to now recognize Robert Arizzi, community recipient. Robert takes on projects big and small to make Santa Cruz a better place to live. Whether serving as a volunteer at the police department or helping a group of neighbors collaborate with the public works department to create more crosswalks and bike paths on Broadway Street or partnering with neighborhood businesses like Safeway to keep their neighborhoods safe. Robert is an example of community mindedness who continues to work to make Santa Cruz a better place every single day. Thank you so much for your service, Robert. I'm being forced to say a few words. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, okay, so my story is I came here in the 70s as a hippie, <laughs> and now it's my time to give back to the city. So when I entered semi-retirement in 2009, I started finding um, projects that I was interested in. I got really involved with neighbors. Uh, Santa Cruz Neighbors has been a great vehicle for me to reach out throughout the city and hear and listen and to work with neighbors and to connect with city staff and council. And it's really a pleasure to work with staff and with council. My, my method of work is to work in collaboration. And I'm very grateful for your open doors, for everybody answering my emails, answering my phone calls, giving your time to meet with me. Uh, it it's really means a lot, and I think we get a lot done together. I'd also at this time like to thank my partner, Steve, who makes it possible for me to have all this extra time to get out and do these meetings. I was in these chambers last night on a commission meeting till after 10, parked in the same place this morning. And also, <laughs> I would like to um, recognize the council members. I mean, you guys have been here already at 8.30 to start your work meeting. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing what you feel is best for the city. I know we differ on many different um, opinions, but it means a lot to me to know that people in our city are willing to step up and to donate so much of their, their selves for the betterment of the city. And let's keep on working together. And one other thing, I'm very involved also, as Susie is with the Downtown Streets team. <laughs> I'm very tickled that they're here today and it's really wonderful to see them and have them and I'm gonna take this opportunity for a plug. We are launching this week our 2018 giving tree for the Downtown Streets team's members. So I'm uh, in the process of getting collections and gifts for the team members and if anybody wants to help me out on that, just get in touch with me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
What a really nice way to start the day. I mean, we have a long day, and I think this really sets a nice tone for us for the rest of the afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank Jim Howes, who's not with us today, but for providing the inspiration for the award. I mean, it really means a lot to see these community members and their engagement um, in Santa Cruz. I think the descriptions that were read just touched on uh, a brief amount of their work. I can. I can attest that um, Susie O'Hara was uh, a leader in the public safety uh, committee uh, meetings that took place several years ago and has been active in a lot of um, city managers work, not just related to what's happening now. So this is a longstanding um, thread that continues uh, of service to this day. I know that um, I can tell you that um, Sergeant Garner is constantly at work um, in the community. I've attended meetings with him um, at all parts of the city, different neighborhoods, talking about um, solutions for traffic issues and neighborhood um, outreach. So I really think it's important to kind of know that these awards really kind of signify their work out in the field. And then for um, Paul, you might see him around town um, riding a bicycle with his grandkids, you know, showing them how to be good um, service-minded people um, so that they kind of have those same values in their, in their lives moving forward in, in the city. And then of course, um, with Robert, he's not only active um, on our commission, as he mentioned, he's been an active board member with Santa Cruz Neighbors, the UCSC Long Range Development Plan, Community Advisory Group, um, he's also been a supporter of the Downtown Streets team and also been really actively involved in Santa Cruz Pride with the police department. Um, it's a program for teens at risk of joining gangs. And so, I mean, it, we touched on a few of the examples they did, but I really want to, again, uh, congratulate each of the recipients today. And I think we should all give them a round of applause. That brings us to the to main meeting, and if anyone, you're welcome to stay the rest of the day. We'll be here probably. You could you could come in and out as you'd like, but um, <laughs> but I know that now might be a good time if you want to exit just to kind of uh, transition. Nobody, here. bye. Congratulations. Okay, um, I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting for the day. I'll just pause as we. Uh, okay. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Mike Oliphant, who hasn't been here in a while, but he's here today, he'll be here for the day uh, recording our meeting. He's our technician for both this morning, afternoon, and evening. And I'd like to thank him in advance for his work and, and hopefully his commitment at this time that he'll be here throughout the day. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize um, our Jim Howes Community Award recipient, Scott Garner, who's in the back getting congratulations. He's not only the award recipient today, but he's also serving as our Sergeant of Arms for all day long, so thank That's you. That's his reward? That's his reward. Yeah. So we can see him and congratulate him between breaks. Um, all city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com if you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item. We'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens, whether you are inside or outside of the chambers. At this point in the meeting, I'd like to ask if there's any statements of disqualifications um, by any council members today. Seeing none, um, I'll ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions. There are none. Okay. A big agenda packet, so I'm gonna have to monitor the pages. 
In regards to oral communications, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will generally occur at the conclusion of our afternoon business at or about 5.30 p.m., but may occur sometime before then. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements regarding today's agenda. Um, agenda item number 26, the Laurel Front Pacific Avenue permit item, will be heard at a time certain of 11 a.m. And also, due to today's very full agenda, we'll look at some taking lunch sometime around 1 p.m. or so um, before we uh, move on to the next portion of the agenda. And in, ad in addition, we'll be recessing at or before 6 p.m., and then we'll return um, for our 7 p.m. session later this evening. Any questions? No. Okay, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the city attorney for their uh, report on closed session. His report on closed session, I should say. Thank you, Mayor Terrazas, members of the city council. Um, this morning, there were three uh, subsequent need items added to the closed session agenda before the council went into closed session at 8.30. Uh, the first two involved a significant exposure to litigation. Um, the, the council received letters uh, threatening to challenge decisions that the council may make with respect to items 26 and 27 on uh, this morning's agenda. Those are the 100 Laurel Street uh, project and the large rent increase ordinance second reading. Uh, the, th the third item was a matter of pending litigation entitled the State of California X Rel Martinez versus Monterey Peninsula Engineering. That is a case that's uh, brought by a private plaintiff on behalf of several public entities against Monterey Peninsula Engineering related to uh, uh, false claims act or alleged false claims act violations. Uh, this morning, the council authorized the plaintiff to dismiss that action on behalf of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and that matter is pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court, case number 16 CV 00267. That results as a, um, as a result of a settlement between Martinez and the defendant Monterey Peninsula Engineering in that case. The council voted unanimously to uh, accept the dismissal of that uh, litigation. And there was no reportable action taken on the two threatened litigation items. Uh, lastly, there is the claim of Gabriel Sousa Barbosa. That is also uh, agenda item 10 on uh, the open session agenda. Um, there was no action taken on that claim. Thank you. Uh, can I just get clarification on the vote? Because I know there were some absences in closed session. So right. did anybody show up late? Uh, I said unanimous. Council Member Watkins uh, joined that meeting. Council Member uh, Crone was absent. Okay. Uh, but Council Member Watkins was not present for the vote to accept the settlement. So it was unanimous of the Council Members present, uh, with the exception of Council Members Watkins and Crone. Do you have any other questions? Okay, any other questions at this time? Okay, then I'll move on to the uh, main agenda. First up is the consent agenda. These are items number two through 23 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to pull any of the consent items on today's agenda? You want council member Brown? Uh, I'd like to discuss the uh, budgetary policy and um, number 13, raising the minimum wage. Okay, so that workers, no, so five, 13, and uh, the jump bike contract amendment. What number is that? 18. Okay, so five, 13, and 18. So I'll pull those from the consent. Any other? Council, Council I just Brown? Have, I just have a quick question on item nine. I, I have a comment too on um, number six. Okay, do you want to um, ask that comment, uh, to make that comment now, or do you wait? Sure. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I think this is a great thing that, that has been brought forward here. This is a resolution opposing any future policy change under the federal Title IX law that would reduce or erase legal recognition for, of the protection of, for transgender people. I think that this is um, 
takes very little time. I think that it says who we are as a community. I really um, am proud that um, we're getting behind this. Uh, thank you, Cynthia Chase, for bringing it forward. This is, I just wanted to read two whereas's because I think they're really important. Whereas the proposed changes in Title IX's definitions threaten policies that protect people of all genders, ad identities, and education, labor, and housing, including assisted care facilities, shelters, foster care housing, and whereas the city of Santa Cruz is committed to providing safe and affirming services to all members of our community, regardless of gender identity. And I think that's the way, you know, we stand up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Brown. So, yeah, quick question on um, the year-end budget adjustments for the, this fiscal year. Um, the And thank you to um, Director Pimentel for clarifying some of those questions in advance. I, my only um, additional question is if you could tell us a little bit more about the professional services adjustment. This is in the amount of $137,259, just to get a sense of what those, um, Nine, those uh, Nine, services were. And thank you, I, I had, my other question was related to legal and you answered that previously. So. Yeah, they're actually, those are one and the same. Uh, we had, yes, okay. uh, there were higher, than anticipated legal requests during fiscal 2018. For, there were a lot of different council actions and that required additional research beyond what was programmed in. So it was those additional requests. So this is not related to other outside consultants or no. anything? This is no. all related to the legal con then Thank you. Okay. So at this point, I'd like to turn it up. Um, actually, one thing, I'm gonna pull number two, the minutes from the uh, November 27th meeting. Um, so. Uh, um, any members of the public that would like to speak to any items other than 2, 5, 13, or 18, now is your time to speak. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for deliberation and action. I'll move the consent agenda with the exceptions of 2, 5, 13, and 18. That is items 2 through 13 with those exceptions. Okay, seconded by um, Vice Mayor Watkins. Any further discussion? <laughs> Um, all those in favor of the consent item, moving the consent item with the exceptions of items 2, 5, 13, and 18, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Um, just to clarify, items um, 2 and 3 were both minutes where Councilmember Chase was absent for one and Councilmember Naroyan was absent for the other. So Which one was uh, Council Member, Council Member uh, Chase? Chase was absent for the tw November 27th. Okay, Have, did you watch the video? Okay, and then um, Naroyan, you were absent for the December 4th special meeting. I did not rehabilitate myself. Oh. I love, that just sounds so. She's abstaining on um, yeah. number uh, three, right? That was number three? Okay. So on item number two, I just wanted to make sure the record was clear. When we had the discussion about the tobacco, um, uh, the flavored tobacco ban, there was two ordinances that were brought forward. One had the, the, um, the language regarding youth possession struck. And the direction, that why we did that was to have um, the uh, police department contacted in regards to any impact regards to striking that language. I just wanted the record to reflect that the um, police, uh, the um, city manager's office contacted the police department and they reported back that there was no problem striking that language. Um, because the record does reflect that um, it's gonna come back and have it reviewed again, but that was how it was presented and I just wanna make sure the records reflect that. Okay. Yeah, so um, given that uh, comment, um, I'd like to move adoption of those minutes. That's item number two with inclusion of language uh, expressing that the police department was consulted and felt there was no negative impact from deletion of that language. Second. Okay, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, is there any member of the public that would like to speak to item number two? Seeing none, I'll bring it back. Um, there's a motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by um, Vice Mayor Watkins. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Um, now we'll turn over to item number five, which is the City Council Ad Hoc Budget Committee. Um, and that was pulled by Council Member Crone. And I'll, um, I'll ask, uh, what was your question, Council Member Crone? Uh, no, it's, it's really, it's philosophical. It means this is a, quite a document in front of us. And um, I, it, I mean, the council's never, talked about this, I know, yeah, I guess your subcommittee did, but I'd love to hear some feedback on, uh, there seems to be absent here, we've been putting a lot of 
emphasis on climate change, and there's no, I don't see any reference to that here. Um, I would say also this full cost recovery needs to be fleshed out. What does that mean exactly? And in what, what instances will we do full cost recovery because not all uh, departments or what services that are provided are, are equal. So mm. it, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that exactly means. Um, yeah, well, maybe before we get into the substantive um, responses, um, are, do you, does any of the committee, member, committee members would they like to speak about you know some of the work and how this has come forward in the past? We've had a couple public discussions about it when we were going through the bu budget process. We talked about each of these actions coming forward um, in regards to policy changes as well as expanded outreach and as a way to kind of address how we handle budgets moving forward. So we're not necessarily having the, the intensive uh, internal meetings where we have staff present. This is more externally focused on bringing more community members in to look at how our budget process works. And part of the recommendations were that we have um, adopted policies that reflect that as our intent moving forward. So Council Member Brown. I mean, I would just say having been involved as a member of that subcommittee and, you know, working through this, that, you know, I mean, I think the intention here, in addition to uh, the goal of really making the uh, streamlining, in some respects, the, the budget hearing process, but also making it more accessible to the public, um, that having this kind of policy was really an attempt to reflect some principles that, you know, may or may not, I mean, I, I don't think this is in any way binding if, you know, there, I and I have actually an, an issue on one small matter related to one-time spending, re, one-time resources need to be matched with one-time spending, because we know that, like, when it comes to core funding and some other places, we, we sometimes use ongoing funds for one-time allocation. So I don't think the intention was to make this a binding document and we cannot go outside of it, but to say these are the principles that we um, believe the city should follow and that we should follow um, as council members to be um, fiscally responsible and ensure that our budget is balanced. So I, I mean, I think just, that was really the, the impetus behind this. I'll just echo those comments that it's just sort of a general kind of guideline and structure to follow, knowing that sure, things change and circumstances differ in terms of various things, but in, uh, in essence, since this is sort of the process we hope to have in place moving forward based on what we learned this prior year. Uh, uh, the, for example, community programs is missing from here. Like uh, a dedication, I don't know, of our city. And it, it, I don't know, this document seems like it's, it's stating some philosophy here or like you said, guidelines. And the, the climate and community programs are two things I'd like to see included in, in statements that, that our city makes because I think that that is what our our community would like to see also. Council Member Brown. I just, uh, you know, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, however, I don't know that this is necessarily a place where we would do that because there are all kinds of areas in which I'd like to uh, see the city make uh, additional commitments related to how, you know, our budgeting process. But I'm not sure that this base document is the place for that. I mean, so if you want to work on, you know, and I think we, will probably do that in the future um, around some of those issues. I'm very much interested. Okay, that, that's, that's, I just want a clarification on what exactly this is, um, and I appreciate um, the comments. Yeah, uh, are there any members of the public that would like to speak to this item? This is number five, it's a city council ad hoc budget <coughs> committee. Anyone? Okay, I'll, I'll bring it back to the council for discussion. Council member Matthews. Um, I just want to thank the committee for working on this, and it is a general document. There plenty of areas that could be called out specifically, but I think this is not the place to do it. Um, I want to thank the committee, um, and I noticed that these principles were drawn from the charter council policies, best practices, et cetera, et cetera, and to my mind, they're just consistent with what we've done uh, in different settings related to budget decisions and practices. So it's, I think it, it gives the public confidence that there's a, a concise statement of how we're approaching our budget issues. Apart from the specifics, this is the general uh, overall approach. So with those comments, I'll go ahead and move acceptance of I'll second. Uh, this item. I'll second and I'll also say that this was probably one of the, the best committees I worked on. I think it was just something where we worked really well together and I agree with um, 
of uh, Council Member Matthews, this is not intended to, to create a lock us in on certain positions. It's really about being more externally focused to bring in different groups to see how we're doing. I know that when we had our discussion with that first focus group, many of them were interested in uh, what are certain outcomes that we see from the city as part of our budget process. So they brought to light a lot of issues and I look forward to seeing this work continue um, during the coming budget year and actually freeing up staff maybe from some of the presentation and work that may not have been as impactful in terms of getting uh, out, the, getting the word out to the public as far as how they could be more involved in kind of how we're, how we're looking at our budget. Any other further discussion? Um, I, d I do want to mention something quickly because the question was raised about the full cost recovery. And this is not, as you say, a lock, uh, lockstep um, mandate, but it does reflect many, many discussions we've had about revisiting our fee structure and so forth so that we are uh, recovering our, our fees. But we, on a number of occasions, have the uh, option and do take action to reduce or eliminate those fees for a specific reason. So it, it's a general guidance, but it's not uh, um, hard and fast. Right. Okay, Council Member Crone. Um, I'm, I'm probably just going to register a no vote because I don't pr understand this. It seems too rigid to me, like, and, it, and, and I just thought it needed more uh, massaging and uh, a fuller discussion by the by the city council rather than just having it at the subcommittee and then come to the council on the consent agenda. But I just that, that's uh, that's just me. I just I'm not I'm not understanding enough about it. Okay, no problem. Okay, so all those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that motion um, passes with Council Member uh, Crone voting no, Council Member Matthews, Chase, uh, Brown, Naroyan, and Vice Mayor Watkins and myself um, uh, supporting the motion. Okay, next we'll move on to item number 13, which is the resolution amending the City of Santa Cruz personnel complement and classification and compensation plans. Council Member Crone. I just wanted to hear a little bit from um, our uh, HR Director, uh, Lisa Murphy, and. and talk about, you know, really we're talking about the lowest paid workers here and um, despite that they might be 17, 18 year olds, also there, uh, there's a, you know, a category right above them that, you know, I'm concerned about as well that, you know, do live off these paychecks and not just, you know, and, and maybe their families uh, depend on them as well. And I know that the last two, well, uh, campaigns were about the fight for $15 an hour and, um, my thoughts are, you know, wouldn't it be nice if the city could lead on that? And, you know, and, and, and it did at one point, you know, we do have a, um, a living wage built into uh, our salary structure as well. But uh, I just want to maybe listen, hear from Lisa about what. Well, is there a specific question that you want to ask about? Uh, yeah, what, what, we're tw we're, what will be the minimum salary? We're going to just be where the state is. Minimum wage is what the city's paying, $12 an hour. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, that is correct. And so uh, there is legislation that will have that rise uh, $1 for the next three years so we get to $15 an hour. So it will go up on January 1st. It'll go up to $12. And I uh, provided some statistics, and it might be useful for the uh, public to hear about who those folks are. Uh, that are at the, the lowest uh, wage. So primarily there are parks and recreation staff, their kids, it's their first time, uh, first job. Some of them don't even have their high school diploma just yet. So uh, at the 11, about $11 and 50 cents is what we pay our recreation one staff. And again, uh, primarily, or they all are uh, like 17 and 18 year olds. Um, looking for the first job. And then we have a couple other that also fall within that category that we're, you are going to raise today. And again, these are all temporary positions. It's nobody, no employees that are impacted by this and our uh, regular employees. So we also have some office assistants and they'll come in the summertime. I've used them, uh, the finance has used them. Again, 17 year, 18 year olds. Uh, and then the Last one that's at our minimum wage that will be raised with your action uh, today is a maintenance worker aid one, and we consider that a training program. You don't even need to have your high school diploma. It's an opportunity to get your foot in the door, uh, get your experience. You don't even have to have any maintenance experience, but again, it builds up time. And once you get some of that experience, you automatically move up into what we call our maintenance aid two. Uh, and again, that's a lot of our, our ground for how we actually move folks into the maintenance worker series. 
So that's primarily what our, uh, the impact of your action today will increase those wages to, to the $12. And I do want to, you to keep in mind also, uh, those individuals after a certain amount of time with the city will move up to the next step and the steps can go all the way up to, there's uh, I believe about 10 steps, up to about $25 an hour if they're here that long in that position. But typically those temporary employees don't. Quite often we are able to move them into permanent positions or, or these kids will uh, move on, but they'll have a resume builder uh, that they've gained from the city. So that's primarily the, the, the group that you are impacting today. A couple more questions. Um, is this primarily before us because of the state um, increase in the minimum wage or is it yeah. would have came, come to us anyway? No, this is because of the state legislation. It comes in uh, to effect on the 1st of January. Uh, and with this action also, we have adjusted several other classifications because of what we call compaction. So in that recreation one series, because we're gonna raise that minimum wage, that that salary level, we're gonna raise the entire salary schedule. So it has a little more uh, impact than just the, the, the ones that are at the uh, $11 an hour today. But you will see us back again this time next year to get to the 13 because of the state action, the 14 and the 15. Hey, Chris, uh, do you mind, I'd like to just, I, last year when this came up, is there any uh, reason why we're not just building that in? It's a, it's a state law. We know that it's going to change every year. And why, why do you need to bring it forward each mm -hmm. year to, to provide that sure. information? Because our salary schedule will change through the year. So, for example, the temps uh, will receive a salary increase through the uh, MOU negotiations. So we, don't, we need to build that in. Also, we won't know what other classifications and other bargaining units such as SEIU might also have um, compensation increases coming. And so when we look at the bigger picture, we raise the $13 an hour, we need to incorporate any MOU changes. And as you know, we're going into bargaining, so I don't know, I can't anticipate what those are. And then we also have the compaction issue that we'll have to take a look at as it, it increases. How many temporary workers um, does the city employ? Mm, Any time over the, course of the year, it can be up to 300. Primarily, again, all in Parks and Rec. And that's, so it's a big summer push. And also our lifeguards, they're temporary employees as well. And then now we're, we're pretty light on, on temps. I don't have the exact number. Are the recreation one, two, three, and four categories and five, are they also all temporary workers as well? Or are those some permanent people? Those are all temporary employees. Yeah, just summer, just for the summer programs. That's all they staff. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to put that before the council and you know think about raising our wages um, in the future for the folks that are at the bottom. Uh, and they're not just, you know, I, I mean, I know there's workers who are coming from high school, but sometimes I've known people whose families do depend on these summer um, wages that uh, their 17 or 18 year old brings in. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? This is number 13, uh, resolution amending the City of Santa Cruz personnel complement and classification plans for the state minimum wage law for 2019. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. I just wanna make a quick comment and say, these are really important jobs for youth. Um, I know when I was on the library board, we saw many of those jobs go away um, during certain budget crisis. And I think sometimes these are initial entry points where kids do have the opportunity, many first jobs for people to start their work, and I think they're really valuable. So I, while, while this I look at is mainly complying with state law, it's really important we also protect those types of jobs because they are good entry-level jobs for kids that, that want to um, have engagement with the city. Councilmember Matthews. I appreciate the additional information that was provided, not, not simply the fact that these are mostly entry-level young people. Um, but also the complexity of one adjustment triggers many, many, many others. Um, and also want to say that uh, I appreciate, in, in many cases, these are optional jobs, and it's part of a commitment the city has made in our investing in young people to create these entry-level summer job programs for young people to give them um, that first uh, paid employment. And many of their... Um, activities at this level include not just doing some task for the city, but also learning a lot in terms of what it means to be a good employee. So I'm really pleased that we do have these entry level positions and uh, of course we'll um, make this motion to raise the uh, salary as, as indicated. 
I'll second that. Uh, Motion by I, Councilmember Matthews, second by Councilmember Brown. I do want to make a, a comment since we've opened it up for discussion here. Um, yeah, I, I think that these, uh, the Parks and Rec programs and the, the, the kind of training, uh, you know, training that they provide and leadership skills for, for young people is absolutely important. And I, so I appreciate all of this discussion. I also believe that, um, you know, even young people should be compensated fairly for the work they do because it benefits the city, it benefits the city's residents. And so I would like to see us in the future consider um, wages that um, go beyond the minimum wage. You know, there are many young people in this community who um, enter into these jobs, certainly because they're committed and they want to participate, but also because they contribute to their family's household income. And when they can go work at PetSmart or somewhere else for $15 an hour, they may make that choice. And I would hope that we would want to be competitive and bring young people um, who really are committed to doing this, who don't have the privilege of making that choice. So um, I just want to say that for now. And um, with that, I, you know, I'm happy to support the increase and hope to see further increases in the future. Councilmember Crow. That's exactly where I was trying to go to. It's a, you know, why not make it cachet to uh, work for the city? Like, you know, have, have a young person say, I'm working for the city and feeling like they're being um, rewarded um, and, and that, that being a really good thing, enjoying, you know, uh, people who, who want to actually work for the city, but also feel okay about the compensation. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Council Member uh, Noreen. And, and while, um, you know, if I had a magic wand, I would love to pay people um, a more competitive price, um, but if you're going to do that, you're gonna have to decide what you're going to cut to raise those salaries. Okay, so we have a motion on, on by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. Ooh. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next up is item number 18, and I'd like to first ask Councilmember Cronus if he has any questions. Um, yeah, th th a lot of, uh, a few people uh, contacted me about jump bikes, which I think is revolutionizing um, some of our transportation um, options in Santa Cruz, and um, I'm pretty much feeling really good about it, but I think um, attending to folks who have issues with it and are, are some of them are just picking at it and wanting to have issues with it. Uh, but I, I think we should go to every possible length and, and people have said that um, the obstructing of the sidewalks has become a real issue in several neighborhoods uh, with the jump bikes and maybe people don't know how to contact jump bikes or what to do when somebody, when a, when a bike's been left out in front of their house for several days. Um, so I just wanted some clarification on that. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm glad this that we're going, I, I think I'm glad we're going forward. And the other question I have is, and maybe you sent it to me and I missed it, but um, any pictures you might have of what this electricity looks like, what the station will look like and how the electricity is gonna get there. Yes, I'll answer the second question first. Claire Fleisler, transportation planner, um, bike share program manager. Um, to your second question, photos. I sent you three photos yesterday of what they look like. Um, generally, the charging stations that are proposed look substantially similar to what we have now. They're about the same size and scale, the same color palette, um, minimally different. So um, you have three photos there. You can also see them on um, Jump's website. There, there's photos available on there at jump.com, I think it is, or jumpbikes.com. Um, to your first question about how you can report potential issues that you see, this is an area that we're continuing to work on education. As you may know, uh, the city of Santa Cruz in our muni code since the 1980s, we allow bikes to be parked almost anywhere except locked to a tree if there's no official bike rack within 50 feet. Um, that's part of the reason that you see many bikes locked to street signs and parking meters, et cetera which we've always seen, but it's a lot more obvious now that there's a fleet of 250 brightly colored bikes around. Um, to the point of being able to contact Jump to let them know about the issue, one of the points that we encourage is for you to email support at jumpbikes.com and note the bike number, which is on the back fender in red, and the time. Um, and just state that the bike is parked inappropriately or whatever other issue or concern that you're having. That allows Jump to send out someone from our local operations team to go retrieve that bike and move it to a more appropriate location. And it also allows Jump to contact the previous user and educate them about proper parking so that in the future they can do it better. Oftentimes what we find is that people are not parking these bikes inappropriately on purpose or to cause harm or to be an inconvenience, but 
they've never pushed a baby stroller or been in a wheelchair or had that issue and it's just something that doesn't occur to them. And with one polite nudge from Jump about how to do it better in the future, it tends to resolve the issue. But until people are aware of that, they don't know. And you, um, I don't recall off the top of my head, maybe you do, um, you sent me some interesting uh, statistics on numbers of rides in October, November, um, and there was, you know, differences, and I'm assuming the differences might have been because of the rainy season kicked in, but do you have them with you, the, the numbers of, of, of rides? Yeah, I have our um, system stats to date. So as you know, we rolled out Bike Share in May uh, to coincide with Bike to Work week, bike month, and uh, since that time, so we started with 25 bikes that first week, soft launch, soft rollout, escalated to 50 bikes by the end of that month and up to 250 by the beginning of July. So since that time, through the end of November, <coughs> our bike share system has taken over 155,000 trips, almost 156,000 total trips. The total mileage is almost 390,000 miles on bike share. The average trip is 2.36 miles, which we're really encouraged about because that's a distance that you think of as replacing within town car trips, which is one of the goals of our climate action plan. Um, additionally, each of our bikes is used almost six times per day. This is an awesome stat because other, um, as I've mentioned before to you, other systems nationwide, the average is between one and two trips per bike per day. What this tells me is that there was a huge amount of latent demand for bike share in the city of Santa Cruz and that we need to look towards expanding the number of bikes that we have as well as uh, continue to speak with our neighboring jurisdictions about expanding the geographic area to better serve our community. Um, in terms of the variation in system use, what we saw was that the system ridership grew from May to June to July to August. We took an anticipated dip in September because after the summer season we have less tourists here and UCSC doesn't come back till the third week. So we just have way less population in town during those idyllic first three weeks of September. Um, and then we're starting to increase in ridership again. Um, it is weather dependent as well. On days that it's raining, we naturally have a lower ridership, but um, overall our ridership is continuing to increase and that uh, almost six trips per bike per day is a fairly stable figure that we've seen throughout the life of the system. I, I'm absolutely blown away by some of these numbers. I like, these, I like numbers like this and the, the 2.6 miles really is impressive because it is it, it is a car not going somewhere it's a bike and somebody's getting some little bit of exercise which is really cool um the last question i had was do you know any city that has um vouchers or, or that jump bike program has vouchers for economically poor people or city workers or any kind of you know because people have been talking a lot about maybe why don't we integrate downtown workers into the jump bike program and offer them vouchers. Is there anything like that that's a model now that we don't have to like invent? Yes, so there are two programs that we're working on. One, I have a call on Thursday about Jump has a program called Boost, and that is a low income program. Um, we're working right now on building partnerships between existing community organizations. I will probably contact some of you about uh, organizations that you work with and how we reach people who could really use a subsidized bike share membership, and that's subsidized on the Jump side. The other side, Jump's coming to us with a, um, a framework that could be a proposal for a bike share employee benefit uh, to benefit the downtown employees as part of our Go Santa Cruz program. And as you remember, when we, uh, when you authorized us to raise parking prices and, and revamp our parking pricing strategy to fund the TDM program for downtown employees, that would be one of the things that we could purchase with that. Last, last question. Okay, Is there any, you said that last time. I know, <laughs> to go from like 250 to 500, what needs to happen with that? Um, we're working on that right now. We'll be going to the Transportation and Public Works Commission probably in first quarter of 2019 with a plan there. And um, the other thing that we want to make sure is that that goes hand in hand. The county's in discussions right now with JUMP, as is the city of Capitola and is UCSC. So coordination between jurisdictions as well as um, just making sure that we're, we're ready to move forward on that. Hey, that sounds great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Cool. Council Member Matthews. As usual, you are way ahead of us already. <laughs> um, and this is great coming to us. Um, I've contacted you a few times about complaints from the public, usually about the parking things. And um, you've mentioned there is a number people can call. I haven't checked, but is that number on the bike basket or somewhere? It is on every jump asset. So it's on the signs and it's on the bikes and that is a contractual obligation that we have. Right. So yeah. if someone sees a bike inappropriately pike, parked, the number's right there for them Correct. to call. Okay, yes. great, thanks. Good for us to know that. Um, 
Well, with that, I'm prepared to. We very, need to go to public comment. Oh, first, public comment. Councilmember Chase. I just wanted to say briefly because we've had this item before us um, in the past. I have seen a noticeable change since we rolled them out and since we've talked mm -hmm. about it at council in regard to inappropriately parked yeah. bikes. And also, um, I've seen that. Uh, couple people who drive the vans around and restock and so seeing that they're actually keeping the um, stations full so it does seem like over time we are getting better and better at this mm -hmm. which is great and it's it's noticeable because the complaints have dropped down and even visually what you see has improved so well done thank you and I'll, I had a couple comments and questions the first question is um, you know one I think that now that we're seeing a lot of uh, development projects I know I had a couple people approach me that were doing some work downtown about how we can integrate maybe some of the, the um, bike share programs into those projects. What Are there any ideas? Yes, please contact me if you are interested in doing a project. Um, I can connect you with Jump's business development team and they would love for uh, new projects to host bike share stations, especially bike share charging stations. Um, it really creates an opportunity for residents and employees and is a, a pretty simple thing to do. So Jump is a completely open to that and has requested that I do pass along those contacts. Great, and then second, in when you look outside of the downtown, let's say on the east side where the near where the uh, fire station three is located, there's a parking lot. Um, the closest bike share seems to be over near where the buttery is. Is there thought about making uh, like you know bike share so it's integrated where our parking is so that if people want to commute downtown, they have uh, the uh, ability to do that? Yeah, great question. So that is one of the locations that we have an approved encroachment permit for. It's one of the locations um, near the fire station on the east side in that parking lot that we will be installing a uh, charging station. And that's part of the contract amendment today is to allow for that electrical cost reimbursement. And the building permit for that location was just uh, finalized yesterday. So that should be moving forward in the next couple weeks. Okay, and then I know we talked um, at a couple meetings ago about the um, the policies that go along, you know, when they're, what, you know, what we consider when we install these stations or when we look at when we need to add new ones based on usage. Is that something that will eventually come before the council as far as looking at those guidelines? Yes, so we did a brief update to the Transportation and Public Works Commission last night, very late last night. Um, and so we're continuing to crunch that data with Jump. We're working with, um, the jump data science and analytics team on building out a dashboard that hopefully we'll be able to turn over after it's in the beta phase to a publicly facing dashboard. So not only can I present that information to you, but you can go self-serve to see where the most common origins, destinations, routing info, how many trips happened yesterday, tomorrow, next, not tomorrow, we can't predict the future, yesterday, last week, last month, et cetera. All right, and last point, how long do you think it'll take before a platinum community? Uh, uh, I'm very hopeful that the next time that we apply for a Bicycle Friendly Community Award, we will be granted bic uh, Bicycle Friendly Community Platinum Level Award, not only based on this program, but based on the significant infrastructure investments that uh, our whole community has made over the past few years. Um, one of the exciting ones, as you know, is the rail trail coming right up. So oh. we're really excited for that. Thanks. Great. Thank you for all of your work. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. <laughs> I just have one quick question, Claire. I appreciate your presentation and the jump bikes have been fantastic and I often ride them over to my meetings with Martine <laughs> from one office to the next. Um, there's those, those sort of those times, and I apologize, I didn't ask this in advance, where you see the youth or like certain people doubled up on bikes. Are there ways to also sort of report that or prevent that? Because that sort of just gives your heart a, sort of a, a stops for a moment when you see the youth kind of not appropriately writing the bikes. Yeah, so we would love if you could report that. Okay. Also recognize that it's hard to report, sure. but that's one of the key areas of education that we are focusing on. So those are, please wear a helmet, although it's not required. Uh, we love your brain, we highly recommend you do. You can get a cheap subsidized helmet from Jump on their website, please look into that. If you are a parent, please do not sign up your underage child <laughs> for a Jump account or allow them to use your account. Please do not ride more than one rider per bike. Not only is it in violation of your user agreement, but it is dangerous. Please obey the rules of the road and please ride with consideration for others are, are the big pushes that we go with with our education and encouragement. Okay, yeah. great. All right, thanks. So see no further questions or discussion. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? This is item number 18. If you see none, I'll bring it back to the council for either further deliberation or an action. Council Member Matthews. Great to remove approval. Second. Second. Okay, second uh, by um, Council Member Chase. So, motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by um, Council Member Chase. Uh, Council Member Crone. One more quick question for uh, Claire. What, what's the um, enforcement like when you say that's the kind of what we stick with? Do, do we have something a little bit more than just 
please you all, you guys are not really following the rules or do you have something that, <laughs> do you actually write a ticket for somebody? How are we dealing with young people when they're, um, you know? Yes, so the, the first notice is a warning, the second notice is a $25 fine, and then a uh, future breaking of the rules is a sus suspension from the system. Okay, that, I mean, so there's a warning first, that's, that's there's, what I want There's to a warning sure. first, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Somewhat related to this, I know we got a motion and a second on the floor, but it's so uh, nice also to know how you handled all of the discussion about the scooters and the birds and you know, all that stuff. I think we've kind of like really focused on this and this has been a very, very successful program. So thank you for all your work you've done. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor by Council Member Matthew, seconded by Council Member Chase. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Next up is item number 24. This is the city re interim representative to Metro District Board of Directors. I ask that this be on our general business. I think it's pretty straightforward and I support the item. The reason why I asked it to be um, on the general business is because um, our practice as a council has been where we have a motion that comes forward from the, um, the, uh, the council for the prospective uh, board members for the year. Um, this one takes place after the new council is seated and um, will carry over until the new selections are made. And so I wanted to ask the city attorney um, just on that background on why we're handling this because we have not done this ever before. Yes, thank you, Mayor Trezis, members of the city council. Um, this, this is a, an unusual situation. Uh, typically, city council members uh, are appointed to boards and commissions by actions of the city council, and they serve in that capacity until a successor is appointed. When in a circumstance like this, uh, a council member serving on a on a commission or a committee, um, it, it, when when the term is expiring, uh, state law prescribes the manner in which um, appointees to the Santa Cruz County Metropolitan Transit District. Um, are appointed and, and the length of their terms. And it has a, an unusual provision that says when the city council appoints a council member to serve on the Metro board, their term expires automatically upon the expiration of their city council term. What that does is it leaves the city in the situation where in this instance, there is a, um, a committee meeting that council member Chase has served on scheduled for, I believe later this week or early next week. Um, but her term will have expired at that point. And um, the council members who do serve on the Metro board have expressed uh, uh, their um, interest in having the council be fully represented at, at, at those committee meetings. So, um, the somewhat other unusual provision of uh, the Transit District Act provides that once an appointment is made, it will be for the duration of the term. So this interim appointment in, uh, in some respects is uh, relying on the good faith of the appointee to step down when the new council takes action to appoint a successor. So, so, so that's the sort of unusual situation. I'm happy to answer any questions or respond to any comments. I just, I just had one uh, additional question. When is the first meeting scheduled for the regular, the new council in terms of in January? The first council meeting is the 8th. Oh, okay. okay. But the council appointments are scheduled for the 22nd. Or later in the month. I, yeah. um, I'm on LAFCA and we have a January 9th meeting. And so I guess I wanted to know like for any, um, one, one thing I asked is that maybe in addition to, um, you know, the motion that's on the floor based on the city attorney's uh, report, that there be uh, some additional language request the incoming mayor to make any other advisory board member service appointments during the winter recess as needed. So if there's other things for other board members, you know, that needs to be filled in, that she has the, 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 the whoever he or she, who the vice mayor and mayor have the uh, ability to make the, uh, the um, appointments directly. Uh, Tony, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong but I think part of this, um, glitch is due to the bylaws of Metro because many agencies do allow for a member to continue until their replacement is named. And LAFCO could very well be in that situation. I don't know. But 
we can decide yes, that the, separately. <laughs> and, it's and it's and not even the Metro bylaws. It's written into state law that the term expires. So I have been told by general counsel for the Metro that there is um, uh, going to be an effort in the, in the coming legislative session to amend the law to, so it, yeah. in a common sense way that basically says that appointees serve until their successor is appointed. Well, I guess I'm just asking that in addition, we just say that the incoming mayor, she has the opportunity to make the um, appointments for anything during the winter recess as needed. Let, let me just, if I could just finish. Um, nonetheless, the mayor, my recollection is the mayor designates, but those designations are confirmed by the council. And so that, that yeah, no, I'm asking, I'm giving, I'm asking that we give authority through this action to the incoming mayor to make any other bridge appointments that are needed so I, that I those know. current council members are, if they're on something can do it. I, I wouldn't be comfortable. That's supporting a technicality that. a, because yeah. they still wouldn't be confirmed by the whole council. I'd, We're confirming I'd, it I'd, now. That's what I'm saying on this one. No, I'm asking, but I'm, what I'm saying okay. is I'd like to expand it. I to, would like to make the motion. I understand what your issue is. I'd like to keep this clean. Um, I am the other person that serves on Metro, and uh, one reason it's particularly important is that Cynthia has been serving not only on the board but on the facilities committee. There's some very critical discussions coming up about the partnership between the city and Metro regarding the Metro, the Pacific Station which just is, has huge potential for, uh, for housing, for our downtown, for, for a really key location. And to have the continuity of her knowledge and participation in that is absolutely critical um, during the next month. And so uh, I think that's why we particularly need to take action on that. So uh, for that Before reason- Before we do, I'll, is there a member, any member of the public that would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Council Member Crone. Two questions. Um, yeah, I think it, it's an academic one. I mean, but what Councilmember Matthews was bringing up, and maybe the city clerk can help us out on this. I don't remember approving, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Uh, I don't even remember it coming to the council for approval of all the boards and committees that yeah, we sit on. Does do. that, does that does. just come like regularly with, to us at the beginning of the year? That's right. Yeah. It does. Yeah, typically it's a second uh, meeting in uh, January. And I would love to know, um, it seems like there's a, a hot issue going on here that I have no idea what it is, and I don't know if uh, Council Member Chase is at liberty to talk about what, what the committee meeting's about and, and how our, you know, you know, strategically, you're the person, because I'm not saying you're not, and I'm not saying I'm not gonna vote for this, but I appreciate what uh, Council Member Taras, uh, excuse me, Mayor Tarasa said too about interim appointments and um, trying to fill mm. things. Sure. Um, so I can say specifically that the item that Council Member Matthews uh, just referenced was the Pacific Station project. So I'm the chair of the Capital Committee for Metro, and the primary reason that I'm the chair is because we've been in very long negotiations between the city and Metro on the Pacific Station and the housing, namely affordable housing project that we've been working for more than a decade on to get in that space. And um, the only agenda item for our capital committee in January is the Pacific Station. And so the continuity of that project is important to the city and absent me being there, we will have no representation and it's a three committee, um, three person committee, which means nobody from the city, just Capitola and the board of supervisors will be represented making the recommendation to the Metro board on how to proceed on Pacific Station. So it's pretty critical in terms of our involvement and at least having a seat at the table for that discussion. And, and it seems like since you've been working on this, I mean, somebody filling in might have to take a while to get up to speed. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and and I would just, I would also add that, um, you know, this is something I happen to be in this position right now, but this has been an ongoing issue and outgoing, um, Councilmember Lane thought that he had fixed this when he was on council because this happens every cycle where we have this gap and then the city is unrepresented at least by one person on the count, or on the board for that period of time. And it does seem like, I mean, certainly it's good that Metro is taking a look at that now because it could be problematic for us in terms of making big decisions that could impact the city with us having a fairly big gap for those meetings and any other committee meetings. So hopefully this will get fixed moving forward. I just happen to be in the position right now where I'm serving on that committee and I think it's important the city have representation. Councilmember Matthews. 
just the bigger context on this um, also is that um, Metro, in partnership with the city, you may remember, um, um, has conducted a couple of studies of the space layout uh, for uh, possible alignments for both the Metro operations and uh, other associated buildings. And um, these are all coming to a decision point. So it's not a matter of just kicking this down the road. I think Metro and our economic development department, which wants to move forward with the affordable housing and related projects, um, wants to get moving. And so uh, we, we've um, funded, we've completed the studies, those are coming to Metro, and so it really is re reaching a decision point. So um, that's kind of the, the context for um, wanting to have that continuity and knowledge represented. Okay, is there a motion? I, w I will move uh, approval of the uh, item to appoint Cynthia Chase as the city's interim representative to Metro. Second. Second. Okay. Motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Brown. And, and again, I think you're going to say no, but I, I would, would, I'm requesting that you also have some sort of, um, that the incoming mayor make any other advisory body um, service appointments during the winter recess as needed. I'm not going to add that. Okay. I'll make a motion to um, allow that to happen that the incoming mayor make a uh, advisory be able to make advisory appointments before um, we officially seat our uh, member as needed as for needed. meetings that might take place okay i'll second I would, that i would interpret that as a motion to amend the main motion yes mm -hmm. okay well uh, sure. now we'll vote on that particular item first um the motion is to add language that requ that uh, requests the incoming mayor to make any interim advisory appointments before the full appointments are made at the second meeting in January. If, ne if needed. If as needed. Okay. Um, motion by Councilmember Crone, second by um, myself. All those in favor of that motion, or is there any further question? You look like you have a question, Councilmember Noroyan. I'm just trying to decide if I want to support it or not. So, no, go ahead. And okay. Yeah. All right. What's what's the neg what's, what's the downside? Because I'm. I'm um, I would like to get informed. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think that the downside is, again, uh, procedural in that uh, all our other appointments to boards and committees for council members are confirmed by the whole council. And this one would not be, I, I fully trust whoever is going to be mayor <laughs> to make good decisions. We don't know of any others coming up. I would be quite comfortable uh, asking the staff to um, see what other commission, board and commission assignments might uh, run into this same snag and try and, and uh, make procedural changes so those those aren't a problem. And I would say this is only for if there is a meeting. It's a pretty minor issue, but I, but I understand your point. But, but I also would have full confidence in the mayor to, yeah. to do that. I mean, that's the person leading our group and we should put trust in that. Councilmember Chase. I was just gonna say it would be helpful to know which bodies we're even talking about. Yeah. Because, you know, there's a lot of variation in there and some of them it seems like are already covered, some of them aren't even meeting, yeah. and then some of them Not there's nothing we can do about it without talking to those bodies. So it just it's it's a, it's an unknown for me. All right. So yeah, I don't believe there are there are any. I mean we can mm -hmm. explore it further, yeah. but I don't recall there being any. Nothing I'm on is meeting. Lafco is the one I'm thinking mm -hmm. of. Okay. So there's a motion on the floor and I second it for an amendment to the main motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no. Okay, so that motion um, fails with um, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Chase, Councilmember Brown, and Councilmember Naroyan voting um, opposed that motion with Councilmember Crone, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins, and myself voting in favor. So we'll go to the main motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. So now we'll move on to item number 25. This is the Regional Transportation Commission's Unified Quarter Investment Study. And Chris Schneider, you'll be presenting. Thank you, Mayor Council Members. Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. The item before you is um, an action on the uh, Regional Transportation Commission's Unified Quarter Investment Study. And the motion is to support the draft preferred scenario in the uh, transportation's UCIS study and inclusion of multimodal intersection improvements on the Soquel and Mission corridors and reconstruction of the Highway 1 bridge over the San Lorenzo River. The UCIS was um, 
unveiled in September, and since then, and prior to that actually, there have been a lot of public meetings and discussion of this study. Uh, staff has released a draft preferred scenario, which uh, I've just handed out, as well as up on the screen. Um, the primary recommendation here from staff is that because we, we've looked at the preferred scenario, we think it's a good one, but that there are some things missing that are currently in the city's general plan, as well as actions that the commission or the council has taken in relationship um, to transportation improvements. The concern f from staff is that if this doc, if, if and it's likely that this document will inform future uh, investment opportunities and grants that we have to make sure that we're not precluded from applying for those state and federal grants that go through the commission. And so therefore, uh, we are recommending adding to the preferred, uh, draft preferred scenario, uh, the additional lanes on the San Lorenzo River, um, that is the Highway 1 bridge over the San Lorenzo River, which improves traffic circulation safety, um, protects the uh, transportation infrastructure by providing a better bridge, improves um, flood flows, currently having issues with that's uh, the abutments uh, in the piers in the river, back up water, potentially flooding the tannery and other properties, and then also uh, improve uh, fish flows, uh, fish passage. The Mission Street improvements as well and the SoCal Avenue improvements, multimodal accommodating uh, transit, bikes, pedestrians, automobiles, deliveries, um, and those are part of the city's uh, general plan mitigation. And they're one of the attachments at the end of the uh, staff report are the traffic impact fee program and the intersections that are included in that program. And that program is mitigation to the city's general plan that was adopted a few years ago. Um, so those are the uh, additions to the preferred scenario. Um, if you'd like, uh, commission staff's available to answer questions specific to the UCIS, and I can respond to questions related to the additional projects uh, being proposed. Are there proposed. any questions from the council at this time? Council Member I Matthew. actually do have one. Um, serving on Metro, I, I'm looking at uh, a couple of the items that have to do with transit, and um, Particularly um, in A, B, and C, all of those recommend um, the BRT light, and uh, but that was not transferred over to the 2035 preferred. And I know that uh, some of the other transit recommendations talk about increased transit frequency, and that is a big expensive operational thing, but it seems to me that some aspects of BRT light could be a one-time capital improvement that could for example, the signal priority and so forth, that could help the buses um, maintain their their um, scheduling. Do you have any comment on that? I I don't. I don't have uh, enough specific information related to mm -hmm. that one. Any? Okay, it's just something that occurred to me on that one item. Um, you know, we I see someone. I'm not. You're from. from uh, we have Ginger Dykar with yeah. the Regional Transportation Commission. She could respond. Thank you. I'm happy to provide clarification on my question. Ginger Dykar. Yeah, thank you. Transportation planner at the RTC and the program project manager for the Unified Corridor Study. Um, the reason the staff recommendation to. Um, not keep the BRT light on SoCal Freedom was due to the um, passenger rail service on the rail right of way, that that would provide a high quality transit service, as well as on the highway, initially the bus on shoulders project would provide a higher, a faster travel time, higher quality service for more of an express service through our community. Obviously, SoCal Freedom is a very important transit um, part of the network for um, our community, but we didn't see um, a vast improvement in transit travel times for the, given the expense of the um, 
extensive amount of additional frequency that was evaluated in the Unified Corridor Study for scenarios A, B, and C. So part of our staff recommendation is not necessarily to increase the transit frequency of the BRT light on SoCal Freedom, but we do have in our staff recommendation that where feasible, when there's intersection improvements on SoCal Freedom, to try to provide that uh, transit signal priority and transit queue jump yeah. mm -hmm. for the existing services, but not necessarily to um, increase extensively the amount of service that's provided on that route, given the um, higher quality transit services that will be provided on the two other routes. Okay, but some investment in those improvements along the route are anticipated. For transit signal yeah. priority yeah. and transit queue jump where feasible at intersections, yes. Council Member Brown. I have a general question. Um, so I have the pleasure of serving on the Regional Transportation Commission and uh, a lot of my questions have been, many, most of my questions have been answered. I always come up with more every time I read through this document. Um, so I have had the, um, the, again, the pleasure and the privilege of, of having access to um, getting those questions asked and answered. And so I appreciate you being here for um, other members of the council. Um, I do think that this is, uh, this is a, I'll preface my question with a comment. You know, this is a big document and we have spent, you know, the, the members of the council who are on that commission have spent, uh, you know, a considerable amount of time with it and, you know, to have for the council to be asked in 72 hours to, um, to come and, uh, you know, digest this and feel comfortable with, uh, you know, stating the city's support, um, you know, wholesale is, I mean, I think that's kind of a big ask. And so the question I have is given that the commission has, um, uh, voted to uh, delay until the seven, our meeting on the 17th, our own, consider, our own, well, we've considered it, but our vote on this, um, what, would it be a problem for the, this council to um, continue the item and, and have some more time with the document in order to um, maybe ask some additional questions or you know, fine tune our recommendation at the city level, bringing it forward to the commission? Is that, would that be problematic from your perspective? Uh, what our plan was to, for the January 17th staff report to provide to our commission was to provide as much input as possible from the various different local jurisdictions that have made a decision, made a motion regarding um, the preferred scenario. So if it, if there was time on your agenda for um, future meetings, that's up to your discretion, obviously. Our packet um, has to be put together a week before um, the January 17th meeting. So it could still be um, be part of that staff report if, the, if your meeting was prior to that time. Um, okay. one, one other uh, possibility, I know it is clearly a lot of information, uh, but the recommendation be uh, more general about the RTCs, uh, the recommendation on the plan, but just that in any plan that's approved include projects that are required in the city or interested by the city in future, in any scenario that's selected. I mean, I really see this as more of a, uh, just an insurance policy mm -hmm. that in the future, if we pursue these projects and when we pursue them, that we're not gonna be precluded from uh, asking for grant funding for the projects. Every one of these projects is re gonna require a lot of public process, environmental yeah. review, design, <coughs> and a lot more action by council in the future. So I think, again, just more of an insurance policy to move forward. Thanks for bringing that up. I just wanted to interject on that point because you have the recommendation where it talks about the inclusion of these uh, additional projects. And I, you know, actually, I feel comfortable on the um, the RTC um, recommendation that we have before us. The set, that, but the second one, as far as the inclusion of the multimodal intersection improvements, I'd like to make sure that we are qualifying those as they're the council approved projects because it's, it was unclear to me which of these have actually come before the, the council and approved. Some of them were, but some of them, they're intersections improvements that are planned out for the future that do require some planning. And I don't wanna, you know, make sure, I don't wanna in any way, you know, prevent us from getting those funds, but I just wanna make sure that we're qualifying that these are, that the funds that we're getting are for council approved projects. And I think that's your intent. Yeah, because any grant funding that we bring forward has to go through first yeah. through the council. So um, in terms of the recommendation you have, do you have any objection to say that there are the inclusion of council approved multimodal intersection improvement projects? Do you have any? Uh, no? no. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's something that's in the, in the motion, the recommendation, I'd like to see that language in there when it gets to a point. 
But uh, Council Member Matthews, did you have an initial point? No, I, I, I think what you're getting at, Chris, is we could um, indicate uh, support for either the 2035 preferred or simply say that any action taken by the RTC final adoption should include the three added features yes. that you've pulled out here. Yes, that's mm -hmm. what yeah. I'm referring to. And I, I feel quite comfortable with that direction. <laughs> Council Member Crone. Is, is this the um, entire document that we that we have here in our packet that the, they've been considering? No, it's oh, a Lord. summary. <laughs> oh no, there's quite a bit more. Yeah. Um, I, I would feel it's totally, available on the totally comfortable um, that we would, I, I think a study session would be great with, with, with the council to get a um, grasp on these issues. So, I mean, I would, I would actually move to continue this to our uh, first meeting in, in January since the RTC won't be taking it up till the 17th, and I think that'll be enough time for them to, for the new council to study it, get up to speed on this project, and also get it, our, our recommendation to the RTC in time. We're at a point for just questions right now and discussion. I know that I have two people that request from organizations to um, ask to speak, and I'd like to first go to them and have <laughs> them kind of provide that. That was uh, Rick Longinotti for the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation, and then Manu Koenig from Santa Cruz County Greenway. So each have four minutes to speak, and then will any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item will then have their opportunity. Okay, please go ahead, or whenever you're ready. Got it. On the right. So, uh, hi, council members. My name is Rick Longinotti uh, with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. So. The request before you is to endorse the RTC staff's preferred option, and um, I believe that's out of sync with uh, the City of Santa Cruz policy and the voters in the past. Um, we support compact development rather than sprawl, and we want to increase affordable housing, and we have, and we want to have good transit and safe bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, we don't support projects that increase vehicle capacity, and that means widening Highway One. I wanted to remind you that. Uh, the HOV lane project was a subject of a ballot measure in 2004 where uh, it only got 43% of the vote it needed. Um, actually, it was a sales tax measure, but most of the money would go to the HOV project. In Santa Cruz, it was an overwhelming number of voters who voted against that sales tax measure. Uh, the Climate Action Plan, you know, it's, I mean, you've just passed something that's even uh, more assertive than the Climate Action Plan. So this is really out of sync because uh, widening Highway 1 according to the draft EIR, would uh, really increase vehicle miles traveled in greenhouse gases. Um, we also, uh, our group doesn't ex uh, support expanding intersections to expedite auto flow, if that means it's at the expense of pedestrian and bike safety. And that's often what happens, just inadvertently. You know, you can think of intersections around town that, that are totally intimidating to bicyclists and pedestrians. And often that's because they've been expanded to increase auto flow. So here's the HOV lane project, doubles the footprint of our freeway right now. Um, the, uh, we had Susan Handy come to Santa Cruz, it's our Loudon Nelson Center right there. She says adding capacity to roadways fails to alleviate congestion for long because it actually increases vehicle miles traveled. We know that, um, but the staff uh, recommendation from the RTC doesn't really reflect that. Uh, the draft EIR on the highway uh, it analyzed something called the HOV alternative and the TSM alternative, which you see on this chart here. The Measure D funds are listed in, in the orange there. Measure D funds would fund about a quarter of the TSM alternative, a little less than a quarter. And we know from the draft EIR that the TSM alternative would result in very slight improvement in traffic congestion. Nevertheless, the RTC wants to go ahead with this project. Um, and the staff is recommending even more auxiliary lanes, which will, uh, to, just to go back here, the next level of auxiliary lanes, none of this is going to do more than very slight improvement in traffic congestion, according to the EIR. Neither would it improve safety because the total accident rates would be remain the same. Um, 
But there are alternatives that have been analyzed in the Unified Corridor study, bus on shoulder of Highway 1, uh, transit on the rail corridor with uh, either rail or bus rapid transit or something else, um, and enhanced transit on SoCal and Freedom Boulevard. So in conclusion, I, I wanna make the request that you do not uh, approve, uh, you do not send any kind of support for the staff preferred alternative. And I also wanna mention that um, the request to widen the the bridge over Highway 1, a uh, uh, bridge over the San Lorenzo River, the Highway 1 bridge, which is in the city limits, is another auto exp expansion project that's very expensive, uh, over $10 million. We don't know what in terms of time savings it would, you know, how many seconds it might save somebody who's in, uh, 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 in, their, in, a, in travel on that bridge. Um, uh, it's just not a project that, that has been substantiated in terms of its worth to our community. And the, uh, the Mission Street, I'm just my neighborhood, the Bay and Mission and the Chestnut uh, and Mission intersections likewise are calling for large expansions of those intersections without insurance in my mind that they would be better for pedestrians or bicycles. Thank you very much. Thank you, wow, right on time. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> okay, Manu, you are up next. Do you need a, do you have a presentation? I do, yeah. So. Great. So Manu Koenig, Executive Director of Santa Cruz County Greenway. Um, the cartoon you're showing here really shows the, the risk involved in approving the staff recommendation today, which is it's going to limit our options when it comes to the rail corridor. Because, you know, as um, Executive Director Guy Preston said at the last meeting, this the unified corridor document is, is it's a planning document. It doesn't you know, direct any specific action. But what does happen if we approve staff recommendation uh, is that it uh, um, forces us to approve the progressive rail contract, which means that they become the short line operator for the entire line and we commit to doing freight along the throughout the entire county for the next 10 years. And that means that um, they really preempt anything that we want to do with the corridor when it comes to transportation. The reason for this is simple. Um, you know, federal rail, when, when we were building railroads many years ago, um, th that, that had to take uh, precedent over local jurisdiction in order to happen at all. So the Unified Corridor Study, um, it's a great document, it has some good data in it, but it's also seriously lacking. And, let me put this simply, it has a cost-benefit analysis without the cost. <laughs> uh, that's really only half of the information. And so what we've tried to do with this graph is provide the other half. This is really what we should be looking for, right? What is the bang for our buck when it comes to the different transportation options? And um, you know, this is what the data shows, that it basically costs $16 to the public every time someone gets on a train, $10 every time someone gets on a bus. So if you're looking at how do we improve transit and how to make that transit go as far as possible, buses are gonna get us a lot further. And that's the same conclusion that a lot of other communities have come to. Um, of course, the best of all is uh, a trail. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, as Claire was talking about um, some of the bike share options, let's, let's build infrastructure that supports um, that kind of modality. Um, so then there's this thing called the planning fallacy that Daniel Kahneman has um, described. Daniel is uh, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, um, and he says that forecasts uh, are unrealistically co close to best case scenarios and could be improved by consulting the statistics of similar cases. So this is your opportunity uh, to avoid the planning fallacy. This is some data from rail projects throughout the United States, um, and I'm just gonna read you the summary. Um, this is Daniel Kahneman's own words. A 2005 study examined rail projects undertaken worldwide between 1969 and 1998. In more than 90% of the cases, the number of passengers projected to use the system was overestimated. Even though these passenger shortfalls were widely publicized, forecasts did not improve over those 30 years on average. Planners overestimated how many people would use the tra new, trail products by, new rail projects by 106% and average cost overrun was 45%. As more evidence accumulated, the experts did not become more reliant on it. Um, then there's the fact that rail, should it be completed, is not gonna be done until 2035. I can't wait that long. Can our community wait that long? 
Um, then we have the technology risk. Um, you know, the, the uh, train on the, on the left there costs uh, $6.7 million and holds 130 people. The Ollie on the right costs $250,000 uh, and holds 12 people. So $50,000 per person for the train, $20,000 per person with the Ollie. You can buy 27 Ollies for the price of the train uh, and they don't require a driver. They can go, um, they can be on demand um, and they can provide a lot more flexibility in transit. Um, we talked about the jump bikes already. This is, we, the city doesn't have to pay for this unit whatsoever, right? Um, and 2035, how much is technology gonna change between now and then? Um, there's a political risk. Uh, you know, Greenway uh, supported Measure D. We're not gonna support a, a tax measure for a train. Let's do something we can agree on. Um, we've provided this alternative. Time's up. All right, um, just wanna say one, one brief comment. You know, uh, Round it up. Sure, will do. Um, you can't get everything, you can't get the, the um, uh, San Lorenzo River Bridge improvements if we pay for a train. Um, and this uh, Thank you. data provides that. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and did you get permission from Claire to use that photo? I believe it's uh, publicly available I'm on the I'm just joking. <laughs> any, uh, any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item, please? Good morning, I am Brett Garrett. Um, I, I am in agreement with Rick's comments and most of Manu's comments. Um, I would not be ready to endorse the preferred scenario nor the scenario B. Um, I want to bring up that the Santa Cruz Metro has requested a comprehensive alternatives analysis to determine the best mode of transit on the rail corridor. In my view, the city should support this request for a comprehensive alternatives analysis instead of endorsing the so-called preferred scenario. Uh, here's something Alex Clifford said about it during the November 16th Metro meeting. Alex was making a huge distinction between the alternatives analysis that Metro is requesting and the, um, and the alternatives analysis that would come through the CEQA process that RTC would, would do by default. Uh, Alex said they sound similar, but they're very different. I quote, we're saying don't pick the mode, do an alternatives analysis. Look at rail and there's variations of rail you could put in there. Look at BRT or bus. There may be one or two or three other alternatives that can function as mass transit in the corridor. Look at all of these. Lay out very detailed cost analysis of all of these, including potential funding sources. Then make a decision based on a preferred alternative that comes out of that process. So that's what Alex Clifford said. I, as Brett Garrett, support what he said. I would take it a step further to say that personal rapid transit should be among the alternatives to be studied. Personal rapid transit, PRT, pod cars on an elevated guideway, preferably in a solar powered system with zero emissions. Lowest cost per passenger of any mode, much better safety, actually better transportation for everyone. I, I helped to get a study done showing that PRT would attract about five times the ridership of a train. I also believe that PRT would likely satisfy easement requirements. I don't know that for sure. So please recommend a comprehensive alternatives analysis to determine the best mode of transit on the rail corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers, please step forward. You have two minutes. Hi, my name is Micah Posner. I've worked on transportation issues in Santa Cruz for 30 or 40 years, 30 years. Um, I do support alternative B. It's a proven track record, so to speak, for um, affecting land use in a way and doing transportation in a way that respects the world's climate and helps people that aren't rich. It's a public transportation and it's proven. In the, um, in the 1930s, people that preferred private transportation ripped up rail lines all across the country and said that they were gonna supply public buses. Instead, they purposely rode those buses into the ground so that they could make more money. And even though I'm not saying that people in this room wanna do that, it's a potential outcome if we rip up our tracks. We need to keep the tracks. That's how we know we'll get public transportation and how we know that we'll support the kind of planning that helps the environment. I don't think the council should add a rider about widening the bridge over the river or Mission Street. Doing so would be saying that you agree with these principles, that you care about the environment, you respect how people should go around the county, but you're not willing to have a little bit of short-term suffering. You wanna do old school economics when it comes to, to you know, sort of your transportation, your congestion, while you ask everyone else to, to move on to the next century. I, don't, I think it would be kind of disingenuous. I don't think it'd be taken well by the people of Watsonville or other people in the county. And as you know, the highway bridge over the river is not considered important by Caltrans is not a high priority. So I hope that you'll stick with B. It's been carefully negotiated. It's not everything I wanted. 
um, but it's a good plan, and I hope you'll um, recommend it to the Regional Transportation Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item? This is item number 25, the Regional Transportation Commission's Unified Corridor Investment Study. Please step forward, you have two minutes. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members. It's nice to see you at this time of day um, uh -huh. before all the controversy starts. Um, I just want to talk really quickly in regards to this item about the concept of opportunity cost. Um, in looking at the regional or the unified corridor studying the results that come out, um, I personally was a little dismayed by the wide differences in the amount of money and different projects that were chosen, and ultimately the very marginal differences that were uh, coming out of the different performance metrics that were given. Uh, from the Unified Corridor Study. And so when we're looking at spending hundreds of millions of dollars of public money, potentially up to a billion over the course of between now and 2035, we need to be really cognizant over if we invest $600 million to do something, a brand new thing, whatever that may be, that $600 million we cannot spend on something else. And we've got a lot of problems that we're dealing with. So just keep that in mind. And also the Highway 1, Highway 9 bridge is a significant pain point for everybody who drives that part of the highway every single day. It backs up onto the 17, it backs up along the fish hook, and it causes chaos everywhere. It is a high priority, please consider that. And I'm sure the businesses in that part of town over by Harvey West, whether it's Slater Construction, Kind Peoples, Costco, would really, really appreciate it if you gave me that investment in that bridge. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item? It's item number 25, um, the RTC uh, Unified Corridor Investment Study. I'll bring it back to the council. Council Member Matthews. Yes, uh, I would like to move that. I, I already oh. made a motion to continue this item. Um, yeah, um, oh, is there a second um, on that earlier motion? On who, I'm sorry, on, on Council Member Matthews' motion? No, no, no I oh. made a motion to, okay. uh, yeah, sorry, to, let me clarify. to continue this Before item we until the, the public first I, Okay. <clears throat> I'm confused now because I'm sorry. I believe we were, uh, the, we were heading towards uh, potentially a motion to not actually weigh in on the UCIS today and to proceed as recommended by staff about the city items for now. So if we can just clarify where this is going, then I'll know whether or not I'm seconding. Well, let me hear, let me, uh, I know I, I said I was going to go to the public for comment. Council Member Crum, before we did that, he made a motion to continue the item. Um, that's where well, he was. Okay, so I'll second for the sake of discussion. I'm trying to figure out how, what we're doing here. Okay, so um, are we prepared to take action on what's before us? Uh, let's revisit uh, uh, RTC Ginger, um, the timing of any action we take and how that gets integrated into your report for RTC. Just want to understand the... Ginger Dyker, RTC staff. Um, we have been asking people that if there... So there is a chance for the staff recommendation to be um, revised. Um, and brought to the January 17th meeting. If in order to get that information, uh, in order to do that and be based on your decision, we would need to have that information. Uh, what we've been telling people is December 28th prior to that in order to make that change. Um, your motion can always go to the commission up until um, the day before we receive the information, January 16th. So the, uh, there's three different time frames. December 28th, if we had the information then, that we could uh, evaluate your information to consider changing the staff recommendation. If we received the information from your council uh, prior to, let's say, um, January 10th, we could incorporate it into the staff report that would then be in the packet available to our website. If we receive the information by January 16th at noon, we could incorporate it as a handout to our commission. Is that the information that, that you're looking for? That answers my question, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we, there, there's a motion on the floor in a second. Is there further discussion on that, the idea of postpone it? Uh, Council Member Chase. So I think I'm where, um, Councilmember Brown is on this, where we had a discussion right before Councilmember Cohen made mm -hmm. the motion to basically make a recommendation for the RTC to consider some uh, items that are in part of this. So I'd like to hear more about that. 
I think that's kind of more where I was going, particularly as a, per, a member of the RTC. So this is it, the outcome of this is important. So, you, so you're opposed to the idea of postponing? I am opposed to the idea of postponing okay. because I wanted to really flesh out, particularly given what Ginger just reported to us, I think that that makes no sense to postpone. But I wanted to sort of hear more about what Councilmember Matthews and then I believe Councilmember Brown made some comments on because okay. I think that's where I'm I moving. agree. I, I'm opposed to the postponement. Um, so I, I, I will withdraw my motion if it's okay with the second. Okay, Count, Councilmember Matthews. Then we will proceed with the main motion. Okay, please go ahead. And uh, I will go ahead and move that we support the uh, uh, RTC preferred scenario um, uh, in the Regional Transportation mm -hmm. Commission's UCIS with specifically the inclusion of the um, uh, council approved mode, um, and I'm adding council approved multimodal intersection improvements and projects on the SoCal and Mission corridors and inclusion of the reconstruction of the Highway 1 bridge over San Lorenzo River. I'll second that. Is there further discussion? Uh, so I'm, now I am more confused. I, um, my um, sense of where we were going was um, along the lines of what Mr. Schneider suggested that we could, uh, we could send uh, our um, letter in support of the city approved projects, to ensuring that the city approved projects receive consideration, what, whatever the preferred scenario is that the commission elects. And actually, I'm fine with that as well. Okay, so that was what I was yeah. thought we were okay. gonna, where we were right. going to go. Then, uh, then let me just Rather than re restating. restate. Grace motion, <laughs> restate motion. <laughs> um, I'll move that the uh, city council um, uh, express its desire that the RTC include in its final scenario um, additional lanes on bridge over San Lorenzo River, um, imp improvement of city improved projects on the Mission Street corridor and um, intersection improvements for auto automobiles at city approved projects. I'm looking here at the line items that were passed out. So it would be to include in whatever the RTC does to add those three as the city's strong preference. Can, can I can I review you back to the the original recommendation in your staff report just to make sure they're multimodal improvements yeah, on yeah, the SoCal yeah, and yeah, Mission? Yeah, 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 because it says yeah. here just to auto. You're right. Yeah, yeah. they're multi. Yeah, yeah but that's what. Yeah, that was in the right. motion. Just so that's uh, pretty yeah. clear, right up front. Intersection improvements, multimodal intersection improvements, at city approved for city approved projects. Yeah. Council that, approved. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Council approved multimodal projects intersection. Yeah. So it will be uh, the line that calls for additional lanes on the bridge over San Lorenzo River, which I agree is really a public safety issue. Um, the Mission Street intersection multimodal improvements and multimodal intersection improvements for city approved projects. Those three items. And then get a second. Do we have I'll a second? No, I, we already had a oh. sec. I'll give you a second. Okay. Okay. I'm just we, so, um, count, um, the city clerk was looking for that language, um, some something, so we have it in. It just gets really hard when the door opens. It was hard to hear you. Okay. Just the last part of it. The, the council expressed its desire. Uh, we request that the RTC um, include in its. Uh, uh, final uh, decision on preferred scenario, the following. Uh, additional lanes on the bridge over San Lorenzo River, Mission Street intersection multimodal improvements, and multimodal intersection improvements for city approved projects. And I think, does that cover for you? Yes. Council Member Brown. 
I will support the motion for the sake of moving this along. However, I do want to go on record, and the only record we have is for anybody who's listening out there, yeah. because we, don't, be we only do action minutes. Um, I am not currently in support of the um, Highway 1 bridge over the San Lorenzo River. I understand there are serious safety issues there. I'm, uh, I, I understand that this will be coming back to us in whatever form, and w this council will have the opportunity to weigh in about that in the future. But for the sake of moving us along today, I'm okay with mo moving the recommendation as, as made. Great. So we have a motion on the floor by Councilmember Matthew, seconded by myself. Councilmember Crone. So, Chris, if we do this, is this the city going on record that we're supporting Highway 1 widening? Um, this, the, the motion just is about uh, Mission Street improvements as approved by the city council. And multimodal. Multimodal improvements. <laughs> and as, as well as the Highway 1 bridge. But not Highway 1, per se, the whole. Not Highway 1 past uh, south towards uh, Watsonville. So I think it'd be a good idea. <laughs> I, 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 too, want to, you know, Adam, not, I, I really think, you know, I, I, I try to read all the stuff that comes to us. And um, <clears throat> I don't know if maybe outside of the council members who are on the RTC have read these documents. Uh, they're an, of enormous length, and I really, we've never had a study session on them. I really think we should. I think these decisions are really huge. Um, and, and I will say for the record too, I, I support the council of endorsing the transit and active transportation measures in the UCIS, but I, 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 I oppose auto-centric projects. Um, and I don't support the highway uh, widening that bridge over the San Lorenzo River. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Noroyan. And this is where I just don't understand why people wouldn't be in favor of widening that bridge when there are safety issues. People are not going to ride their bike, uh, not ride their bike because we widened that. Um, people who are on that road coming into Santa Cruz aren't doing it, um, usually through there, um, because they said, gee, I could have ridden my bike instead of driving um, on this stretch of road. It is a huge safety issue. I grew up here. I've seen so many horrific accidents at that intersection. So. I just don't understand. It's the approach that's dangerous and uh, it needs to be fixed. Okay, Council Member Brown. Um, I just want to reiterate my uh, willingness to support this motion in the interest of moving us forward here. We have a busy agenda today, um, and I, I believe that we will have plenty of time to uh, discuss, get more information, and debate the merits of the Highway 1 bridge. I just use it as an example um, in the future, at future meetings. So I, um, you know, I assume that will happen. I look forward to those conversations, and um, I absolutely appreciate Council Member Crone's suggestion, and I suggested the same, that for council members who do want to have more information and fully digest this document, I do think um, we could have some kind of study session with the council sometime in January to um, allow council members who are interested to, to really weigh in, you know, understand it better and, and potentially weigh in further. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, we could do that, I, you know, if, if the um, incoming mayor is so inclined and or council members are so inclined. Would the maker of the motion uh, see that as a friendly amendment that we schedule a study session on this document? I, you know, I, I, we would really need commission yeah. staff Look. to be part of that study session. They're really focused on trying to get their side of the equation for the commission done. I don't really realistically think that's going to be possible before I, I would the say this, January just commission response, meeting. Response: This is going to be a, a you know discussion over years, and I think you're going to probably have plenty of opportunities to weigh in on this. So I, I mean, if it's okay with the council, let's. Uh, I'd like to call call the. Well, I, I mean, I, I'd like to see where people are. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes with Council Member Crone voting no. Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Chase, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Noroyan, and Vice Mayor Watkins and myself voting in favor. And we will then be moving on to the next item, 11 o'clock time certain. We're not, uh, we're not on that right yet because we're gonna take one quick break. We've been going since 8.30 a.m. and then we're gonna come right back. So can we give us five minutes? That'd be perfect, Mayor. I got a bunch of members outside that wanted to come in. They, they can come on in. Yeah, how about give us five minutes and... Perfect. Yeah, thank you. And get comfy. So it looks like there's a lot of people out there.
<laughs> hey, thank you. Welcome everybody who's here. We, um, we actually have um, some audio that can be projected outside so that, you know, I know we're in kind of course, uh, close quarters here. So um, if people would like to step outside that feel more comfortable, you'll still hear the proceedings and you could come up when it's time when we call for public comment if you'd like. So just want to make that option available for you because we do need to have access in the aisleways so people can, can um, and travel through the, uh, through the facility. So next up on our agenda is item number 26. This is a public hearing for the 100 Laurel Street project. Um, we are going to, at this point, turn it over to Samantha Hatchard, our senior planner, or excuse me, Lee Butler, our director of planning, to speak. What was that? Please, go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, Planning Director for the City. And uh, we're very pleased to be presenting to you today the project that is proposing redevelopment of the properties on the north side of Laurel Street between uh, Pacific Avenue and Front Street. Um, we're all well aware of the uh, housing crisis that we're in. We're also well aware of the many decades uh, that have gone by since we've seen substantial investments in the southern end of our downtown. And uh, the council and our entire city team have been taking a series of efforts uh, to address both of those issues. And I'll start with uh, by framing the conversation with uh, <coughs> the updates that we did to the downtown plan last year. Um, in response to the lack of investment in the southern end of our downtown as compared to um, what we had seen in the north end of the downtown following the 89 quake and since that time, uh, we embarked on updates to our downtown plan and those uh, updates um, specifically addressed the provision of additional height in the downtown area to facilitate the redevelopment of those projects. That was approved by the council in uh, late 2017 and then uh, it was certified by the Coastal Commission earlier this year. And those changes are what has facilitated this project moving forward. And so we're seeing the fruits of that labor now with this project coming forward and embodying the vision that was articulated by those revisions to the downtown plan. The other thing that uh, the council has done um, and that staff are uh, responding to is the housing blueprint subcommittee work and the, uh, the, the large community engagement effort that uh, then Mayor Chase led at the end of last year that led to a series of um, recommendations that were then prioritized by the housing blueprint subcommittee. And then on June 12th of this year, council provided direction to, as part of the housing production arm of those recommendations to really facilitate downtown housing creation. And one of those specific rec recommendations and the direction provided by the council on June 12th was to focus city resources and staff to encourage construction or approval of units downtown with a specific focus on enabling projects in the current development pipeline to break ground. And so this project does represent um, one of those projects that we've had in the pipeline and we're, pre we're pleased to to present it to you here today. Uh, Samantha Hashert, senior planner, as well as Bonnie Lipscomb, the director of economic development, will be providing some more details on the project and will be available for questions following the presentation and uh, public comments. Thank you. I'll turn it over for the presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a six story mixed use building with ground floor commercial and 205 residential apartments above. It requires approval of a demolition authorization permit, a sequential lot line adjustment, a design permit, a special use permit, a coastal permit, a revocable license for outdoor extension areas, a heritage tree removal permit and approval of street tree removal. Um, this project in this location, as Lee was saying, was directly envisioned by the downtown plan with the objectives of increasing housing stock in a transit priority area and also providing better connectivity between downtown and the beach and downtown in the San Lorenzo River. 
An approval of this project would be in line with strategic goal one of the city council's two-year work plan to approve 500 to 600 housing units downtown. And it would also be in line with goals of the housing element to provide a diversity of housing types and concentrate new housing in the commercial core. Also to facilitate development of affordable housing through collaboration with nonprofit organizations, this development would contribute land to allow the city to meet that goal. There are many project specific details in the staff report that we provided to the Planning Commission. And so I'd like to focus this report just on some of the um, concerns that were brought up by the public during this process. This project was heard by the Downtown Commission on September 27th, who recommended approval of a 37 to 65 parking space deficiency. This is in line with the um, parking district resolution to encourage shared parking in the downtown area. The Planning Commission heard this item on November 15th and recommended approval with some modified conditions. The project is also subject to the provisions of the California Environmental Quality Act. CEQA provides streamlining pr provisions that allow for a lead agency to not repeat an analysis where impacts were adequately analyzed in an earlier EIR. Uh, this is under Public Resources Code sections 21083.3 and its parallel CEQA guidelines provision section 15183. We completed a checklist and found that the certified, certified EIRs for the general plan and the downtown plan amendments adequately address the impacts of the project. The project density that's proposed is consistent with the assumption of build out that we used as a basis for the previous analysis in the downtown plan EIR. Um, but we did require subsequent reports to confirm th these analysis. We uh, required full traffic reports, parking and circulation analysis, noise impact re assessments, um, an arborist report, a historic resource report, archeological reports, and all of these are referenced in the staff report to the Planning Commission. We also consulted with multiple departments, uh, Public Works uh, who reviewed the traffic and parking impacts and the Parks Department who reviewed the tree, tree preservation. And our checklist was pre prepared by our professional CEQA consultant in, cons in consultation with Remy Moose Manley, a law firm that specializes in California environmental law. Um, the checklist found no new impacts triggering changes or additions to the previously certified general plan or downtown plan EIRs. And the variations that are proposed as a part of this project are really uh, minor design modifications that had no environmental impacts. So I'm just gonna go through the project to show you some of the um, uh, proposed development. This is the project site shown here between Pacific Avenue, Front Street, and Laurel Street. Uh, the property is seven parcels that would be combined to create a 62,806 square foot lot. The property is entirely located in the Central Business District Zone District and within the Regional Visitor Commercial Downtown Santa Cruz General Plan designation. Uh, the entire project is within the downtown plan, though with the western half in the Pacific Avenue subdistrict area and the eastern half in the Front Street Riverfront Corridor. The project site is also entirely within additional height zone A that allows for buildings up to 85 feet under specific criteria. Um, this is just a zoom in of the project site. The project would require the demolition of five existing buildings and we did review, a, we completed a historic analysis of these buildings to ensure that none of the buildings um, were of historic significance. Uh, here's a site plan for the proposed project. The ground floor consists of commercial uses and two floors of above ground parking. That ground floor covers the entire project site. The upper floors, floors two to six are shown in tan. Those are separated by an interior courtyard area. And then there's an interior mezzanine located at the middle of the building. Uh, this area down here is an open rooftop courtyard or open space area that's above a 55 foot high portion of the building. The tan portions of the building are 75 feet in height and the mezzanine area shown in green here reaches a height of 85 feet. This is a bird's eye view of the project. Um, gives a good idea of how the architect has provided significant breaks between buildings and a variety of design uh, styles 
and also uh, step backs in building height and uh, variations in stories to provide a grouping of buildings rather than one large monolithic building. This is a view of the Laurel Street frontage. This is a pretty significant building mass here. However, it benefits from a two-story height variation and also this significant break to the interior courtyard area. Uh, and then the Front Street frontage, which again is another large building mass, but this one doesn't benefit from any significant breaks. Um, so we have included a condition of approval that would require the architect to uh, provide uh, either uh, differentiation in design, building stepbacks, recess breaks um, to break it down this building mass. This is a view of the downtown area with the project site shown here at the bottom in red. Um, you can see the Palomar building here. That's a seven story, 95 foot tall building at its tallest point. Um, and then 1010 Pacific is here. And 1010 Pacific is six stories and 68 feet tall. And then the future will have uh, under construction a building at the top of downtown, which is five, story, five stories and 50 to 60 feet tall at 1547 Pacific. So the proposed project is within the range of um, building heights downtown. Um, onto uses, the ground floor of the building is shown here in this floor plan. The commercial uses are concentrated on Pacific Avenue with outdoor cafes, extension areas, and a main lobby to the building to funnel the residents to Pacific Avenue. The Pacific Avenue frontage would include wide awnings, retractable storefronts, a mix of materials, significant landscaping. Um, this is all really intended to eliminate the hard edge between the public and private realms and create gathering spaces for residences. The design is generally consistent with the uh, d design and development standards provided in the downtown plan, but the downtown plan recognizes that the criteria can't address every situation. So it does allow for design variations that are minor in nature and that help the project better meet the goals of the downtown plan. Uh, those variations, uh, I'm sorry, the applicant is proposing six variations and the planning commission and the planning department support all but two of those. So the first is, going back to the floor plan here, to not uh, wrap the parking garage with commercial uses. So as I mentioned, the commercial uses are concentrated on Pacific Avenue. There's less commercial uses on Laurel Street, um, but on Front Street, there's very minimal commercial uses um, and none other than just the one at the corner. Um, the current state of uh, Front Street is not uh, a thriving commercial area, but the proposed de development will include 205 new <coughs> residential units. The metro site is also being considered for redevelopment into 100% uh, affordable housing development, and a large mixed-use development is um, in process on Front Street at the terminus of Cathcart. So Front Street is in a state of evolution, and we would like the project to better meet the downtown goals by providing additional commercial space on Front Street. Um, the condition of approval is included and has been drafted in a broad way to allow the applicant to determine what's economically feasible to provide true commercial spaces or possibly residential amenity space to activate that, that frontage. And the planning commission included an additional uh, part in that condition that requires any space that's not converted to commercial uses to be designed to be able to be easily converted in the future to commercial uses. The second variation that's not supported is to allow for a mezzanine at the corner of, uh, at, in this commercial space at the corner of Front Street and Laurel Street um, to create a, a 10 foot high ceiling within that for space for about 70% of the space. Uh, we found that that would be very limiting to a future tenant. It would reduce visibility at that corner, which is identified as a gateway corner in the downtown plan. And so we've recommended that the mezzanine be set back at least 20 feet from the front walls of the tenant space. And um, uh, we would uh, desire that bike parking in the mezzanine to be relocated to an interior space instead. Here's some renderings of the project. These are from the Laurel Street Bridge. This is the Front Street elevation. And then another rendering from uh, Front Street. 
um, and then another rendering at night here. Have one more showing the active space illuminated within the ground floor of the building. Um, so um, I just quickly wanted to go over how the inclusionary housing is being proposed for this project and then I'm gonna turn it over to Bonnie Lipscomb, the economic development director to get into further detail on how that was um, calculated. But the, the project is proposing to use two sections of code to address the inclusionary housing requirements. Uh, the first one is section 2416055 of the zoning ordinance. That was adopted on October 9th 2018 and allows for the city to determine an alternative percentage only in cases where properties were acquired and applications for projects commenced during the time when the courts ruled that cities could not limit rental amounts for affordable housing due to a conflict with the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act. So this is commonly referred to as the Palmer case. So this ordinance, the zoning ordinance, was intended to address situations where a developer moved forward with the purchase of a property and a project with the assumption based on this court case that they could construct a 100% rental project without the requirement for inclusionary housing and where the full 15% inclusionary requirement could make that project economically infeasible. So consistent with that ordinance, they did submit a pro forma analysis, analysis for review and um, Bonnie will go over that. Uh, the second section of the zoning ordinance that applies is section 2416030 subsection seven. That is a section that allows for land dedication as an alternative method to comply with the inclusionary housing requirement. This is a feasible option if the land to be dedicated is adjacent to city owned land and is a critical component of a larger city supported affordable housing project. So the applicant is proposing to dedicate two parcels at 820 and 822 Pacific Avenue to the city uh, to be used as part of a future 100% affordable housing project adjacent or concurrently with the Metro Center. Um, the land meets both of these requirements. And then in addition, the city is asking for the property owner to obtain and dedicate the parcel at 818 Pacific Avenue or pay an in lieu fee of $1.2 million <coughs> to the housing fund to ensure that the value um, is consistent with the value of the land dedication. So I think at this point, I'll turn it over to Bonnie to get into further detail on that. Great, thank you, Sam. Good, uh, good morning, uh, council members, mayor and council members. Um, so um, we actually have our uh, financial consultant on a, a WebEx and um, I'm going to give her the opportunity to speak at the end of this presentation because um, a lot of what has been discussed as far as financial feasibility is based on her analysis of the project. This isn't a, a city staff analysis of what's financially feasible. This is our independent financial consultants um, analysis of what is feasible. I think from our perspective, we would love for the project Project to be able to support uh, a 15% inclusionary within the project, but based on the analysis, it's just not supportable within the project. With that said, we do believe that the 15% inclusionary requirement can be met. Um, as Sam mentioned, um, the land dedication is an alternative means of compliance, and I'll go into that in a little bit more specificity here in a minute. Um, there have been some questions about the project-specific analysis for this project that's been conducted. We initially um, had Kathy Head from Kaiser Marston do an analysis um, when the project first came forward in 2016 and then update that analysis in 2018. Um, and so this is based on the general project specifics of a 205 unit project at a density of 130 units per acre. Um, the assumptions for that um, are that in order for a project to be feasible, there needs to be an unrestricted market rate project, approximately a 5% stabilized return to the developer um, and put a different way that a project is not supportable if it, there's a reduction of, in the land value by more than 30%. So that's sort of the threshold. And if it starts to dip, to dip below 30%, um, it's deemed not feasible from a developer standpoint. Um, and Kathy can go into that in a little more detail. So that's the threshold basis for the percentages that we're, we're discussing um, for this analysis. 
Um, and so the August 2018 downtown inclusionary analysis, this actually was included in the inclusionary housing ordinance amendments that came forward to you in September, um, had a discussion of a downtown base case that ultimately supported a 15% um, downtown inclusionary um, requirement in the downtown and a 10% out outside the downtown. And the difference between those two is that for the downtown base case, the assumption is that developers in the downtown are going to be able to take advantage of the density bonus provisions. And so the difference between that, specifically in the downtown, and I don't think we went into detail about this um, back in September, but the difference of the base zoning before you add in the density bonus, downtown supportable is 6% inclusionary. And so this is relevant when we actually get into this specific project analysis. Um, but uh, there are, are a few reasons why um, this particular project is not going to take advantage of the density bonus provision. So as a result, the actual affordability for their project is closer to the 6%. And when you actually get their specific financial information, um, the actual supportable inclusionary housing within their project is 5.5%. <laughs> Um, but there have been a lot of discussions of how, how can we have 15% and you're suggesting 5.5%. So I wanted to give a little bit of background on that. Um, but that at the end of the presentation, Kathy Head can go into the specifics. Um, so, so key differences that I wanted to um, just call out to your attention between the specific project, and that means the proposed project before you today, and the base case scenario. The base case scenario was based on a hypothetical 90 unit per acre project. Um, the base case was based on 100 units in the downtown, so it would be easy to see as a percentage the number of inclusionary units. Um, the proposed project is already developed, um, and they can do this by right, um, at a higher density than the base case scenario was anticipated. Um, the no higher density on the proposed project can really be achieved without changing the construction type. And once you change the construction type, the costs go up dramatically. So as a result, the density bonus does not change the economics overall to support um, that incentive for the developer to take advantage of the density bonus provisions within this particular project. Hopefully that won't be the case, I think, for a lot of the other projects in the downtown. Also, as Sam mentioned, um, the, because the Palmer case was uh, um, the prevailing, um, we couldn't enforce um, the inclusionary provisions, you know, over the last, since, you know, 2009. They did purchase and assemble this land, paying higher land value with the expectation that they wouldn't be um, required to provide that 15%. So they did pay a higher land value. Um, when you actually look at the analysis of what a 15% inclusionary would require for this project, um, when you look at that, it actually creates a negative land value, meaning that the everything they paid for the land um, would have to be completely free and then some by a couple million. It just doesn't work financially. Um, with that said, because we have alternative means to comply with our inclusionary housing requirement, that 15% threshold can be met by alternative methods. And specifically, we're talking about the land dedication. And so as Sam mentioned, but just to call out specifically, an applicant may propose to donate a minimum of 15% of the net developable land area of the residential development to the city for the construction of a project with at least 25% of its total units unrestrict restricted to low-income households or below. And I underline the next part um, of a lesser amount or a lesser amount of land of the parcel is adjacent to city-owned land and is a critical component of a larger city-supported affordable housing project. Um, with that said, I still, when I'll show you in a second, we're actually really close to the 15% um, of land dedication, and we'll show that to you. Additionally, we have um, the recent um, 2018 AB 1505, which does amend section 65850 of the government code that um, requires jurisdictions to include alternative means of fulfilling the affordable housing obligation, including in lieu fees, land dedication, offsite construction, et cetera. So what we're proposing today and what we're recommending does comply both with our existing ordinance um, as well as the government code section as far as inclusionary housing. Um, so specifically to look at, and I will show you a map in just a second, but just wanted to run through the numbers with you first, the land dedication inclusionary analysis. So the project, the net developable land area, that's when you take away the setbacks, we're actually taking, I think it's like an eight foot right away, you know, off of uh, Laurel for a street dedication. When you actually take out the areas that the developer can't develop, that developable land area is 55,160 feet. So we take um, per our inclusionary, 
um, requirement, we take 15% of that as a land base, which um, is comparable to a 15%, and that gets you to 8,272 square feet. When you look at the sites that we're proposing um, to be dedicated to the city, that's the Tamp commonly known as the Tampico site, um, 820 and 822, that's a 7,797 square foot project, which is approximately 14.14% of the developable area of the existing project. If you add in um, 1818 Pacific, which what we're, is what we're proposing, we're proposing to either the developer to additionally acquire the 1818 Pacific and also dedicate that to the city, or alternatively, if they're not able to do that, to provide an inclusionary fee of 1.2 million to fully satisfy what we feel like is the inclusionary requirement. If they're able to acquire that 1818 Pacific, that additional square footage actually brings the total inclusionary as far as a percentage of the land area up to 19%. So it does exceed the 15% if, they're, if they are able to develop um, both areas. <laughs> Okay, um, so this actually shows the map of the areas we're just talking about. Um, and the city owned, just as reference, the city project that we already own that we're working on is adjacent to the metro project. And so last year, actually last year this time, we completed the acquisition of the NIAC building, which is at the back on the side facing Front Street. Um, and that's 333 Front Street. In the front, we already owned the city parking lot. So we have a total of 24,000 square feet, a little over half an acre that we currently currently own. Um, we're in discussions with Metro. We would like to do um, a project that includes this city um, acreage and um, does a um, land exchange uh, with Metro so that we can develop the frontage along the existing Metro. We'd like to be able to add an additional land, including this land dedication. The 1820-1822 Pacific are the two areas in yellow um, that the um, applicant, the developer here today, currently owns and is proposing to dedicate to the city to satisfy the inclusionary land requirement. That's the 14% uh, of their current project, which is the 7,797 square feet. We are additionally, um, the area in back is just to show you ultimately what we would like to have the footprint for our proposed affordable housing city, city developed um, land project. Um, the area in purple, hot pink, um, is the additional land that we're at the city also uh, requiring to be part of the conditions of approval to meet the inclusionary as far as a land dedication. This is the either additionally acquire and dedicate to the city um, this additional two, uh, 2,874 square feet or uh, pay an in lieu fee of 1.2. So it's the um, yellow and the purple together that makes up the land area that exceeds the 15% um, um, alternative means of complying with the inclusionary. Um, so that's the overall area. I wanted to show you, and just to show you the map, um, and then go to the next area. This is the proposed adjacent project, and I thought um, it would be good just to provide that context of what we've been working on with Metro um, for the proposed Pacific Station. Um, and this one, you can see the city-owned land that's shown in red on the preceding slide, I'm sorry, blue on the preceding slide, is also blue on this slide. And that's just a, a little over half an acre. Um, what we'd like to do is exchange the area that's translucent in blue with the area that sort of cross-hatched along Pacific Avenue. And so to create the city frontage, which would be an affordable housing project over um, ground floor commercial retail, a new sort of entryway for the metro um, with housing on top. And then we'd like to add in the proposed land dedication um, from this project of you know, approximately, you know, 10,000 uh, additional square feet to the project as well, which is the area to the right on, on yellow. Um, additionally, we would like to add the area behind that that goes to Front Street, um, but we first want to secure um, these parcels before we move on to that next area. We've had some questions of, well, if you dedicate or accept this land dedication, how many units can you actually create on this project? So um, just looking at the hatched area along Pacific, we did an initial analysis of how many units we could fit on that site. And for this site, keeping under the existing construction type that's more affordably developed, um, we could develop approximately 100 to 108 units um, on this site with an, a range of, of unit types. When we're looking at the density um, specifically of between the downtown base case, just to have sort of a range um, that we may 
made for the financial analysis, as well as the proposed existing project, which goes up to 130 units per acre. Um, and look at this total land area, which is approximately a quarter of an acre. That gives us an estimate that's very conservative and reasonable between 22 and 34 um, affordable or inclusionary units that we can actually create with this combined land dedication area. So I wanted to look at it from two different ways. One, um, by our ordinance, it's just a 15% or less land dedication. But I also wanted to look at, well, what can we reasonably develop um, within that 15%? And obviously it's, it's, it's comparable to um, what would be the qu requirement if you were to um, include that 15%, which would be about 31 units within the project. Um, obviously, the density um, would be subject to future council council direction, um, and that would be you know some point in the future when we actually bring the design development forward to you for the um, city public project. Um, and then um, I actually wanted to give you the opportunity to hear directly from Kathy Head if you wanted to go into the detail of how she got to the downtown um, scenario of a 6% um, base case inclusionary percentage as well as a 9% for the density bonus. But I, I wanted to first um, see from you if you would like to hear her to go into that level of detail. It is uh, um, relevant to um, the discussion today, but it is, it it is quite detailed financial analysis. Well, let's just say um, we could see how the questions go, and if we need to, we can have her supplement. Unless there's any, you know, anyone who's looking for that information now. I'll just say I'm, there's a lot of information I'm looking for, and I don't think we're going to cover it all today, so I won't do this right now. But <laughs> well, I wanted to. I mean, I think that we 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 purposefully scheduled this to get as much information as we can. So I would encourage you. Let's we have the we have the professional staff here. Let's let's hear it. I mean, if is there something um, I just wanted you you suggested that Bonnie, and so if there's something you'd like to bring forward, please do so. Well, I'm just sort of going. You know, just. Scrolling through the slides so you can see the information that Kathy had our financial consultant who I believe is on WebEx um, She's muted right now on her phone, but is willing to go through the detail of how she got to the six and the nine percent And I know there have been some questions about that Councilmember, I, I would appreciate that. Okay, Thank great. You. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Let me make sure uh, Kathy. Are you there? Uh -oh. Hi, I'm here. Sorry, I turned you off the Oh, wow. Great. Um, so this is Kathy Head um, with Kaiser Marston, who is our financial consultant. As you can see, she's traveling um, between uh, meetings. Kathy, I'm going to turn it over to you and let me know if you want me to go back to your slides. Hey, thanks for being in the passenger seat. Well, that's fine. I've been listening along. So, um, well, anyway, um, are the slides the same as the original slides? Like yes, they are the same slides. Is the 
essentially how you get to it being supportable. Um, so anyway, that's the basics of that. So then in the next slide, I have a market rate alternative. First is how I got to a financially feasible inclusionary percentage for the downtown before consideration of density bonds, before consideration of the section 65, 915 density bonds, otherwise you know, state density bonds. Um, that's light up on. Yes, that's it. Okay. okay, so in that scenario, what I did was I, the prototype project, I ran on a pro forma for it as though it was a 100% market rate project. And the reason I ran that was to say, look, if a developer was in town and bought land with land costs in downtown and had no restrictions on it in terms of affordability, what return? would be generated by that project. So this isn't an analysis of whether that project would then be feasible for the development. It's simply an analysis of nobody's restricting you. You can get the, the market rent, whatever the market will bear, and it costs what it costs to build. And so that's the left-hand column under market rate alternative. And so as you can see in that column, the market rate alternative has a cost of about $54 million. Um, and then from there, what I did was I said, okay, as, and as Bonnie discussed this in her presentation, this notion of the city can impose a restriction that alters the <coughs> return, that alters the, the financial characteristics of the return. You just have to make sure that you haven't basically taken an unreasonable amount or an onerous amount. And so over time, when we've done these analyses, we've come to, to use as, as a surrogate a 30% reduction in land value, which, which Bonnie mentioned in her presentation. And so what, what, to get to that then, what, what you do or what I did, is I tested how many affordable units using the city's affordability measure, which is taking 80% of the area median income and using 30% of that, yeah, using that to come to the to the allowable rent. And so the result of that analysis, and this was in the August analysis and the September analysis, was that you could put the downtown before any consideration of density bonus, a 6% requirement. And that's in the, in the right-hand column. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to make um, two points. Is one is thank you for the detail and thoroughness of the presentation, the analysis you did in regards to calculating these costs. Second, how often have you done this before in looking at other projects, and how significant of a of a, of a level of review and, and close to that these outcomes have you seen in past analysis? You know, I've, I've done. Um, this is my. I'm actually redoing two cities inclusionaries right now, and, and there was. I've done 27 inclusionary ordinances, and in each of, mostly all of those cities, I've also done their disposition work on affordable housing. And so, and I also do density bonus work um, all over Southern California. So I do these comparative analyses regularly. And so this cost, the cost of about $334,000 in inclusionary units, is, is pretty typical. It's not, it's, it, I'd say it's in the middle. 
So would you say this costing is highly reliable? I, I, well, I believe that part, but I did that, so I'm pleased with my analysis. Thanks. Council Member Crone. You know, I have, can I make one oh, more point about it? The sure. numbers you're looking at now, I did one analysis in June of inclusionary, and then after that, we um, met with the, um, well, met with the email, with a number of local developers who were kind enough to share numbers from their project. And so the numbers you're looking at now were then done in August as an update to the June analysis to pull those numbers in. So the numbers you're looking at have been, um, were provided, the direct cost numbers, the direct construction cost numbers, were done having reviewed the numbers that the, the developer group provided me. Thank you, Ms. Head. Um, one of the council members has a question. Council Member Crone. Hi, Kathy. Um, my question is, and, and maybe I am not, not seeing this, but is 15% of land of the total project how is that equivalent to 15% of the affordable units? It seems like apples and oranges kind of comparison, or is it? What am I not seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. The situation is your ordinance was written that way, it, you know, originally, has been written that way with the 15% cost of land debt case. Um, and so it's not a question of how that works in terms of this particular project and how many units it could support. Um, I have not done any financial analysis on that requirement, that 15% land dedication requirement, but it looked like just for this particular project, it looked like it tracked pretty consistently. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions while we have this um, kind of market analysis and regarding the uh, market rate versus inclusionary percentage um, while uh, Kathy Head's on the phone? Any questions? I have two more tables. Right, but I'm just up to this point. You've, you're given a lot of good detail in regards to the project analysis, so I just want to make sure that we can kind of pace ourselves. Okay, I don't see any, so if you'd continue, please. Okay, great. So, Bonnie, can you go to the next slide? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so this is what I did. I went through the numbers that you just heard, the 5% and the $334,000 per unit. And I looked at the I'm gonna... So, and then the other three, to get us to 15 total affordable units, for low income units using Santa Cruz inclusionary rent. Okay, so that's the 35 additional units that you get with a density bonus. Okay, I'm gonna ask. Oh, yeah. I just wanna make sure, are there any questions at this point? I mean, going over some of the detail. No, okay. I just want to make sure that we're, you know, we can cover any sort of questions people have as as you're going through your presentation. That's perfect. I appreciate that. I'm telling you guys to tell me because I don't know what's going on. Okay. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So this is the next slide. Additional market rate units. 
add some of the, the other costs across these units. So what I did was I just looked at the incremental cost of these 20 market rate units and what those what that adds to the net value. And so if you're looking at, at Roman numeral 2A, the, the income, the, the stabilized net operating income, which is, is the rent minus the um, operating expenses, is $484,500. And again, here's the 5% threshold return on investment again. That's from the market rate analysis of the base case. If you divide the 484500 by 5%, you get $9.7 million of ad value. But it costs $6.7 million to build the movement. So you subtract the $6.7 million from the $9.7 million, and effectively your net value created by the 20 additional market rate units is $3 million. Now, I just want to make one comment that is really probably way more detailed than, than you want. But another factor that played into the stabilized net operating income of those 20 market rate units was the fact that, that the very low income requirement being imposed on units that was strict for standards in the airport and your exclusionary. I also factored out that differential in income out of my, my stabilized net operating income. Again, that's probably way too much in the weeds, but I just wanted you to know that. So anyway, net value is $2 million. So now, we want to figure out how many inclusionary units that extra $3 million would accommodate. And so that's in the Roman numeral 3 there. You'll see that so $2,998 or effectively $3 million. Divided by the net cost per exclusionary unit, which was from the earlier table, $334,000, generates nine units. So it's just one number divided by the other. Generates nine units. And because your base project, and you can only measure against the big project, was 100 units, that nine units represents 9%. No, but I, while you were speaking, I made sure that we had copies of each of the analysis out so we have them on uh, the desk so that if people do have questions, they can. So are there any questions up until this point regarding the presentation, regarding the analysis in this next slide? Anyone? Okay, I don't see any questions. Okay, so the final slide just sums up the two. So the, the base case analysis generated support for a 6% inclusionary requirement. Using the density bonus added value and it added sufficient value to support another 9%, which is how we got the 16%. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any questions uh, from the council regarding that analysis? I think you had a question in regards to it. So thank you for that thorough report. Um, and I understand this was also presented, at least the, the analysis from the report to the Planning Commission, is that correct? Um, not at this level of, of this level of detail, but we did have the base case scenario. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, I'll um, ask, go ahead, please. Mayor Trastis, I just wanted to quickly finish up the report and give you a recommendation here. Um, we have received public comments both in opposition and support of the project which you have received. You also received today a revised resolution and um, that is because we added one find finding related to offsite land dedication to meet the project's inclusion, inclusionary housing requirements. Um, so essentially that finding states that because the parcels will be dedicated to the city, the city can control the ultimate use of the property for affordable housing. And so the city's control of the land represents adequate security to ensure that the future construction of inclusionary housing units will be provided. Um, the proposed development as conditioned is consistent with the goals and uh, design and development criteria of the downtown plan. Therefore, it's recommended that the city council acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the uh, permits that are before you today for the proposed project based on the findings and the conditions of approval. Thank you. Thank you. So does that conclude your presentation? Yes, it does. Okay. Thanks. Are there any questions from the council regarding the staff presentation? Ready? Council Member Brown. Thank 
you for the presentation and all your work that's gone into um, bringing us this project and to the applicants. Um, I, I just have, I have many comments which I'll reserve for later, but um, just if you could, um, when was the environmental checklist that came, we had got a hard copy this morning when we arrived at City Hall, when was this made available to the council, uh, the checklist that you referred to with respect to coverage of environmental review through the downtown plan and the staff's determination of items that fell outside the downtown, or excuse me, the downtown recovery plan and the items that fell outside of that plan. When, when was that provided to council and to the, made available to the general public? When was the checklist made available? The checklist was completed uh, prior to the Planning Commission meeting. Um, it was provided as an attachment to the Planning Commission staff report, um, and it was recently provided to you. Um, it Is am I correct that it was at 9.58 p.m. last night? Because that's the email I received, 9.58 p.m.? Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the exact time that it was provided, but it was provided, yeah, it was provided as part of the Planning Commission staff report, but yes, it was provided. Another follow-up question, well, when... Are there questions regarding the information that was presented? Well, I haven't been able to read it because we received it at 9.58 p.m. last night and I actually didn't look at it until I walked in this morning. I would just say uh, and add that there was not any additional information that, um, from the environmental review that needed to amend what was studied in the downtown plan EIR that this council certified. So all of the analysis that we conducted concluded that the downtown plan EIR adequately covered all of the project impacts. So while we did uh, several studies and the planning commission staff report identified those, including things like traffic counts um, were specifically called out in the um, planning commission staff report that was attached to the council's packet. Um, that um, conclusion as identified in the planning commission staff report was that it all falls within the uh, previously analyzed downtown EIR. Second question, um, was the council at any point asked to um, reacquaint itself with the uh, downtown recovery plan EIR and if not, which I believe the answer is no, when was the last time the council was directed to um, review the downtown recoveries plan environmental impact report? I can't recall that. The council reviewed the downtown plan EIR um, in roughly November of uh, last year, um, so about a year ago, and the staff report did call out that this project is relying on the downtown plan EIR, so that was specifically calling the council's attention to that issue. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions at this side? Council Member Crum. Yeah, I appreciate you um, leaving ample time for, yep. for questions. That's why we got here at 8.30. <laughs> that I don't know. Uh, Bonnie, could you talk about the exchange of the property again? Because I'm not sure I was clear on it. I'm, I'm understanding that there's the Tempico's building, which is either a Tempico's building or 1.2 million. Do I have that right? Um, and so is that like going to be assessed value at the time of this the whole deal coming together? And we'll figure that out? No, the Tampico, which is 820-822, are the two parcels outlined in yellow, and the, the applicant, the developer, already owns those and is proposing to dedicate that to the city. Additionally, we are looking at them also either acquiring and dedicating the area outlined in purple, um, also commonly known as the pipeline site, that's 818 Pacific Avenue. So we're asking for all three, and alternatively, if they can't acquire, since they don't own that site, right. okay. uh, in, in lieu of dedicating, acquiring, dedicating the purple parcel, they would pay the city on top of the land dedication an additional 1.2 million. Are there any other land exchanges that you talked about? Um, for the purposes of this project and the conditions of approval, we're talking about the three parcels, the two in yellow and the additional one in purple. Do we have an idea of what these um, units are gonna rent for? The yellow and the purple? The no, ones that were- No, the units in the uh, market rate project. 
Um, I, the applicant is here and I'm sure he's done that analysis. Kathy Head independently has done an analysis uh, of the, you know, it's, it's market rate supportable rents for the market rate project, but they can specifically talk so, to Similar that. to 555 Pacific Avenue, those kinds of rents? that are getting 32 to 3,800. I mean, they're gonna be presenting after this portion so we could have them address that or just mark it for reference. Another question about um, not wrap garage with commercial uses. Why, why would we not wanna do that again? I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, you, see, you mentioned not wrapping the garage with commercial uses. The um, proposal from the applicant is to not wrap the garage with commercial uses and the downtown plan specifically encourages um, a, the addition of active uses along Front Street. Um, plus we see that Front Street is evolving to a more pedestrian friendly area and we'd like to activate that, that area. Um, we are specifically not requesting shoulder to shoulder commercial um, as that might not be feasible for the applicant, but we would like to them to provide some additional active spaces. Okay, so that would be one of the requirements. That would be one approval. of the requirements, yeah. Um, is, this, is this six stories or seven stories? It's six stories. Six stories. Yes. And how many heritage trees are gonna be removed? Um, there are 22 trees on the property and I believe two are heritage that would be removed. Yes, there, there are 22 trees on the property. Um, what page is that? Um, this is on, this is actually in the um, staff report to the Planning Commission, page 20. Thank you. Yep, there are 20, uh, there's eight heritage trees and then two non-heritage trees on the site too. But th that those will remain, you're saying? There are, there are 22 existing trees on the property of the 22 trees. The report identifies eight heritage trees of which two non-heritage, of which two are non-heritage street trees. And those all are, are, would be coming down or leaving some of them? Yeah, there, so of those eight trees, two are coming, two are within the project site and those would be removed as a part okay. of the project. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and uh, would this be the time to ask the Measure O uh, question to our city attorney if we could get some clarification? Sure. On, and I don't know about giving away legal strategy or anything, but we received a letter from uh, Whitware and Parkin on the Measure O and how the city is not implementing Measure O and the fact that we're only getting 5.5% inclusionary, aren't we violating uh, the ordinance that exists? That was a vote, actually, it's not, it's a, it was a vote of the people. It wasn't just a city council um, made ordinance. Right, um, yeah, I can address that. Measure O was a, was a, a community supported ballot initiative that requires that, um, 15% of new residential construction, be it for sale or rental property, um, be affordable or inclusionary. Um, I think back in October when the council uh, initially amended its inclusionary uh, housing ordinance, this was uh, covered in some depth by the planning director who pointed out that um, first of all, that has, uh, historically been interpreted to mean 15% of the total number of units constructed in the city, not 15% of each parcel that's developed. And I think the, the uh, and that's the, that's the manner in which the ordinance has been interpreted in the, in the past, at least since 2007, and um, also provided the basis for modifying the inclusionary ordinance uh, as you did back in October and again more recently. Um, the argument that's made in the parking letter is that the 15% uh, applies to all development projects in the city. Um, that 
argument has not been tested in the court, but it's not the way the city's interpreted um, measure O in both crafting uh, its inclusionary housing ordinance and in uh, applying it. Do you have any other questions, Councilman Wilcrum? Yeah, maybe just an analysis from Bonnie about why developers in general, maybe not on this project, but don't want um, inclusionary units built within their projects. Yeah, I, th I think it's largely um, just a matter of economics and looking at what is feasible for the project. And they're, as they're calculating their return, they're looking at what the market can support and they're looking at the risk that they're taking as they're doing a development project. So I think that's largely based on um, what is financially supportable. So if this, for example, if the city came in and said, no, we'll, we'll build 20 units of market rate housing within your project, would that, would that kind of deal be um, uh, accepted? You said market rate, do you mean affordable? Oh, affordable, excuse me. We'll, we'll, we'll put um, in 20 and just sprinkle them around the, the complex. I, I think often we have done that in the past. I mean, I think that was the role that we really played when we had redevelopment and redevelopment funding is that we often were able to fill that affordability, that feasibility gap for developers. So when we had requirements, we would come forward and provide um, that, that financial gap that made that feasible. So a number of our projects in the past have, have done that. Um, if we had a viable source right now, and I know that there's some discussion of some legislation in the next session that may provide that, I think that's something that we can look at again. Um, we, we didn't include today the chart that we've shown to you a couple times in the past that shows the creation of you know, affordable units you know, since 1980, but the large spikes that you see and, and the majority, uh, I mean 90 to 95% of the affordable units that were created were created with um, redevelopment agency city assistance financially. So so I think the reality in our market is that it takes a subsidy to create the affordable units. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Matthews and then Council Member Brown. Yeah, there's been some um, questions about the process to proceed uh, with the dedication of the two yellow parcels there. What would be the process to move forward um, with the um, affordable housing? Would it be an RFP to nonprofit housing providers? Is that how you would anticipate yeah creating. it would be similar to how we do other other yeah. affordable mm -hmm. housing projects is that we would um, finish assembling all the land that mm -hmm. we wanted for the project in this scenario um, where we have you know and I uh, understand there are a lot of possibilities right yeah. we have a sort of a plan a which includes the activation on Pacific and the plan B which is more of a rectangle that includes the, Put the Putney Perry building um, facing Front Street you know so we have sort of two different development scenarios so our first goal would be to finish acquiring um, the land and assembling the land that we need and then we would put out an RFP for an affordable housing developer um, because we're effectively completely underwriting the value of the land right. it becomes an extremely attractive project for an affordable housing developer. We're not only providing the land at no cost, um, we're actually providing um, a number of things that make it very compatible for um, state and federal funding and that it's a transit oriented development project. We have two partners, which I hadn't mentioned, um, Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Dentis um, Low Cost Dental Care. There are a number of grants out there in addition to being very competitive for 9% tax credits for an affordable housing project. We have feel highly confident that we're going to be able to develop this project. Thank you. I, it, it's just a question that's come up, so I want the answer to be public. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I do have some additional questions. Insofar as the uh, Pacific Station project is not specifically on the table here today, but it is related, given the alternative with the the land uh, swap or land dedication, as you suggest. I do have some questions about that. But first, one quick question that I occurred to me when Councilmember Crone was speaking: with the the um, pipeline property. Uh, you know, I've been told various things, and I know we you can't really speculate about a willing seller here, but um, how close are we to knowing whether or not that property will be for sale? What is the um, estimated value, and is the 1.2 million an equivalent to the, the value of that property itself? 
Um, I, we have done um, at just from comps of some appraisals that we've done on the surrounding properties. We we do believe that it's comparable to what we're estimating as the in lieu fee. Um, with that said, um, we haven't um, as a city pursued that property at this at this time. However, the applicant has been in discussions with the owner. Thank you. Um, for more questions uh, coming. So, um, so it would be helpful because the you know I'm I'm still a little bit confused about the um, the the valuation of the land that is available to be dedicated the Tampico site vis-a-vis um, um, -vis the actual construction of uh, units. So if it would be helpful to get a better understanding of, I mean, are we, because these formulas for the alternatives when it comes to in lieu fees and or, uh, you know, alternative land dedication um, to make, to facilitate affordable housing somewhere else, um, if all the other variables can, you know, come, all the other variables come into play and we can secure the financing, et cetera, et cetera. But how, like, what, is it really equivalent to, um, you know, that number of, of affordable units? if they were actually built by the developer? I mean, how do we know this? I mean, it's something that confounds me every time we charge in lieu fees as well. Well, you know, as we were talking just a few minutes ago, the, um, the actual development cost of uh, you know creating affordable units is something that generally is heavily subsidized. Um, and so if you're looking at the land dedication, because we already have you know the, the pro property on the on the slide in front of you in, in dark blue, we're able to leverage that into more units in a project. So the estimate, the conservative estimate that we had was based on a density per acre between 90 and 138, 138 being a, a very dense project that is the, the applicant's um, density. Um, 90 being the base case um, scenario that um, our financial consultant did, um, and that's with the assumption of the 90 per acre that you would do density bonus, so it would become an even denser project. So that range that I gave you earlier between 22 and 34 units is conservatively within that um, within that area of looking at the three parcels, the two yellow and the purple, of minimally what we would be able to create fitting within that density. So between 22 and, and 38. I um, mean, if your question is, are we getting the same thing from the developer as if we they were to provide that 15% as an in lieu fee, um, no. And I, and I think that really goes back to um, Kathy Head's analysis of um, that's why it's a 5.5% percent um, because if we imposed that as a monetary, as a dollar amount on the developer, that 15 percent, they would be underwater on the project. So basically, they would be giving the land away for free and then paying the city an additional couple million um, for the rights to develop that property. If we imposed a 15 percent, you build the inclusionary units within the project. Yes, we can do that, I, but we can't force the developer to build the project. So I, 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 I think that's where it comes comes back to our independent financial analysis of saying, what is it that's supportable on the developer so that the land the land value isn't reduced more than 30% because that's sort of the industry threshold. So essentially, I, what we're saying here is um, the calculation of 15% is uh, can be um, flexible and that um, is up to the, I mean, I, I believe that's a decision that's up to the council, whether or not um, interpreting it to suggest that this is 15% is, is, I mean, that's a decision that the council ought to be making based upon the information we have. But one could say it's 5.5% if we look at it a different way versus 15%. Right, included in the project, the, the dollar value um, is 5.5. Um, if you're looking at the dedication here of how we're able to leverage it with the adjacent property, you know, it's between, you know, 15 and 17 percent. So given that we're um, uh, talking here, and I'm very much in favor of the Pacific Station project. I appreciate all the work that's gone in to, and I, you know, in no way do I want to suggest that I'd like to disrupt that, but I, because this is kind of the cornerstone of getting some affordable units connected with the decisions we make here, I really want to understand this. Um, so, um, the 
you know, I mean, I want to understand the feasibility of the specific station project because right now we have, you know, all we're going to have is the land. Um, we don't have uh, redevelopment money. We don't have deep pockets to subsidize development of those affordable units. So it's really kind of uh, hypothetical for the future. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a bit speculative and I'm all for finding those resources. Um, but um, I'd like to know a little bit more about your sense of, you know, and it sounds like you think that we are going to be competitive, um, you know, our ability to get affordable housing tax credits for this to, to move forward on construction. <laughs> Will, sorry, will we, um, you know, can the city be competitive for, you know, getting access to low income housing tax credits or the nonprofit through RFP? Well, you know, can an entity be competitive? Will we be competing with other potential affordable housing projects in the city for those tax credits? Um, you know, I just like to know where that is, that your thinking is in the, in the mix on that. Yeah. I, I we are highly competitive because of the level of investment that we have in the city, and we've completely underwritten the land value. Um, from It's extremely attractive to an affordable housing developer. I mean, this is the level of subsidy or even greater than um, any of the other projects that we've created over the year. There's 1,200 plus affordable housing units we've created with redevelopment. This is a similar level of subsidy um, comparable to those from the tannery to you know any variety of the projects from 1010 Pacific to Schaefer Road to any of those projects. So um, in discussions with probably three or four affordable housing developers, they are all anxiously awaiting for us to put an RFP out here, out on the street for them to respond to because this fits right within um, projects that can be supported. So we don't have any doubt that we'll be able to move forward on the project once we finish assembling the parcels. Okay. Um, what in, w is the um, plan for the... Uh, vacant lots in the interim before, so, so th those properties will be, I believe we're talking about a demolition permit here. Yeah, as part of the condition of approval for the two in yellow is we are recommending that the applicant demo that um, within you know a certain number, I think six months of uh, council approval. Um, they, because they're vacant right now, they are um, a nuisance property um, and we could come back to council to determine how we want to use that in the interim um, during the during the period, so you can, but uh, will we be looking at that, or will the the site? Be in I would hope so. Yeah. Just curious Sorry. about question the, to you. Go ahead. Yeah, your question is: Will we come back? We we absolutely will come back. Okay. Um, Well, I have major concerns. It's not really a question, but I mean, I have major concerns, as I've suggested, um, about the, our ability as a, the council to determine um, the, um, how we can use the downtown plan EIR. And I just don't think we have enough information, but I'll reserve that for uh, comments later. Um, last question. Um, I know you said that a historical review was conducted and there are no um, buildings of historical significance, which on the face of it, I seems reasonable to me, um, but I am interested to know a little bit more about that and in particular if any of the buildings in that project area are over 50 years old. Yes, that's true. The, some of the buildings are over 50 years old, which is what triggered the requirement for the historic report. Um, and some of the buildings were, um, it could have been historically significant. However, because of the extent of the remodels that were done after the earthquake, the building no longer maintained the significance. So the um, historic consultant uh, recommended that those would not be eligible for listing. Um, I believe that is it for now. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna just real quick because I wanted to follow up. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all, everyone, everyone in the public that's listening. Uh, I know that we're taking some time on this. this is a really important project and I wanna make sure that we're, we get every all the questions asked before we open it up for public comment as well as having the, um, the applicant present their project. I just have one um, question on what you asked. What, what, what were the concerns about the EIR? Because I'm not clear and I would like to know that, you know, just so we have an understanding what, what the issue is that you're referring to. The downtown EIR. I mean, I, it's just a general concern. I, I have not had, part of my point is that I haven't had time to review, the re-review the EIR 
w up against this project. So I don't, I mean, there may be many, there may be none, but that has not been something that we've been asked to do, that we've had time to do, and, and acting as a quasi-judicial body here to approve a project, I think that we should have that opportunity. Um, in Specifically with respect to measuring this against the EIR, but also with respect to uh, what was not, uh, the staff does not suggest has, was covered in the EIR. I mean, I'm, we're told it's insignificant. I received this information at 10 o'clock last night. Um, actually, when I looked at my email this morning, because I didn't look at it that late, and here in hard copy. So it's, I can't answer what questions I have because I have not had time to review. Okay. So. Well, I, I just had a couple questions before I ask Councilmember Crone. Um, this went through the um, the Planning Commission, and I, I just want you to reiterate what were some of the issues that they had, just so I can kind of, you know, re-educate myself on what what were their specific areas of concerns. I know it was a unanimous vote, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So were there were there c specific concerns that they raised that we should be thinking about right now before we, uh, as we go into the public comment and deliberation? Um, they addressed their concerns through modifications and the conditions of approval. Um, there was a recommendation for a design alteration to the large building at the corner of uh, Pacific and Laurel Street that they eliminated. They felt that the design was appropriate for that corner and um, uh, actually the design, uh, they felt, reduced the height and massing of the building. Um, there was also quite a bit of discussion on the um, a recommendation for adding active areas at the Front Street frontage. and. Um, uh, like I said, during the staff report, the only modification they made to that condition of approval was to um, require that any spaces that were not converted to commercial were made easily convertible in the future by stubbing out utilities um, and that kind of thing. At the end of their deliberations, did they feel those issues had been sufficiently addressed? Yes, yes. Then I just wanted to ask in terms of, I know, I believe I saw it in the report, but how many new units, residential units, will this project produce downtown? 205. Okay. All right, Council Member Crone. Um, the, uh, the six stories, what, what was the total height on the six stories? It's 75 feet, and then there's a mezzanine level that we don't count as a story, and that mezzanine level would go up to 85 feet. Yeah, well, sounds like seven stories. Um, this, uh, for the city attorney um, about Measure O again, uh, on page four of uh, Bill Parkin's letter, he says, because the applicant has no vested right to develop the project without imposition of inclusionary housing requirement, the city, through the city council, had no right to override the wishes of the voters in enacting Measure O. Has Measure O ever been challenged uh, in court? Or has the city ever been taken to task on this before? <clears throat> You mean has a similar project that the council uh, approved with less than 15% affordability? Has it been challenged? And, and, and gone to court, yeah. Over measure, uh, over the issue of measure O not being interpreted uh, by the I, way the, the, the voters Not to my were. knowledge. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, any other questions regarding the staff presentation? No. Okay, so then now it is the opportunity for the applicant to come forward. You have 15 minutes to speak. Um, whoever the de designated staff applicant, you'll have 15 minutes to present. And then after that, we will um, go towards uh, public comment. Um, Greetings, everyone. Greetings, Mayor Tarasas and City Council members. And first, thank you, staff. Uh, very thorough. Uh, well, well done. Uh, my name's Ruben Hellick. I'm one of the members of LHH Partners, LLC. I'm here today with Owen Lawler, Jan Hochhauser, uh, our attorney, uh, Frank Pirelli, land use attorney. Uh, of course, Owen's the L and Chan's the H, uh, the other two in LHH Partners. Uh, we're with our equity partner, DevCon Investments, LLC. We're really quite pleased to present for your approval this specific front mixed use project. You know, by the way, also Brett Sisting with DevCon Investments is also here today in the audience. Uh, we started working on the design of Pacific Front five years ago, and since then, We've been working closely with city staff to bring this vibrant new building in front of you today for your approval. 
During the past several years, I've served on the Downtown Management Corporation, which is uh, an advisory board to the City Council. And I served there with city mayors, city council members, and along with local business owners and property owners. And all of us are working collaboratively towards improving the overall downtown experience for both our residents and our visitors of Santa Cruz. Now, I'd say it's a fair statement to make that this specific front project is viewed by many as a terrific step in the right direction towards increasing the economic vitality of this community that you all love so much, as do I. With 205 apartments, we're providing desperately needed housing for the citizens of Santa Cruz. Instead of a block of old dysfunctional buildings, we're bringing revitalization to our lower Pacific Avenue area, and that's gonna greatly enhance our public health, safety, and our local economy. <coughs> In short, this really is a renaissance moment. While I have not served in a governmental role such as you, I have served on many nonprofit boards, including the local Santa Cruz Habitat for Humanity. We build homes for those who really need affordable housing, and I understand how it works. Professionally, I work as a commercial real estate agent. I am responsible for bringing many of the tenants right here into your downtown. Over the past years, we've watched the housing deficiencies in this community continue to grow. Clearly, there's one thing I hope we can all agree on, at least most of us, Santa Cruz does need more housing. And the vertical solution provided by Pacific Front makes great sense. To that end, both the City Council and the Coastal Commission approved the revised zoning ordinance for this area of Pacific Avenue. Earlier, we know that the Coastal Commission approved it unanimously. Then, last month, your Planning Commission approved this particular project unanimously. One of the wonderful benefits of this project is the affordable housing element. As you learned firsthand from Bonnie and staff, we put a lot of thought and a lot of expense into an innovative solution that secures affordable housing right next to the transit center. During the past five years since we started this, we've seen construction costs literally skyrocket. I mean, the numbers are staggering what it costs to build now. Interest rates are climbing. Lenders, who we need to build the project, are tightening their underwriting standards. Yet, in the face of all these very serious headwinds, here we are today, committed to moving forward with this project as submitted. I love this town. So do you. Why else would you serve? What's the point of serving on a city council if you don't truly deeply care for the, for the, the real quality of life in your very own community? Right. Us guys, LHH partners, we look forward to providing Santa Cruz with a really beautiful new apartment building, five years in the making. In just a few short years from now, hundreds of your citizens are gonna happily refer to this place as their new home. I now turn over the dais to Owen Lawler, and then after Owen, Jan Hockhauser. They'll present the Pacific Front Project. Thank you for your time, and happy holidays. Good morning. We plan to use 10 minutes of our time and leave five minutes for questions and rebuttals later. Thank you, Ruben. My name's Owen Lawler, and those of you who don't know me, I've lived and worked in Santa Cruz for over 40 years, raising my daughter here. She attends Westlake in the fifth grade. As, members, as a member of this community, this project is more than just about housing. This project brings a greater sense of engagement to our downtown. This is about bringing vibrancy and positive energy south of Cathcart Street. This project is about creating more, a more healthy community that we, that we are excited, and we are excited to be here today. I really want to thank Lee, Butler, Bonnie, and especially Samantha for all their hard work to get this project before you here today. And I want to thank your council for your consideration. <laughs> community engagement has included over 30 community meetings on both the downtown plan and this project. The project aligns perfectly with the downtown plan, unanimously supported, as Ruben mentioned, by the Coastal Commission and the Planning Commission. 
We're gratified by the large cross-section of community members that have turned out here today to support this project. And, and as you can see from the package, the people here today is a broad coalition of community support. We know intimately how critical the rental and affordable housing shortage is in this community. As we all know, lack of housing hurts this community to its core. From the inception of this project, we've been looking for ways to maximize both the rental housing and permanently affordable units in our downtown. With staffs as well as council's guidance, we've crafted a project that will facilitate the creation of over 100 units of affordable housing and over 200 units of rental housing in our downtown core. In closing, this project brings sorely needed workforce rental and affordable housing adjacent to transit to our downtown. This is the environmentally and socially least impactful location and consistent with community values of environmental stewardship and minimizing greenhouse gas emissions and encouraging a walkable, inviting, family-friendly downtown. The community has stated clearly that downtown is where the housing should be located. Thank you for your consideration. And Jan will continue the discussion. Yes. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, Mayor Terrazas and members of the Council. Uh, my name is Jan Hockhauser. I have been working as an architect in Santa Cruz for almost 10 years. Santa Cruz is indeed a wonderful place, and I do really appreciate the opportunity and experience to have worked at, with the city and community stakeholders in the pursuit of a quality housing and architectural project. I think it's timely, and in that regard, I, I'm very pleased to inform this council that the all affordable, 100% affordable project at 350 Ocean Street has finally and just recently received tax credit allocations from the state. That's a 63 unit all affordable project that's contributing to the crisis, the housing crisis in town. There are no uh, market rate units sprinkled amongst that project. It's 100% 63 affordable units. So I'm, I'm really pleased to report that that's now moving forward. Um, perhaps reiterating uh, what my so associates presented about the rigorous and comprehensive process that has been undertaken to bring the Pacific Front project before you today, I can, can't emphasize enough how this project is conceived not as an individual entity, but a critical piece of the downtown plan. It interfaces with future developments straddling the Maple Street Alley, as Bonnie presented, uh, and the adjacent transit hub. In cities all over the world, this is like a textbook solution for housing and commercial adjacent transit in the heart of downtowns. The proposed design is crafted in a way to be consistent with the goals and objectives of the downtown plan and bring the best of downtown to Lower Pacific. Our team, DevCon, Joni Janicki, and city staff work very hard to resolve design issues so that every frontage, Pacific, Laurel, front of this project is both functional and beautiful. <laughs> Enhancing the experience of pedestrians and bicyclists was paramount in this process. This new development proposal goes beyond the literal requirements of the downtown plan by sculpting the architecture with an array of courtyards, terraces, and patios. The community experiences inviting spatial diversity up close and from afar. The project employs three distinctive architectural styles that deliver a richness and sensitivity to the fabric of the city. In contrast with the monolithic design of the county building on Ocean Street, for example, Pacific Front is premised on a playful variety, again, both on a macro and an intimate scale. We generally all agree that entering Pacific Avenue at Water Street is a, po a positive community experience. We believe the Pacific Front Project will be a positive community attribute from so many different standpoints and contribute to the betterment of Santa Cruz now and well into the future. I'd like to say that words are sometimes not adequate, but we are indeed honored and proud to present you and the city such a finely crafted and considered project. Naturally, I am here to answer any questions you may have, and I would be delighted to share more about the specifics of the project if you so desire. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let me give pause time, please. How much time is left? Okay, so that you're reserving that time for questions and rebuttal. Um, I'd like to ask the council at this time if there's any other uh, questions they have of, this, of the uh, applicant regarding their presentation at this time. 
Council Member Crone. Yeah, I was wondering about the notion of uh, workforce rental, and, and could you go into that a little bit and talk about what that means? What is workforce rental? How is that defined, and what are the rents that, are, that will be charged? Uh, and will folks who are present from building trades be able to live in these units? First of all, it's the project, if we're successful, won't be available for at least two to two and a half years. So I can't tell you exactly what the rents will be. I can tell you. Go on, please, if, and if you could just pause for a second. We have a really long day ahead of us, and now everybody has different viewpoints on different matters. If we can just be respectful of everyone's point of view, it'll make this process a lot more manageable. Once Council Member Crone is done with Okay, the please go ahead and fin uh, complete uh, your response. Uh. I do know that there's a number of competing projects coming on, coming online. Um, we are taking the risk that whatever the rent is, that this project will still work, and that's what I can tell you. So we don't have, a, I mean, folks who are present here, we're talking 3,500 for a two bedroom, maybe by that time 4,500 and maybe the market goes south. Um, but if they continue to go up as we've seen in the last four years, you know, rental, rents rising 40 plus percent, um, the rents could be as high as 4,500 for a one bedroom. So no, I don't think that's possible. And I, I also say that people now are paying $1,500 a month for one room in a 100-year-old house on the west side of Santa Cruz. And many of those people could pay less and live in this project with a, with a roommate. Do you, do you want people, three and four people living in, in, in units uh, that are built for one, you know, one bedroom? Let me, let me just say, just for the purpose of our discussion, this is an opportunity for questions. And so, I mean, I'll just, I know it was more rhetorical, but I think that one of the things is we do have, um, you know, a housing crisis is add more units. And so having more supply, I think the, the answer would be it provides uh, oh, more. Oh, the units. price is going to come down, you think? I, um, I, no, another, I didn't say that. I said I, that I they'll have, have more units. For uh, <laughs> Mr. Hellig, um, a real estate question. Sure. Um, you said you're responsible for bringing in many tenants. And w what I hear from folks who approach me, it's say when they're driving over to San Jose, they hear units advertised in Santa Cruz over there. I'm just wondering, how much is this going to solve the housing crisis that exists for Santa Cruzans right now and not, not like Google or Apple or Amazon? It's a housing question, a supply and demand question. Uh, when housing is built, people rent it, and those rental applications come from a variety of areas. Who will be renting this project? My personal opinion is it'll be lateral moves for people like Owen mentioned. We all know a lot of people in town here that are just aching to have a decent place to live but can't find it. We'll have it for them. By the way, uh, now that we brought up the subject in terms of housing, our equity partner's out in Milpitas. And when we drive to uh, DevCon uh, Construction, main headquarters, we go down Montague Expressway. When we started, there was no housing on Montague Expressway when we got off at 680, excuse me, 880 to head out to their office. Uh, yesterday I took a visit, passed about 5,000 units and a giant BART station. My point, uh, people have places to live here they have places to live there. The population continues to grow. The U.S. Census Bureau says the United States of America will have over 440 million citizens by 2060. Your question is esoteric, and frankly, uh, we hope to find a really great mix in our property of young professionals, students, retirees of, of our age that have been able to come and live in Santa Cruz and enjoy this great lifestyle. Yes, perhaps we'll have some tech workers. I leased uh, 40,000 feet to Amazon downtown at the Cooper House, and I've heard that they have a hard time finding proper hires, and part of that problem is housing. You all know very well how hard it is to hire people. Housing is an issue even for your own city staff. So let's get real here. It's housing. It's 205 units. We're thousands of bedrooms short. What's the point? We're going to build housing. It's very simple. But you don't deny that you do participate in advertising units here in Santa Cruz over the hill for people to come and live here. 
Yeah, there, those, house, those units are leasing up very quickly and I'd ask you to talk directly with the property manager as to what the mix is of those particular units, who's coming to rent them. My guess is it's gonna be people from town. And do you have a definition of workforce housing? The definition of workforce housing, I'll defer to staff who understands all of the technical issues revolving around workforce housing, income ratios, et cetera. Is workforce housing equivalent to affordable housing? What's the difference between those two terms? Like, and then there's affordable by design, another term that's thrown around a lot. Uh, Carol Berg, Economic Development. Uh, workforce housing doesn't have one dedication as does affordable housing. Affordable housing is, can be many different percentages. It means it's affordable to a certain income group. Generally speaking, if you're talking about workforce housing, the general thought is it ranges from 80% of area median income to 120% of area median income. But again, there's no set definition. Both of those ends could strut, stretch. If you're talking about affordable housing, it depends on the types of housing you're talking about. Our inclusionary ordinance, for example, sets everything at 80% of area median income. So we're on kind of that edge of workforce housing for our uh, inclusionary units. But just to be clear, um, the Housing Urban Development in Washington, D.C., a federal uh, agency, they define what um, affordable housing is, right? So we, we live within those guidelines? HUD sets the guidelines for their programs at being 80% or below, and that's just for like the home program, but there are other guidelines, uh, and that's just for rental housing. If you're talking about ownership housing, it, it increases up to 120%, but since this is a rental project, just referring to rental. So my point also is um, workforce housing, that term, is not defined kind of like natural environment. Um, it has no formal definition that anybody's holding anybody to standards as far as, you know, housing between um, $1,200 to $2,000 a unit or 50% uh, of the median income to 120% of the median. There's no no restrictions there. We don't, we check up on units, on affordable units, uh, I understand when people have signed those kind of covenants with the city that they're gonna keep units affordable. Workforce housing units has, th that, that rises and falls with the market. It, workforce housing units um, per se aren't necessarily rent restricted. Okay. Um, you could do a program for workforce housing where you rent restricted them, but in this instance, workforce housing is not rent restricted, but it, if you're thinking about the definition of it, you have to be reasonable. In other words, you're not saying, oh, I'm building workforce housing and saying I'm building for those people that are at 200 or 300 percent uh, of area median income. So I, I think there's a reasonableness factor. There's kind of a generally accepted range that could be pushed a little, but it wouldn't extend all the way to like 200 percent or 300 percent. But you can't say that, but it's, there's nobody enforcing that. Um, what about affordable by design? Affordable by design is again another term that is used to talk about units that usually rent at a lower rate. Um, they, affordable by design usually refers to uh, the size of the unit and the amenities in the unit and that kind of thing that just makes it a little less expensive. The bare cost of being building the unit or the whole complex is less than say a luxury complex would be. So the units are then considered affordable by design because they're more affordable than um, a regular sized unit would be. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Well, as, as much as I would love to debate the, um, the state of, you know, urban land markets and, and um, the laws of supply and demand, I don't believe this is really the venue to do that. Um, but I do have, uh, you know, a follow-up question related to prospective rents because, I mean, I think at the end of the day, what we know is, I mean, we live in a market society, the rents are going to be what people will pay, prospective tenants will pay. 
However, given that uh, the applicant is asking us to make a determination of financial hardship for a reduced inclusionary housing percentage, I can't, I mean, I have to think that some thought has gone into what uh, anticipated rents might be. And so I would like to hear more about that aside from whatever the market will bear. Okay, I hear that. And while you're, are you gonna, that was a, que uh, a question on the floor. Could I add one thing to that that I, I should have mentioned earlier related to that before the, the applicant addresses the question, but uh, one of the opportunities through the land dedication for the city is that we, for the Pacific Station, our affordable housing, proposed affordable housing project, is that our recommendation to council will be for us to develop the units, the affordable units, um, at affordability levels that are based on our arena, our regional housing needs allocation numbers. And so we're going to be be able to do something that typically even some affordable housing developers wouldn't be able to do, and that we're going to look at what our needs are for the remaining you know, five years of our RENA um, allocation and create those extremely low, very low units in a project. We're going to be able to subsidize that. We're going to be able to prioritize that based on um, future council's direction to do so, but that will be our recommendation. So because um, this is a city supported um, um, project will be able to more accurately meet the needs of the community on deeper affordability levels than most even affordable housing developers will be able to do. Uh, does that answer your question? No, I'm just gonna turn it over to Council Member Noroyan who had a question. Uh, no, I'll pass. Okay, I, um, I don't see any other questions I want before we go to, pu to public comment and the first speaker that we'll have is um, Kate Roberts, Roberts who contacted me in advance from Monterey Economic Partnerships but before you speak I wanted to ask uh, the, the planning director there was a question about the downtown EIR and if you could just kind of again refresh you mentioned that that came before council in November 2017 is there anything else you want to provide uh, in response to council member Brown's comments? Um, I can just uh, sort of generally provide uh, some information and if you've got any specific questions, happy to uh, address those either myself or with the team. Okay. Um, so a few things, um, the, the CEQA analysis relied primarily on the downtown plan EIR. Um, it also uh, tiered from the general plan EIR. The downtown plan EIR um, was also looking at the, the general, the, overall general plan EIR, so those two work together. And there is a uh, public resources code section, it's 21083.3, and that essentially says that if a project has been analyzed under either a general plan EIR or a specific plan EIR, then um, as long as there aren't any site-specific analyses that would warrant additional study, then that prior uh, certified environmental impact report or negative declaration, whatever it may be, um, can be reused for the new project. And so there were a series of analyses that uh, our CEQA uh, consultant prepared um, and uh, was reviewed by staff. So um, traffic and transportation, um, the historic analysis. Um, to clarify, is that what's in this document I've yet to be able to read? Yes, so uh, that document goes through and, and does identify some of that information. The, the studies themselves, um, I believe those are separate. Um, the, the findings are referenced in that report. Um, and so, are those publicly available? The reports? They're all public they information, public, yes. Yeah. Where would we access them? Uh, Samantha can answer any questions that you have related to that. Um, and that, I, I will say uh, that I did just learn that uh, the council uh, received that checklist that you're referring to last night. Um, it, it is available under the Planning Commission's webpage as well, so it's been publicly available there um, with respect to um, the council. It was identified as an attachment to the Planning Commission staff report, and it was available on the Planning Commission website, but uh, apologies for having just realized that it was uh, forwarded to the council uh, yesterday evening. 
Um, so, so there were a whole series of analyses that were conducted, the historic analysis, the trees with the arborist uh, report, the air quality and archeology span and so forth. And so um, while we were confident that the downtown plan EIR and the general plan have um, mitigation measures to address those and have thoroughly analyzed those, um, all those impacts, we did uh, conservatively take the approach of doing uh, new analysis on those and um, for example in the planning commission staff report it identifies the number of trips that were um, anticipated from this project and it identifies that that trip count was adequately evaluated and anticipated as part of the downtown plan EIR so there there are those linkages in the materials that uh, the council has seen and um, also that the planning commission reviewed in advance of their decision but happy to answer any other questions that you may have any other questions regarding that? Council Member Crone. Yeah, the, uh, in a letter the Sierra Club wrote us, this project does not meet the requirements for an exemption to CEQA. Is that, do you think perhaps because they hadn't seen this document that Council Member Brown was holding up? That document was available for their viewing. I don't know the date of that uh, letter, but that document was prepared um, in advance of the Planning Commission meeting, provided to the Planning Commission. And um, that CEQA exemption, I will say the um, statutory exemption is just one of a three pronged approach um, that we're taking with this project, the downtown EIR. It's relying on the downtown EIR and the general plan EIR in conjunction with that exemption in order to have the project qualify for that CEQA review. Okay, so great. So we have uh, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Butler. Um, I'm now at this point in the, the hearing, I'm going to um, open it up to public comment. Um, Monterey Bay, Bay Economic uh, Partnership, uh, Kate Roberts um, asked for some additional time. First, before she speaks, how many people would like to speak to this item that are here present? Can I get some show of hands? So we're gonna abbreviate the-, the, uh, the t t like 20, 20, 20, okay. I see 11, which means 20, because okay. then All right. a bunch so, more people- Kate, you'll, you'll have two minutes, okay? Can I request an additional time? Yeah, and um, no, I just, uh, um, if you could come speak to the clerk, because I sent you an email in response, and hopefully you saw that. Yeah. She doesn't represent One anybody. minute, yeah. Oh my God. Please Good go afternoon, ahead. my name is Kate Roberts, president of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. I just wanted to thank you all for your thorough um, research on this. It's a really important project for downtown, obviously. Uh, it is in alignment with our housing initiative and our program criteria, mixed use, utilizing vertical space effect effectively, maximizing existing infrastructure, near jobs and services, and as staff mentioned, it helps get the city closer to its arena goals. So we're pretty excited about the project. We've done a lot of work to um, get communicate to people about the importance of this project in hopes that it does get uh, voted through. It's in line with the downtown plan, um, and it will enhance the downtown given what's currently there. So um, it seems like it's all good from that perspective. And I think the creativity that's involved here by contributing key parcels of the land to the city that are adjacent to the site in order to assist with the land assemblage that the city is undertaking for an affordable mixed use project will actually allow for more units, affordable units, um, and that is also something that as, as EMBA being um, our triple bottom line and really focusing on equity too is really important to us. Um, this is an example, as I said, of innovative uh, solutions between public and private sectors to create more housing for different income levels. We hope it serves as a template for other high density housing opportunities and these creative solutions that create more housing and provide economic development is something we really want to support more of. So thank you again for your thoughtful consideration. And I just want to give a quick shout out to the Carpenters Union who came here on their own time using their break and lunch to support this project. So good job, guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, um, those of you that are lined up to my left are in line to speak. Elise, um, if you want to go first, you did send me in advance an email. You, I mean, you're speaking out individually, but if you wanted to come up, and speak, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna go one minute based on the number of the number of people that are here today and the amount of proceedings. So please go ahead. Yes.
Point of My order, name Mayor. is Elise uh, Casby. Point of order, Mayor. Um, I'm going to make a motion that that uh, speakers get two minutes, two minutes each. This is a significant project. This is really important, okay. and th this is in the middle of the day. So many of these people have yeah. come out here today to speak, and if it was at night, we'd have you know maybe a little more time. We'd have a lot, even more people. Okay. So, is there a second to that motion? Would the maker of the motion be willing to go to a minute and a half? Sure. A second. Okay. So all those in favor of um, allowing uh, 90 seconds for public comment per person, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. That motion passed unanimously, so you'll have 90 seconds. We'll reset the clock. Thank you. I've got to change it. Thank you again, everyone, for your patience. Okay, you're on. Actually, it's not correct. Oh, it's. Have, go ahead. I have another question. Okay, I need it reset then at the start. Please, a full minute. Yeah, reset, please. So it's going to say a minute, but I can go an extra 30 seconds. Excuse me. Okay, could I please have my full minute? I'm trying to get straight on the time, please. To be clear, I had to reset another button for 30 seconds, so you will have a minute and 30 seconds to speak. Okay. In 90 seconds and... Okay, thank you. My name is Elise Casby. I'm a community organizer, and I live in the area where the Lawler Project is going to be built. I've been canvassing businesses and residents in the area. The overall project is being rushed through. This is a very politically maneuvered project. We're getting a snow job, sales job, and unfortunately, it's very deceptive, highly deceptive, in the most basic language. For example, the head shop does not intend to sell to the, to the city. Uh, Romo of Calderon Tires barely knows about this project, and I hope you're not just gonna counter what I'm saying. There is zero affordable housing being provided. There's probably gonna be a lawsuit about this, but it's not going to go to workers in the city. Um, so what's happening here is sad. I wanna say that when I went to get the 41-page report the other day from the Planning Commission, a developer, I'm not sure who, I really don't know, was bellowing, actually bellowing to some of the city workers in the room uh, where they were meeting, which is right next to the desk where I got the report. I've given $800 to an affordable housing fund. And the city worker was saying, we're gonna play by the rules, we're gonna play by the rules. This. This sales job, snow job, is full of bureaucraties. It's extremely hard to follow for the city council members. The public can't follow this. It hasn't been vetted sufficiently by the public. It's bad deal, bad faith. If these parcels get sold, where's the bus company gonna be? And I really think that it's atrocious that you've had the final hearing for this project with all, these, all this information and all this detail that you rush this through before the outgoing council goes out. It's it's political, it's a bad deal in bad faith. The emperor is wearing no clothes. Thank you, this is a Thank you, crying ne shame. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. It's disgusting. Next speaker. I'm disgusted. The oh, workers well. here should Robert, not support Thank you. Pride. Next speaker, please. I'm not gonna shut up until I get out the door because this is an outrage. Okay, you can this wait. This is please a moral come. outrage. Okay, Everyone you have a warning. Thank you, Elise. No, no, Thank no, you. No, 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 Live. Point of order, thank you, Sergeant at Arms. Behavior. If you can help. Awesome. Thank Great you. Behavior. Please begin. Hi. My name is Massimo de Gaudenzi. I am the Public Relations and Community Relations Director for the Santa Cruz Warriors. I want to express that a positive vote for this mixed use and housing development is a positive vote for what I do, which is my responsibility, which is building a connection between our players, our coaching staff, and our front office staff with the children, citizens, and community in our neighborhood here in Santa Cruz County. Um, that starts with connecting where our, we play, which is 140 Front Street, up to our front office, which is at 903 Pacific Avenue. Um, making that a better foot traffic area with residential and community space will allow us to walk around Pacific to go to the Boys and Girls Club downtown chapter, will allow us to walk up Front Street to uh, serve produce to citizens with food, not bombs. And in turn, it will allow us to use Kaiser Permanente Arena as more of an event space for community organizations so that families, schools, and after school programs will allow us to use that space um, in those property manners. 
Um, real quick, just because it's front of my mind, last Wednesday, um, biggest game of the season, I was walking with a fan interested in purchasing tickets for uh, that game on Wednesday the 5th. Um, we turned the corner and found a man bleeding profusely out of his mouth and face because just seconds before we turned the corner, um, someone hit him with the face and took his phone um, with his skateboard and took off. Um, I feel that that happened at Pacific and Laurel Street. That would not have happened with the amount of foot traffic that would have gone on with this project. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Uh, Pete Kennedy, Planning Commissioner. You've read my report, heard my recommendation. This is a great project. I urge you to vote it through. Um, it's hard to hear allegations of last minute when you've been through all the meetings and all the work that has gone into this. Um, I want to acknowledge this is a big building for Santa Cruz. And uh, we quibble about 10 grand here, 20 grand there. This is 200 apartments. Let's build them. Um, an architect said when I was up there and he was over here, um, you have a choice today. You can vote yes on housing or no on housing. And I urge you to vote yes on housing. Thanks. Thank you, Pete. And again, like Pete's example, you don't need to use a full amount of time. Just come right up and speak your piece. Thank you. Next speaker. I'm Sean Hebard, Carpenters Local 505. Um, everyone on this council campaigned on affordable housing and their successors campaigned on affordable housing. And we all believe that this is something that, that needs to be addressed immediately in this community. Everyone has ideas and they're all different. The only consensus that we have is that we need something that is multifaceted and addresses all the different elements of the affordability crisis. <clears throat> Excuse me. My interest in this is not academic. I didn't learn about poverty in college. And I'm here representing a room full of union carpenters that believe in this project and the jobs that it'll create. I, with all due respect to Councilmember Crone, I think his argument about our members' expectation of living in these units is specious. We built the Apple campus. Ain't nobody working there, right? So <clears throat> we're talking about real jobs in this community. We're talking about pathways with apprenticeships and living wages, retirement benefits, and health benefits for these members and their families. When we talk uh, academically about putting this unit here and that unit there, we think about them like little monopoly pieces, like we just grab them and stick them there. The building of these units is how these members feed their families. And I know it's not the same when you get to build affordable housing, you got 30 units, 30 plus units that could come from this project. <clears throat> and I know it's not the same if you don't get to stick it to the man and get those units out of him, but the people you're really sticking it to are the people in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mayor. Thank you, council members. Um, my name is Jack Williams. I'm a member of Local 505. I'm also an apprentice carpenter. Um, I just want to say I'm in support of this, this project. You know, I live in Santa Cruz County, and I've lived here my whole life. Um, finding work in Santa Cruz County for what I do is very difficult. This project... Um, not only for the apprenticeship, the jobs that are gonna be generated from this project are gonna be immense. And the apprenticeship has, has been able to give me and my two children, you know, the opportunity to uh, put them you know, give them all the medical benefits that they need. My daughter needs massive amounts of medical benefits and, and this apprenticeship and this, and this union has been able to provide that for me. You know, I've been able to, to come from a place of poverty you know, in my life, where I did grow up in Section 8 housing. Like, I, I completely understand the importance of that, but the reality is, this is jobs for our people. This is jobs for me to support my children. I don't have to drive to San Francisco every single day, come back, see my daughter for like 30 minutes, you know, because I'm stuck in traffic for four and a half hours. Like, these are jobs here in the city that I grew up in, in the city that I love. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. The development you are considering before you would contribute land and cash equal to building 5.5% affordable units. If you don't understand that, please ask your staff to give you a number, not a whole outrageous circular thing about what else is going to happen. The number is 5.5%. The fact that it will help build housing next door is great, whatever, but the contribution that this developer is proposing is 5.5%. It is not 15%. The city is wagging the tail of capitalism when you should be setting the rules. You had a consultant decide how much the developer could afford instead of setting a rule that says this is how much you will provide in affordable housing. When I built something on my property, I follow the rules. But if it's a big developer, then you decide, well, I had to follow the rules because you busted me, right? But if it's a big developer, then you say, how much could you afford? You're coming and begging for some amount of affordable housing when you should be setting the rules. 
What the staff are proposing is some kind of well-meaning collusion with capitalism. It's like the Hillary Clinton form of government. But in a few hours, we'll have a new council with a majority of its members committed to reforming capitalism and endorsed by Santa Cruz for Bernie. If the current council doesn't have the resolve to enforce its own standards on the largest development proposed in the next 30 years, then the new council should reconsider that that decision. Market rate housing is failing our city, which is why the citizens demand at least 15% affordable housing. You have no right to unravel that. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. Um, I'm Danielle Wilcox, and I've been a resident of Santa Cruz for about 12 years with no plans to make uh, anywhere else my home soon. As someone who works downtown, I appreciate the efforts to help grow, develop businesses, and to make the streets safer and cleaner. Our limited access to restaurants and stores has made it challenging to support the local scene, but it's clear that the downtown plan will continue to make this easier. One of my biggest pain points as a resident is how difficult it has been to find viable and affordable housing with respectable landlords. Having a mixed use housing project that also supplies parking to its residents would create more opportunities for individuals like me to be housed. This housing project will also encourage continued downtown growth, stimulate the economy, and create further motivation to keep our streets safe and clean, especially this area of Pacific. I know I look forward to this project moving forward and enjoying the amenities it will create and seeing the added benefits of its execution. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Bless you. Hi again, I'm Stacy Nagel. I head up workplaces and real estate at Looker, and I spoke last year in support of the new downtown plan that allowed this project. So I'm super excited here. Uh, Looker just hired their 300th employee in Santa Cruz. We just opened an 18,000 square foot floor in Santa Cruz. We are hoping to stay in Santa Cruz, but Santa Cruz has to provide what our employees need. And if you think our board and our VCs aren't pressuring us to leave, then you're wrong. It's a fight. So we need you guys to provide what we need. Housing, housing, housing. The people we're hiring have a conscious choice that they do not want cars. They do not want to get to work in a car. They live very differently from the way we were grown up. So having the ability to walk to work, to bike to work, having downtown housing is huge. They're college educated. Many of them have families and still don't have cars. We have people coming here from our other offices in New York, San Francisco. They would love to relocate to headquarters, but they need that walkable life. So we need to provide that for them. We're also having trouble with, we're outgrowing our downtown downtown hotel options, we're filling up the paradox, nothing else is walkable downtown, we need more hotels that provide walkable options. Let's create a downtown where people when they get here don't have to use their cars again, right? Also, as Looker employees, we are a group of residents who want downtown more usable and comfortable, and we're sick of telling people to stay away from the dodgy end of Pacific. I wanna stop telling people that. It's embarrassing, and I want us to be better. So please approve this, thank you. Thank you, next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Robert Singleton. I'm also a Planning Commissioner, uh, voted in support of this project. Um, I just wanna to speak to a couple of key concepts. In terms of uh, this being rushed in any way, this project has, through incarnations of the downtown plan and through years and years of planning and public outreach, we've had over 30 community hearings about this. We've at the Planning Commission, we personally went on the downtown plan, I think three separate times. Um, so this isn't new, this isn't coming out of the woodwork. This is actually the project that we've all had in mind when going through those hearings. This is exactly what we were looking for and here it is before us. Um, so we have a, a huge opportunity here and you'll see a countless number of, of business owners, of, of local employees, of nonprofit housing developers. I mean, these are there's like a huge consensus around getting this done. And the contributions to affordable housing of building transit-oriented housing right next door that could be 100% affordable go far beyond what you would get by mixed mixed in uh, uh uh, inclusionary units. I mean, you're gonna get more bang for your buck. It's gonna be done efficiently, and we've been waiting for this to happen. It's time to pull the trigger and move forward. Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, my name is John McKelvey. Um, I think it's an exciting opportunity uh, that this project represents. I think the staff and the applicant have done a really amazing job putting together uh, a, a very comprehensive proposal. I believe that this is not a subtractive proposal. It's an additive proposal to downtown. Uh, it's gonna generate significant act economic activity in addition to the housing that's provided. I also believe that all housing improves affordability, all additional housing improves affordability, not just uh, 
low and very low income, but this project with the land allocations and the, the possible uh, project that the city is proposing will give, will end up having uh, more widespread and deeper affordability than it would otherwise have just with a simple inclusionary requirement. I believe this project is a down payment on writing the housing ship that we have foundered uh, on for 40 years. I really encourage you to support it and um, let's have more like it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Evan Sirocchi. Uh, speaking on behalf of Santa Cruz Unibu, we're in support of the project. And uh, a lot of people have talked about, you know, the main uh, things that make this a great project. You know, it's looking at as a whole with the deal with, you know, building the affordable next door. It's really more like 30% for, uh, affordable. Uh, it's right next to a transit center. Uh, and then uh, one other, other thing I'd like to add is kind of the environmental argument of, you know, it's a trade-off of, you know, if we don't build downtown, then where else are people going to live? Or does this mean people are commuting and, you know, clogging up Highway 1 on when they commute from Salinas or something? So, uh, yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Robert, uh, Hello, do you want to... Excuse me, hold one second. Yep. Mr. Norse, were you in line to speak? Uh, not yet. Okay. Okay, so... Let's uh, go ahead. My name is Zachary Buck. I've lived at the corner of Laurel Pacific for over 10 years, and I love this part of Santa Cruz. It is beautiful. South of Cathcart, all these south, I don't understand. It's my favorite part of town. I love how it is, and the idea that anyone could enhance it, like uh, developers, real estate gentlemen could uh, enhance that. It's like talking about enhancing the uh, woman I've spent uh, 12 years with. It can't be enhanced. It's perfect. Um, it's part of the community. And uh, my, my father worked construction. He drove me by his projects. He's proud of the work he's done. And I'm proud of my father for doing that. But my dad cannot live in these houses. They're not affordable. And uh, this is not the world that I grew up in. I live on Laurel Pacific because that is my home. I love how it is. Uh, I would love more development in this community that built the community that was planned to be a, a, a beautiful aesthetic uh, thing that could be loved and cherished. This, it, this looks like um, anywhere else in the country that has venture capital behind it, uh, which is fine, I guess. So um, I don't want uh, the calculations for the f affordable house being to be the future. I think they should be now. It's speculative. We don't know what's gonna happen to the global economy. And you don't know if you'll be able to afford to build these or if any developer will. Every, you know, you're flush with cash right now, but things can change. So um, thank you for letting me ramble on. Um, thank you. And come visit south of uh, whatever. It's it's really beautiful and nice. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And, and before you speak, you know, Mr. Norris, people are speaking, and when you get into conversation, it gets distracting. So, so if you could, thanks. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Zachary Davis, um, business owner downtown. I've been on the downtown commission for six years. I think I first went to a visioning for this project or some early incarnation of this project maybe four years ago, so I've been following it for a little while. Um, I basically have a, a fear and a hope. My fear is that we'll look at this project in isolation, we'll say we can't make it perfect, but we're gonna try, we'll saddle the developer with all kinds of rules, um, requirements, and they'll say, can't be done, and walk away. And we'll throw up our hands, we'll say, we tried, we failed, and nothing will change. The housing crisis will continue. My hope, is that we'll look at this in the greater context as a piece of building a downtown community that is increasingly a place where we want to spend time, where we want to start businesses, where we want to bring our families, um, where there's housing for all types of people. And I see this as a piece of that puzzle, an important piece, um, but I encourage you not to stop there. I came to the uh, the library discussion the last time that was brought up, and one of the council members said, I see that there's a, a housing component in this, but I just don't believe that's going to happen. You are the elected leaders. You say, we're gonna do this project and, and then you make all of the things happen. And I really ask you to seriously accept that commitment, do this project, do the affordable housing, and don't stop there, keep going. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker, please. Uh, good afternoon, council, I'm Chip, I work downtown. Um, I wanna speak in support of this, this project. I think it does uh, quite a bit to increase the walkability of downtown. Obviously, housing is huge. Uh, approving this project will approve a number of market housing as well as affordable housing. 
uh, and not approving this project, 15% of nothing is a Taco Bell drive through So I encourage you to support this for all of the reasons you'll hear about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mayor, council member, uh, members, my name is Matt Huerta. I'm the housing program manager with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, here to support the project. I want to hit on a couple key pieces. Um, thank you all for your leadership. This is an amazing opportunity, a major project that has been very thoughtfully put together. Um, and, uh, you know, I've lived in affordable housing. I've been doing affordable housing development for nearly 20 years. It's hard. I wish that we can, I have had a wand and, and could have this be 100% affordable. But guess what, until we have a national discussion on affordable housing and actually invest in affordable housing at 100%, the same way we need to with healthcare and other major things that we need for our shared community, we're just not gonna get there. It takes this kind of layered conversation, this kind of very intense way of doing development in order to squeeze out the kind of public benefit that we need. So unfortunately, Councilmember Crone and others that have these concerns about affordability, this is how it gets done. The state needs to do its part, our local and regional governments need to do their part, and this is what is necessary, unfortunately. So I'm really pleased, though, that the affordable piece here is gonna be honored by the land dedication and potentially the in lieu fee piece and can at least match or maybe even exceed that 15% requirement that the, the local folks here want to see in this development. So I urge you to move forward with this project. It's uh, a major step forward in meeting your affordable housing needs here regionally. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Jamili Cannon. I'm uh, in the design and construction industry. I have a business downtown, um, and I'm also a renter in Santa Cruz. And this is a hugely pivotal project in helping create more housing in our town. There are not very many lots like this left, so um, I agree with a lot of the statements that have already been said. I don't wanna repeat them. I just wanna encourage everyone to um, approve this project and uh, create some much needed housing in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Barbara Riverwoman Child. Um, there was a great philosopher, thinker called Henry George. He said that the land belongs to all people. It doesn't belong to anybody, any individual for private profit. So, um, and this, this development will draw the value not only of the downtown land, which is prime land, but it will also draw on the value of the beautiful river. So I have an alternative proposal that I would like to see you pass tonight. Um, uh, I approve, we approve the staff recommendation to develop Pacific Front um, development with the understanding that the property will revert to public ownership by the year 2080 or as soon as the developer has recovered its costs and made a 6% profit over that amount. I hope you pass that instead of the present pr proposal. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Josie Buchanan and I work downtown in Renton, the city of Santa Cruz. When I graduated from UC Santa Cruz a little over a year ago, every one of my peers, with rare exception, was forced to leave the area. I heard the same sentiment from all my classmates, that though they loved this town and they did not believe, oh, that though they loved this town, they did not believe there would be, ever be an opportunity for them to live here or find jobs here, jobs that would benefit the city. Many members of the community complain that UCSC students are only temporary residents. When they, what they don't realize is that we are almost forced to be. Let's make a town where young, educated people living and working in Santa Cruz is no longer the exception. I urge you to vote for housing and for future generations of Santa Cruz residents. Santa Cruz needs more housing. Creating housing where people work is an important step to creating a better future now and for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, I'm Ron Pomerantz. I find the planning department staff's been working really hard and I'm shocked, shocked at the outcome. You, the council, have allowed for a huge swath of the downtown to be rezoned for higher densities and height in order to allow developers more profitability to assure affordable housing would be built. In my view, your planning department's cut a sweetheart deal with DEVCON Lawler to make sure not one affordable unit is included in the project and important public benefits have been minimized. 
taxpayers paid for a study that concluded a paltry 5.5% inclusionary apartments would be financially viable. No other studies, no second opinions, no updates, even though the real estate market's blown through the roof. DEFCON and Lawler have no contractual responsibility to make sure any of the affordable housing gets built. Staff, staff works for you and the community in order to provide community benefits for the great majority of residents. Not the case here. Staff is not to be a shill for developers. <clears throat> Did staff agree to a non-disclosure statement with a developer? Open up the developer's books to see how accurate the financial projections have been. <clears throat> Why has the project been so clearly fast-tracked? Is the urgency different because you're worried about the new council? Are we Santa Cruz or are we Wisconsin? This project is a litmus test for giving developers incentives to provide affordable housing and providing public benefits. Work for those or your legacy will be an embarrassment. I strongly encourage you not to approve of the project today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. I do not agree that we have a housing crisis. I instead believe that we have an affordable housing crisis. Um, that was the conclusion of the state and what people in the city are seeing. And on the listening tour, that was a resounding plea from the community. So why are we considering a project that could provide 15% which would be over 30 units, why are we considering approving it? Even if you required the developer to produce 15%, it would mean that 85% would not be affordable. You know, we are the most unaffordable city in the United States. 60% of our residents are renters. But most of our renters need affordable housing, not market rate, which will gentrify and displace the current residents. As a union member, I support workers, and I want you to have jobs. But believe me, you would still have a job if this project were changed. Land dedication is a tricky business. There's no guarantee that that affordable housing would ever be is that it? That is That's it. That's it, okay. Thank you. Would ever be built. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before the next speaker comes up, are there any other members of the public that wish to speak that are already standing to the left? Any other members of the public that haven't spoken that wish to, please line up now. Okay, next speaker, please. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alexia and I'm here on behalf of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership to express my support for this important housing development. Um, I'm also a student at UCSC and in addition to experiencing the effects of the housing crisis firsthand, the past few months I've been working with the university to support Student Housing West, which is an on-campus housing development that would provide over 1,000 units of housing to students. And the reason I bring this up is because Pacific Laurel has the potential to create more student housing opportunities by increasing housing stock and and thereby relieving existing housing stock. Our community urgently needs more student housing. Additionally, the contribution of three key land parcels has the potential of creating another 100 units of totally affordable housing. This is an excellent opportunity for the city to do its share when it comes to housing, and I urge you to support this development. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Rafael Hernandez. I'm also with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership Housing Program. Um, quick points, you've received uh, communications through our Action Center from various uh, businesses, affordable housing developers, the uh, Santa Cruz Area Chamber, also representing 600 plus members, wrote to you. Um, the point about the downtown plan, the advocacy around that set the criteria that this development is in alignment with. There was a comment about setting the rules, that you set the rules, and the thing about the rules that have been in place haven't helped uh, alleviate the situation that we're in. So the way this project is proposing to uh, provide for inclusionary housing is an innovation that could set a template, a precedent for others to follow. 
And one point I wanna make in closing about the environmental point, a Eurocentric view of looking at things environmentally limits uh, actually the way things can be done. An indigenous view of environmentally conscious uh, lens applied would say that people are also part of the environment. So we can't disregard folks in being an environmentalist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mayor Terrazas, council members, my name is Gillian Greenside, and I'm here speaking for the Sierra Club. You received our letter last week. I'd like to read the main points from it. Uh, the Sierra Club has reviewed the environmental checklist for determination of CEQA exemption and concludes that a CEQA exemption for this project is inappropriate. This project should not be considered exempt from CEQA analysis because its environmental impacts were not fully considered under the program EIR for the downtown plan amendments or under the general plan EIR. An initial study must be completed to assess the environmental impacts and risks of this project, followed by a negative deck or EIR. As listed on page three of the proposed project requires a number of design and development variances from the downtown plan amendments. These variances need environmental review. The claim that th this project is exempt because the other documents were done uh, is uh, inappropriate because the city acknowledges that vulnerability study indicates there are significant flood risks. I'm running out of time. Uh, you have the letter. I would like to add uh, also that there's a lot of glass in this project and I've heard nothing about bird safe design as a condition of approval for this project. I would ask that you uh, look at that carefully in your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Kim Dowling. Um, I don't uh, understand a lot of what's been said here today and I can't really address it, therefore. Uh, I come from more of a heart place. Um, but one thing that was said that I don't understand is if a developer knows how much money they're going to be investing in this, uh, why can they not say how much the rent is going to be? Now, I, I guess that that's because they don't know what the market value will be, but they know what they've invested and they know what they can afford. Maybe they can get more in the future because the market value has gone up, but that doesn't mean that they should get more and they should be able to tell us how much the rent's going to be. And I have a feeling if we found out how much the rent was gonna be, we'd all be like going, well, that's not, you know, what, uh, so what somebody said about 80% uh, won't be able to afford it, even the affordable housing. <laughs> that's not affordable housing. Um, and then I wanna read what somebody else started because I thought what she said was really good. I wanted to continue it. She said, maybe the affordable housing should be the first consideration and perhaps a more modest project is more appropriate rather than building luxury housing and having to live up to the amount of money that they've spent to build this luxury housing. Maybe we should be building something that therefore we could afford the affordable housing for. Um, this is a terrible precedent for Santa Cruz. Do not approve it. It's a black eye to those who truly need housing and a disgrace to those who care about working middle and low class wage earners. Thank you. Next speaker, Mr. Norse, are you ready? Hey, Mr. Norse. Hey, Mr. Norse, are you up? Go. Members of the community and city council, uh, Huff Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom voted against this project. Aside from the, the luxury business, the rent ambiguities, the failure to provide housing for people who need it and to stop those who are being driven away from town, um, the arguments advanced today uh, have been uh, some of them persuasive to me, the sweetheart deal. Uh, I, I, I spoke with one individual who said that we couldn't be assured there'd be SROs in it. There might be, there might not. It's a massive gentrification effort and it's being done on the eve of the new council. This point has been brought up before. I've heard uh, arguments from some council members, gee, Measure M got defeated. Let's follow the will of the voters. Well, how about the will of the voters to allow the new council to make this decision? I think that's what's important here. 
uh, dodgy end of Pacific, different kinds of attempts to gentrify this whole scene, and it's being presented as that. Let's get rid of the undesirable element. Uh, that could be poor people, low-income people throughout the city and will be because of the fact that you're investing money and you're allowing developers to seize a large part of the downtown as part of what looks like a continuing kind of project elsewhere in the downtown. This was rushed onto a council agenda, packed into the longest agenda I've seen in years other than the budget agendas. So don't do it, give it time, be fair to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norse. Next speaker. Uh, before you begin, sir, and, and the jean jacket, are you going to speak on this item? Sir, are you going to speak on this item? No. Okay, you'll be our last speaker. Good afternoon. I attended the community meeting at Cruz I.O. and the Planning Commission meeting, and I appreciated that all the documentation was on the city website prior to the Planning Commission, so I, as a member of the public could access it. Um, I do support your professional planning staff and your Office of Economic Development staff, as well as the unanimous decision from your Planning Commission. I believe it's uh, actually the city government that dictated this project, since this was specifically laid out, projects such as this, in your city's general plan and the downtown plan. And I think most would agree that this helps a problem uh, portion of the downtown. I have just one word, Benicio's Liquor Store and the Taco Bell drive through and see what type of environment that is at 10 p.m. Um, I think this project, we would all agree, provides increased property tax and utility tax revenue to, for example, to pay for additional police officers. It pays for park fees, so yet you can do park capital project improvements, and that's one of the only ways you fund park projects in the city. The land dedication from this project comes at no monetary cost to taxpayers, especially important since it's essential to the affordable housing project, which you're staff laid out, a painful alternative to obtaining the land is eminent domain. And that would take years of litigation, and that cost would of your time and the litigation would mean the city at some future point would pay highest and best use for the land, money that you don't have. Santa Cruz does not meet its arena goals. By supporting this project, you would be closer to your arena goals and would be more eligible for state funds to pay for future low-income housing projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna just make this final call. Is there any other member of the public that wishes to speak to this item? Any other member of the public? Okay, you'll be our last speaker. Please go ahead. Um, I just arrived here, but uh, I'm a member of the Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, and I have heard that no one addressed the environmental impacts of sea level rise and global warming on this project, and that is something that is supposed to be considered first with all city actions and policies. And uh, I think that the uh, project is inadequate without considering that this project will probably be subject to flooding and sea level rise, and it should be assessed in that respect. Um, all these developments are irresponsible unless they are assessed this way, and I believe that all the development that is planned for close to the ocean should be very carefully considered, and most of it either scaled down or rejected, or somehow constructed so that whoever buys these things, for instance, isn't flooded out or taken out of their uh, dwelling. Um, this may be profitable for those who develop it, but I can't see, in view of our current, really, emergency global warming, that this is a wise move to develop that area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that closes the public comment portion of this hearing. Um, the applicant reserved um, 4.33, four minutes, 33 seconds from their, um, from their initial presentation for rebuttal and to answer questions. You have that time now, and then we'll bring it back to the council for uh, deliberation and action. I, I'll just, uh, here to answer questions of the council as you deliberate. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back. Council Member Matthews. Yeah, um, I am uh, prepared to put a motion on the floor to get the discussion going. Uh, I have a couple of brief comments um, and others I'm sure will kick in. Um, I uh, will put on the floor, um, let me just say um, before I do that, um, I very much support the um, 
action and the conditions of approval that have come to us already. I would, um, one small amendment to make, I appreciate the comments that were made by the Planning Commission about uh, fully activating the pedestrian experience. And so I wanna refer to um, uh, condition number 19, uh, and that says that the um, plan submitted for building permit shall include the following details, um, and they ha it has to do with street level appearance. Um, I would like to modify the existing language very slightly um, uh, to say, and my interest is in activating what are currently long expanses of uh, um, wall. Uh, I, it's extremely important to me that the pedestrian experience at an individual level, walking down the street, enjoying downtown, uh, is uh, activated, interesting, and beautiful. So um, very, I think it's a, a relatively small um, modification to that condition uh, 19A. Um, I will propose the uh, staff recommendation and the conditions of approval with the following uh, changed language to 19A. The plan shall include the addition of active uses along the ground floor of the front street frontage that uh, will accomplish the objective of substantively enhancing the pedestrian experience along front street. The entire area of the parking spaces where the parking spaces are shown in the plans to face front street shall be converted to uses such as commercial uses, office uses, residential amenities and or public restroom and some portion of the space must be publicly accessible uh, from Front Street. The design of the spaces, including access, ceiling height, size, use, and architectural features, so shall substantially meet the requirements of the downtown plan. Approval of the new design shall be subject to the discretion of the Director of Planning and Community Development, um, and it continues as the rest of that um, uh, condition speak so um, the and I will so that's my one relatively minor change to the conditions of approval no second um, uh, one, one thing I'd like yeah. to know whether or not this is something you need to step behind and I'd like to start, um, the um, I'd like to first um, also ask in, if there's any interest in some sort of historical treatment um, plaques we've done for some of our structures downtown to recognize some of the Sure, I'm happy to include um, a condition that there be some element of um, interpretation of the history of, of that part of town. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I just um, I just received a note from someone um, who said that one uh, there was an individual who was waiting outside to speak to this item. She says the uh, um, she wasn't allowed to speak to speak. Is there someone outside waiting to come in to speak? Yeah, that's what it says in the note. But I like to know. I mean, we I made the call out multiple times. Well, let her come in. She yeah she's what I've made a call out numerous times to speak. She wouldn't let it. Okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna reopen the public comment for this one speaker who um, I was told was not allowed to come in. Um, I'm gonna reopen the public comment for this uh, final speaker. Um, thank you. I didn't know that. Did you ask that? Did you say you wanted to speak? And maybe you could tell me afterwards who you spoke with because I just want to make sure that doesn't happen. Standing at the door. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, okay, you have 90 seconds. That's what we agreed to on this. 90 so. seconds, That's okay. Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Ernestina Saldana, and I'm here to tell you that this is a great project, and I support the work for, uh, as a union uh, person, I support the job for the unions to have it, but what I don't support is that you guys are uh, completely uh, invalidating the 50% uh, affordable housing in this project. And uh, with the crisis that we are, and uh, this is like uh, probably the end to the end time that I'm coming in here and asking you to please respect your own rules and keep the 50% inclusionary uh, housing. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, that closes the public comment period. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Council Member Brown. I'd like to make an alternative motion and I have some reasons for that. My motion is very simple. My motion is to continue this item to a meeting in January and I'll give you a January 8th or the 22nd, um, probably the 22nd reasonably, um, in order for the council to um, have time to uh, review some of the materials that were not really made available to us in any kind of uh, uh, appropriate way. So the council has, we have not seen the reports the staff references um, that are subject, that are being used as justification for um, approval on environmental review as well. Uh, and we have also not seen information that provides us with um, uh, evidence, real evidence that uh, to base, upon which to base a, a claim of financial hardship for meeting the 15% affordability requirement that this, the voters of this uh, city approved in 1978 or nine, I can never remember measure O, um, there are some debates about the applicability or the, the potential violation of measure O. I think that um, those are debates that may well play out in court. Um, so I have um, serious concerns as a, I mean, we're being asked as a quasi-judicial body right now, not as a policy-making body, to approve a project which we do not have sufficient, we have not had sufficient evidence to make that those determinations. So I just don't think it's responsible for us to do that. I'm not willing to do that today. Um, I, I do believe that we need, um, and I'm not saying this is last minute, I'm not in any way trying to make the case that this is um, you know, coming to us last minute. I'm saying this is coming to us without the full information that we need to do our job thoroughly and thoughtfully and responsibly. So that being said, I also have concerns about some of the legal challenges that um, may be coming our way. Um, and, and I have a feeling they will be coming uh, no matter how we deter, whatever we decide, if we do this now without thoroughly considering um, the inform and having the access to the evidence, we're going to have due process claims potentially coming at us from all sides of this. So I have major concerns about that, and I do believe that um, the council has received some of some of those concerns. I think there are others out there, um, and so with that, I also think it's this. Um, you know, we'd be um, it would be the responsible thing for us to do to to give it some more thought and time and discussion. So, and I would, I wanna add one thing, I wanna say, I absolutely support housing in at this site. I support the workers who are gonna build it. I absolutely 100% support that. I would support, uh, I mean, I've been a long time supporter of, um, you know, prevailing wage and project labor agreements in new construction. Um, I support unions and, and union wages for those workers. What I do not support is us being asked uh, being told that the only way we're gonna get any housing built is if the developer is allowed to um, to not meet our affordable housing requirements. I just can't support that. Um, I do believe that we have other reasons aside from just the overall affordability concern to need more time in order to make these considerations. So my motion is to continue this item to January 22nd. Second. And I believe it needs to be voted up on before the, the You are absolutely motion. correct. Okay, so there's a motion on motion on the floor from Councilmember Brown, which is seconded by Councilmember Crone to uh, postpone or continue this item to the 22nd of um, January. Um, I personally feel that this project, like I've heard, now let me first ask this question um, for um, Lee. Is this project consistent with the downtown plan and also our city rules in regards to um, development? Thank you, Mayor Terrazas. Uh, the plan that is presented before you has uh, six variations um, from that. The, the plan um, has, for example, some uh, recesses that are included to break up the building mass. And so uh, the, the project, does not conform with all of those. Um, and as identified in the agenda report, um, the planning commission and city staff are supportive of four of those variations as uh, Ms. Hashard expressed with the um, initial presentation. The plan does anticipate that there are gonna be some variations and it provides that process whereby the council can approve those. They are minor in nature. They do not have any environmental effects when you're talking about you know, projections um, 
into a, a recess, for example. Um, however, there are two of those six variations that staff has not supported. Um, those are the um, yeah, the, the mezzanine okay. and the front street frontage there. Okay. But the, the number of units, yes. The general massing, uh, yes. Um, and uh, this is, the, the type of project that was anticipated as part of the downtown plan amendments that the council approved okay. late last year. Okay, yeah, I, I'm prepared to vote for this um, today. Um, I feel like this is an important part of our downtown. We've had numerous hearings over the past two years and this has been something that's encouraged extensive public outreach. This is the absolute type of project that I think our community needs not only for the housing, but also to activate our downtown in a positive way. So I'm prepared to, to, um, I, I'm not gonna support the motion on the floor. Call the question, please. Is there a second to call the question? Yes, you do, I think I'll you do. Second. Okay, okay, we have a motion to call the question. All those, uh, wait, wait. Um, are we voting on the, okay. Yeah, the substitute motion first. Okay. okay. Could, um, you, could you read back the substitute motion? Substitute motion, motion is to postpone to, the, the, to, this to action to until postpone. the tw 22nd of January. None of the rest will be recorded okay. in our minutes, but All I those said in it. favor of that substitute motion, please say aye. Uh, oh, no. Aye. <laughs> those opposed? No. no. Okay, that motion fails with Council Member Crone, um, Council Member um, Brown um, voting in favor, Council Member Matthews, Council Member Chase, Council Member Noyan, Vice Mayor Watkins, and myself opposed. So we'll return back to the uh, main motion unless you have a question. On the main motion, I now have some comments okay. and questions. Council Member Brown. Um, so I guess I, a uh, couple of questions for uh, the city attorney uh, related to uh, one uh, possibilities that for triggering um, reconsideration of this item. Um, I, we you g gave us some information via email, but I wanna just make sure that I'm totally clear about um, how we might proceed here, given um, the potential for other actions to be taken that might cause us to want to reconsider this item. So um, I just wanna make sure I'm clear here before I make my decision about what to do. Um, so if we are, if we are sued, either on the basis of a measure O lawsuit, inclusionary you know, failure to comply with our measure, our inclusionary, um, and or um, process issues related to uh, council making a decision of financial hardship, um, uh, lack of need for additional environmental review, et cetera, kind of I'm just gonna make those general comments um, or, or areas of uh, concern. If we are sued on any or all of those, um, contentions, um, what what c would we be able to do in the future as a, as a council in order to address that? Just wait for the lawsuit to play out or would we be able to reconsider in order to address concerns that are in a legal challenge? I, I wanna make sure I'm really clear here. Um, should should uh, a lawsuit be filed that the city council um, believes is meritorious, then one option would be for the council to rescind the prior action. And that is provided for under the council meeting guidelines. So a, a motion for rescission can be made at a subsequent meeting. So my understanding of rescinding, that would have to be at a subsequent meeting. That, that's when that would take place upon some other outside action being taken. The rules do not do not uh, provide for the council to rescind a decision uh, on the same day that the decision is made. That's right. So the and with respect to uh, motion to reconsider, that can be made on the same day if it comes from a council member that is voted in the ma in the majority on the initial vote. Yes, a motion to reconsider may be made only on the same day that the action was taken. And is this evening's session uh, considered part of today's council meeting? Well, given that the rule does not specify only at the same session, but says the same day, in my opinion, that could occur. Um, it would, I think it would be, um, since that's not on your agenda, the council could not engage in a discussion about that, but it could be agendized for a future meeting. Thank you. 
I'll I'll just make a comment. I know we have a motion on the floor, but but I do feel that like the whole purpose why we're here is to get the evidence out on the floor. <laughs> My, there's something wrong with that. All right. Evidence. The, um, the whole purpose why we're here is to have an opportunity for a full and fair hearing, to make sure that we get the evidence out on the floor, to make sure that we have the process so that questions are answered. We have a, a public body that's here that's heard roughly, we started at 11, so we're going on now two, three and a half hours of you know basically hearings and testimony. I, I really feel that the type of discussion when we say that we're anticipating um, a, a decision like of, of because of some circumstance of, of our hearing later on this evening, I think it's unfortunate because I think it er erodes the trust that the public has in our, 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 our hearing process and our decision making body. Um, this is a this is a matter that this is a matter that we've had come up before over many years. We've talked about housing not only last year but this year. We've also we've also had numerous outreach meetings and public discussions. This is a project that has the opportunity to significantly transform our downtown in a positive way, regardless of what your position is on the matter, um, it is something that I think is going to create new housing units and it also is going to activate spaces that right now I think are underutilized. From a public safety standpoint, from a community standpoint, um, in my opinion, it's a good project. When we talk about the idea that we're looking at um, using our decision-making rules to undermine what has been, I think, one of our best public hearings in terms of evidence that's been presented in terms of the uh, analysis of the costs and the inclusionary uh, value of each of the units, what the developer is bringing to the downtown and what our decision-making body is. I think it's something that um, we haven't seen that before in a project, and I think that's something where it like maybe would deter other people from bringing similar projects before in the future. And I think Foremost, we rely on our planning commission to give us their opinion and analysis. We've had, um, you know, that, that seven member body do a full review and analysis with numerous public hearings, and they also unanimously supported this project coming forward. So, I, I, you know, the idea that we're thinking now or anticipating some, uh, some decision that's going to, um, let's say, discount all that, I think is unfortunate because it does in my mind, as you mentioned, anticipate serious concerns about the, the process, the hearing process that we're, that we're here and about to decide. Councilmember Matthews. I would like to make a few additional comments. People will vote however they do on this project. I mean, this is not the first time in history that a vote is split on a final project. That will play itself out. I want to make a couple of comments about why I specifically um, support this project. Uh, I want to go back to some of the big policy uh, directions that this community has taken, back to our um, community effort in the 70s to um, protect our green belt. And that was done with a very explicit understanding that future growth would rely on infill and increasing density over time. After the uh, earthquake, um, there was an enormous lengthy and deep public process with Vision Santa Cruz and community engagement to decide about the future of our downtown. And out of that came a downtown plan, which has gone through some revisions over time, but it, it contains some um, elements that are reflected in the project that's before us now. Um, Underlining all that was that our downtown would be uh, active, that it would be a mix of components. It would contain housing, both market rate and affordable housing. There would be a mixture of civic and commercial and cultural activities going, um, that our streets would be vibrant, um, that it would be a mix of architectural styles. This is a modern building. And uh, one of the directions that came out of downtown was not gonna be Victorian, we're not gonna be Spanish, we're gonna, we're gonna reflect the times we live in, and this building does. Um, and particularly one of the real concerns that uh, came out of that Vision Santa Cruz uh, process was a long-standing desire to connect our downtown more effectively and positively to the beach. And that's, uh, these sort of things don't happen overnight, but that's been a goal that's been in our community for many, many years. Um, I sp particularly want to speak about the housing. Um, I think the this particular project can't be considered independently from the gift of land, the, the dedication of land um, uh, nearly adjacent next to the Metro Center for the uh, explicit development of affordable housing. That's the package and that's how we get two or exceeding 
the 15 percent. And the fact that we have several nonprofit housing developers eager to, to move forward on this, dedication of land in a downtown is not a trivial contribution to affordable housing. It's a thing that makes it happen. So uh, I see this as ready to go. It's not a far off pipe dream that we um, have to worry about. It will, I, I think that's, that's a real promise that we have to act on. So I see that um, this project supports um, both the long-term vision we have for the nature of our downtown, an active, vibrant place with a whole mix of activities, appealing to a whole mix of people uh, and including uh, development of affordable housing. So that, that, that's my reasoning behind moving this forward. Thanks, Councilmember Noroyan and then Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I mean, we could sit here and wish all we want for requiring a developer to do a straight, perfect 15%, you know, affordability, um, you know, and to say it's the only way it can be done, but our own rules allow flexibility and how we get to that 15%, and we've done that. Um, you know, and like Council Member Matthew said, having land in downtown Santa Cruz that we can work with a nonprofit developer on to build housing is not inconsequential. It's, it's actually huge. It's a game changer and a life changer for a lot of people. And so, you know, if you really don't want growth, I just want people to say it instead of nitpicking projects to death with, with you know, what I see is, you know, fake concerns. Maybe they're not all fake, but I see that. And issues that waste time and money. Um, no housing project is going to be perfect in this environment. Um, I mean, the realities that we face are we don't have redevelopment agencies anymore to provide funding to subsidize uh, provide money to subsidize affordability. HUD's cut their budget to cities for new housing starts, I believe by around 60% over the last 20 years. Uh, the recession happened, so lenders have become very tight with the money that they loan to developers and have a much higher threshold for developers to meet a certain level of profitability until they can even get the money for the project. So. All those things combined, um, getting to the 15% inclusionary requirement kind of does require spit and bubble gum approach, you know? However we can get to it, let's get to it. And what I haven't liked either is this idea that there's not a place for market rate housing. It's needed, it's definitely needed. Um, my physician's assistant was checking me into my doctor's appointment started a conversation with her. She's a local, she grew up here. She graduated from Santa Cruz High in 2008. Guess what? She's now moving to Monterey County and will be commuting to her job here um, because as a local, she says, I can't even find a place that I would run a rent. Um, or going, you know, um, even trying to go to Watsonville or, you know, M Northern Monterey County was so much more compelling price-wise for her. And I have to say, every time we punt um, building higher density apartments um, in our urban core, in our downtown core, we're relegating people having to drive from Monterey and San Benito counties to work here. And we're also relegating those areas to develop over farmland and wildlife corridors because they're going to have a demand. They're not going to build densely because it's pretty rural in those areas. And so as a region, we're really being bad players here by telling the counties that surround us they're responsible for our workforce housing. So come on folks, let's, you know, the details, the devil is in the details sometimes, but this is a good project. I've lived in this town, you know, since I was a four-year-old kid, the threats of lawsuits, nitpicking a project to death, this is par for the course for people who don't want growth. Yeah. So, you know, I am really upset to see the same people who own several homes, who've lived here forever, actually suggesting we should build a Trump-like wall around our city to keep it the way it was when they moved here in the 70s. That's, you know, I'm sorry, that's selfish, and it's not taking into consideration the realities that people face when they work here. When we say workforce housing, those are people who work. <laughs> you know, they're people who are not necessarily making high tech wages, but they're not necessarily people making wages that are low enough to, aff to be able to qualify for affordable housing. We need to consider those folks too. They're the backbone of our community. They're people like the physician's assistant who checked me into my, into my 
by appointment. There are teachers. There are people who are clerks at our places of work. So, you know, we really need to, to stop thinking like we have for the past 40 years and, and consider the population and the region as a whole. Council Member Brown. Well, I'm not gonna debate this here, but I really do have to take issue with the um, notion that, that those of us who don't support letting developers get out of affordable housing requirements are NIMBYs. I have no intention of uh, opposing legitimate affordable housing projects that come our way. I believe that is a major priority. I believe we have not been given the evidence to suggest that financial hardship is sufficient re rationale for um, the developer. Okay. Not, per, not meeting those goals. I do not believe the city has the ability to be flexible about how we make laws and we are. it is our responsibility to enforce them. It is not our responsibility to say, okay, not this time, um, you know, because we believe you that you can't afford it. I just don't believe that. And so that is why um, I have said all the things I've said. In addition, I say we just don't have the evidence and that is why I um, move to continue and it is why I look forward to having this conversation with a new council. That's what I'm Royan. So we aren't saying that. You know, we aren't saying that they haven't gotten to the 15%. They have. It, it's not in the perfect ideological straitjacket way that some people want it to be, but we have reached that. Um, also, you know, um, you know, we had a report. We had an analysis. You know, I, it's kind of getting to the point where it's like, are we going to just poo-poo something that's in front of us because it doesn't fit the information we want? I mean, that sounds like what happens at the federal level of government these days. So, you know, we are requiring 15%. We uh, do have a report that shows that this is not viable, and we could say, hey, 15% straight up, then zero of zero is zero. There's no affordable units in that, in that scenario. Council Member Chase. So among the dozens of housing items that we heard, um, certainly last year and continued, we had a presentation on an expert from a nonprofit um, affordable housing developer from the East Bay. And she, we said, tell us, how can we develop affordable housing here? And she went through all these things. And the first thing she said was, well, you have to have dollars, you have to have subsidies. And since RDA went away, we don't have that. So we're like, okay, what's the next thing? Infill development. We don't have that. So then we said, what's the next thing? Land dedication. So we've, we've finally gotten to the thing that is the way, the only path that's on the table right now, unless RDA is restored, that we're gonna get affordable housing. We had the project that was referenced earlier that's on ocean, or rather not on ocean, on water, in front of this council no fewer than five times trying to cobble together the multiple sources of funds to fund that project for 63 units, which is great and it's fantastic, it's finally moving forward, but we used every bit of dollars that we had as the council in the trust fund to pay for that. It's gone. We've got no other infill options. This is it, council. We said we cared about affordable housing this whole time we've been on council together. This is our chance to make it happen. It really is the thing that when we heard from the community, when we listened and we sat through all of these meetings, they said they needed and they wanted, and here it is. It is our responsibility to say yes if we really believe in affordable housing and we really believe in having a diversity in this community that can stay here. We have an opportunity to say yes. I feel like we have, we have to. Vice Mayor Watkins. I'll just. I'll just briefly echo the comments made by Councilmember Chase. I think, you know, one thing I think I see that we all agree on is a commitment to providing more housing and more affordability of housing in our community. We may have different views on how to get there or beliefs on how to get there, um, but at the end of the day, I know that that's something we all share. I do think that we need to be in action now. We spent the last year looking at housing. I feel grateful to have had the opportunity to be part of the housing subcommittee that created a blueprint for supporting affordability of housing in our area. There is a reality that we face today that Santa Cruz is on the map for no affordable, I mean, we are becoming so increasingly unaffordable that we have to be in action. And so I'm committed to be in action. I know there are imperfections within 
most things that we see, but we have to keep moving in, in the direction of progress. And for that reason, I'll be supporting the, the motion as presented. C Council Member Brown. I just have one more quick comment. Um, because I want to be, and people are throwing out this idea that isn't going to be a, you know, that even market rate housing is necessary for the for physicians assistance. I mean, a back of the envelope analysis can say that we're talking about if, given that we're not getting um, any uh, uh, anything from the developer about what anticipated rents will be, if we look at the current market rate and don't even adjust for increasing rents which we know has happened has been happening annually. I mean, we've done 46% in five years. Um, so rents are gonna continue to go up um, by some degree. Back of the envelope, these are gonna be units that are affordable to people earning 120 to $200,000 a year. So, um, you know, I don't know. That To me, that's not necessarily affordable to the people who live and work in the city, some of whom work for the city who have written to us on other issues recently. Um, so you know, I, I don't think I don't call that um, affordable housing. I, I, you know, I don't call that um, a, a real contribution to our the needs in our the, in the current housing stock. And I certainly don't call it a contribution to our arena targets for um, you know. Uh, we, we're well above our arena targets on market rate and above market housing. So I'm, I just had to say that in response to, you know, I get it, I want more housing, but um, I, I can't use a project that is not gonna provide any affordability or relief for people who live and work here now as an excuse to build um, this project without more information. Councilmember Chase. Well, I, I agree, this is not a place to continue to debate this, but a hundred affordable units for low and very low meets arena goals because of this project. A hundred, it is the largest affordable housing project we will have in the city downtown, exactly where it needs to be, next to a transit station, walkable with a health center and dentist there. I mean, it's like, I don't know what more you would ask for. And so I don't know how we're ignoring the land dedication part of this. This is gonna make that possible. Absent that, we'll get nothing. It's like, it's, I don't know how else you wanna slice that, but it's, it's going to give us a project we desperately need and it's gonna help us meet our goals in the place we need it. So, I mean, we can continue to go back and forth, but I mean, it's, to me, it's a no-brainer. No. I just, I'm just gonna say, I disagree though, um, with all due respect that the, the one parcel in the land swap is a make or break uh, for getting an affordable housing project built. I mean, we actually own a significant portion of property over there and there, and I know you've been involved much more than I have, but I mean, I think it doesn't mean all or nothing to me with respect to an affordable project. I, I just can't see that. Council Member Crone. Well, just uh, what uh, Councilmember Chase said, uh, I would I would ask that the City Council uh, do what the voters said and enforce Measure O and get 15%. I mean, that's the, what I thought our job is supposed to be. I was wondering if Bonnie, if you know what the arena, if those what those statistics are, the high, the middle, the low, the very low, um, and what, what what the percentages are? Do you do you, do you have that by any chance? Uh, what we f f our goals, I guess, or are they? These are suggested goals, or these are they're not mandated. Do, do we get penalized if we don't meet them? We have a nine-year period, and um, the last time we checked, we were about forty-six percent of meeting our goals during that during that nine-year period. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the area where we need to build substantial amount of housing is in the very low and low categories. Um, and the last uh, completed year, which is 2017, we had completed uh, 343 of the 747 um, allocation by income level. When you compare us to other cities um, in the county, we're doing very well. Obviously, from our perspective, we want to exceed um, the RENA allocation by the end of the, the nine-year period. If we're able to move forward, with the project in the downtown, um, creating those very low and low numbers will be um, well on the way of meeting um, those income category breakdown of the number of units for very low and low that we need to create in the downtown. What percentage have we done uh, as far as market rate housing is concerned? with respect to the arena goals? Yeah, I don't have this broken out by percentage. Um, we, in the above moderate um, category, 
um, and I just have through year three, and I think there may be, um, yeah, I think th I think that's right. The um, we have approximately a need for 313 units, and um, there's about 175 um, yet for above moderate. In moderate, we've met the category breakdown, so we fully met what the arena allocation is for moderate. For low, um, we have 89 units um, that we need to create in the low income category and the very low 154. Thank you. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, uh, Mayor Tarasas, what you said about trust, because this is coming at us pretty fast, and this has come to us at the 11th hour. It's not just a coffee house around the corner. Um, so I, I want to know where the trust is there that we, we have to like rush to approve this tonight. Um, you talk about rep, you talk about the Planning Commission. We have nominated people to the Planning Commission. Guess what? They're not on there. We have no representation on the Planning Commission. This has been a problem. This has been a problem. I, I mean, we had an election and there was different results because we are at the height of this uh, market rate housing uh, uh, boom where we, I agree with one of the speakers, is affordable housing crisis, not a market rate housing crisis. So to talk about representation and trust, I just think it's a little bit disingenuous because this is a, a, a fast track thing right now and uh, don't want us to vote tonight or tomorrow or next week or next month on it, but we have to vote uh, right now on it. Um, you know, I agree with one of the speakers said 5.5 is still 5.5%. Uh, you know, I, I join Ernestina saying 15% is 15% and 5.5% is still 5.5%. Um, you know, Mr. Buck talked about building uh, in the community that builds community. I just thought that was, a, that's nice, you know, build, building a community that builds community. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just, we're not getting, we're supposed to represent the people of Santa Cruz and get the best deal possible. This is not the best deal possible. Well, let, let me just respond and say, I think the trust is this process and it's the integrity of each of us that have reviewed and heard what we've said. And I think that is why we're here as an elected members of this body to review this project and see what it has for our future in our city. I think some may, disagree that this is the type of project they want and they need to, to vote on those merits. But those that are voting for this project today believe in it and believe it represents a positive outcome and a positive future for our downtown and our city, creating new housing, creating affordable housing, and creating a more active and vibrant downtown. I mean, I look at this as a final decision, one that we are looking at for our city's future and I wholeheartedly support us creating this opportunity for the next generation. By the way, we do have a vibrant and active downtown now. We've had outside consultants yeah. tell us that and tell us that there, we, we would be the envy of, of other cities. So I don't want to leave that on the so table like that? that there's so an active the that there's an active and vibrant downtown now. Yeah, I think different parts of it have different levels of activity and vibrancy and some no, maybe we no want to No decision encourage. you're making as far as you know who we're pushing out and who's going to be living here. Understand. Well, I think we've, if there's no other comments or discussion, I think we have a, a pending motion on the floor um, and um, I'd like to put it to a vote. Uh, Council Member Matthews and I seconded that. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, let's go do a roll call. Those, uh, all those in favor of this motion, um, if you call out each individual council member. Council Member Crone? No. Matthews? Aye. Please? Aye. Brown? Brown. Ryan? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Aye. Okay, that motion passes with Council Member Crone, Council Member Brown opposed, Council Member Matthews, Council Member Chase, Council Member Naroyan, and Vice Mayor Watkins in favor. Thank you everyone, all of uh, the labor that was here today and everyone for this uh, presentation and this process. I really appreciate your patience as we kind of worked our way through this. So at this point, yeah, let me just say, 
At this point, um, we've been here since 8.30 in the morning. I'm gonna adjourn the meeting. We're gonna return at 2.45 p.m. and begin the, uh, the next portion of the day. Okay, you're, thank you're, you. You're recessing. Yeah. Since we had an early start and we had to take our lunch break, or we wanted to take our lunch break, um, so right now we're back on our, the, uh, the, uh, this agenda. Item number 27, this is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2018-20, amending chapter 21.03 of the Municipal Code pertaining to re relocation assistance for displaced tenants. Um, this is on the consent public hearing. I'm gonna pull it from the consent hearing uh, just for the discussion um, and uh, ask first that um, City Attorney Tony Condotti um, kind of give some background on uh, what, what has occurred since this was presented at the last meeting. Um, well, <clears throat> you might recall that at the last meeting, uh, a number of speakers uh, raised concerns about the fact that the ordinance as originally written um, would enable a landlord who chooses to implement a large rent increase 
to circumvent the requirements of the relocation assistance part of the ordinance by simply terminating the tenancy. And in response to um, <coughs> those comments, uh, planning department staff had been working on language to address that situation. And then specifically <coughs> during the course of the meeting, we <coughs> prepared some alternative language that the that the council could consider if it wanted to add that to the ordinance um, for purposes of um, closing that loophole. So, so that was done and the ordinance was introduced with the modifications that we talked about that basically requires relocation <coughs> assistance in addition to the circumstance where there's a large rent increase, but if a, <coughs> if a uh, tenancy is terminated without cause or, or at the end of a lease, um, a tenancy is terminated without cause, except for holding over at the expiration of the lease. So, so it's similar in some respects to a just cause eviction rule because it would protect tenants from being subjected to large rent increases or having their um, leases or rental agreements terminated for the purpose of increasing the rent. Um, but what's different about it is that it doesn't prohibit landlords from increasing the rent to whatever the market conditions will bear. It only requires the payment of relocation assistance if a tenant as a result of that type of a uh, rent increase uh, decides that they can't afford to stay there anymore and wants to move out. So, um, so that language was prepared, um, I think during a break or when I stepped out of the chambers for a minute um, during the course of that hearing and uh, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins happened to be also outside of the chambers at that point. We discussed that briefly and when we came back into uh, the hearing at the, at the conclusion of the public testimony portion of that agenda item, Council Member Watkins asked a question as to how we might address that and that's when the language that we had been working on earlier in the evening uh, appeared on the, on the screen um, for your consideration. Okay, I just uh, just a couple more follow-ups, and then I, we can... I know that you've um, received some comments about that from several members of the public, as have I. From a legal perspective, I, I don't think there's anything improper or untoward about what occurred. Um, I could understand somebody not being uh, happy with that if they opposed the large rent increase ordinance in the first instance. Um, or having other policy reasons to disagree with it. We also did receive a letter from um, Mr. Grodberg, who also spoke at the last meeting, who um, basically asserted that the addition of that language to the ordinance, um, in his opinion, constituted a violation of the Brown Act. Um, I would just note, I track it down here, that the agenda, um, item that was before the council at that time um, described the matter in the same fashion that it's described in your current agenda packet, which is um, amending chapter 21.03 of the municipal code pertaining to relocation assistance <laughs> for displaced tenants in a, and a uh, tenant whose lease is terminated certainly is a displaced tenant. So in my view, the description is adequate, but um, the description of the action to be taken um, at that prior agenda, as I recall, uh, also included in the text below the agenda title um, due to a large rent increase. So that's a nuance, but um, in my opinion, it's it's in all likelihood adequate description under the requirements of the Brown Act that only require that a, uh, an agenda item contain a brief general description, uh, not exceeding 20 words of the subject matter of the, of the meeting. That being said, Mr. Grodberg has threatened to file a legal challenge on the Brown Act issue. 
And also, if you would, if you can explain what's the impact, if any changes are made to this uh, ordinance that's before us today. Right, uh, under your, um, under the charter, if a change is made to an ordinance after its initial introduction, then um, the same restrictions apply. It can't be finally adopted uh, until a subsequent meeting after public notice is provided with the changes intact. So if you make any substantive changes today, that's totally appropriate and it's permissible, but you would have to then set the matter for a further hearing for a second reading again. That's the, that's the implication. Councilmember Brown. Just a follow up question. Um, the, so in response to the communications we've received regarding the um, potential Brown Act violation from our previous action, in your opinion, would that be mitigated if we were to use the existing language today and call this a first reading and direct? Uh, that that would address the, the that would completely address the concern, yes. And so you're saying just the language that was presented um, at the meeting? If, so the information that we've received today is a second reading. If we move to um, support it, um, support that and make this a first reading with direction to staff to bring it back for a second reading for the next meeting. That right. would I, I don't see any prohibition on the council uh, voting to re-adopt uh, the ordinance for introduction at this meeting, which also eliminates that question about whether or not there's been proper notice under the Brown Act. Um, since the ordinance on its face uh, is intended to apply retroactively to November 27th of 2018, that also shouldn't affect um, the, the outcome that would result from adopting of the ordinance in January. That was for clarification. I'd like to hear from the public before we yeah. proceed. And, and I have a follow-up. You know, frankly, I understood that when those changes were coming back, they were coming back from the staff. There were staff kind of revisions that were there. So I would like to know, like, if when we go through the um, through this, I'd like to see that original draft and more have some discussion as far as if a council member is proposing a particular change to the ordinance, understand what the intent is of that change so we can have a full kind of understanding of you know what the impact is and at least give the public an opportunity to, to let us know, um, you know what, what that means in practice. I know that the original draft ordinance was presented at a public meeting in um, I think July at the Loudon Nelson Center and then was brought forward to the council, um, perhaps with some changes based on that public input, but most of the changes that took place at the meeting, th that, that uh, ordinance represented what was presented to the public and their feedback. So any changes beyond that, I'd like to kind of hear from the council member on what the basis is of this change so we can really kind of deliberate on that. Right, and, and in this case, I don't think that those changes, I, I mean, I, would, I don't think it would be accurate to say that those changes came from a council member. It was um, you know, my attempt and staff's attempt at being proactive to address concerns that the council might have based on the public comment. So, um, and, I, and I agree that that, um, you know, it's not, the, it's not ideal to have those issues come up at the end of a hearing after the members of the public have been heard from it's not improper, but it's it's not the ideal situation. And I also got the sense after the meeting that some council members not have might not have fully appreciated all of the implications of the added language that were that was presented. So, in that sense too, I think it it would be appropriate for um, reintroduction if the council decides to go in that direction. And if I could press a little further, when you talk about the idea that you were anticipating these questions, I mean, were there specific reasons why you were anticipating those? Because obviously, when we're talking about it in public, we want to know what why we're making the change. Um, I, I can only speak for myself on that, but from my perspective, it was based on concerns that were pointed out by members of the public that, that I thought um, the council would be interested in, in addressing specifically related to um, having an ordinance that's, that has a, a, um, an obvious way of circumventing its intent by enabling landlords to terminate tenancies for purposes of increasing the rent. So, so from my perspective, it wasn't um, with the intent of persuading the council to go in one direction or another. Uh, it was simply um, 
recognizing what I perceived as a loophole in the ordinance and trying to um, be prepared should the council want to close it. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I just wanted to clarify, you had a question regarding um, when the, uh, so I'm Sarah Fleming, principal planner with the long range planning team here with the city. Uh, the meeting that we had did take place November 27th at the police station, uh, community room. July. Oh, I'm sorry, what did I say? November 27th. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, July 27th, and, or I think it was the 17th actually, but um, the only changes that were made from that to what came before council were a few typos. Other than that, the original ordinance that you saw was the ordinance that we presented to the the public and then the second reading ordinance are the changes then that we discussed uh, at the last meeting occurred at the meeting after the presentation during during the meeting yeah, that's correct okay. that's correct okay council member chase so just to clarify then what we're seeing electronically there is the the red line version everything in red was added after the first reading no right? so or at the first reading the red line version that you have before you has both the, the everything that was in that first meeting as well as the changes so but the changes are reflected in red all of the changes, both are okay. reflected in red. So the entirety of the changes to the ordinance are reflected in red, um, although we could pretty easily call out for you which ones came from uh, November 27th and which ones were the original proposal. Okay, that's what I was kind yeah. of trying to differentiate. Sure. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, I was wondering, I, I had sent an email asking if we could have maybe multiple versions to show what the first one was and then yeah. show these yeah. iterations so that we can make sure that we're tracking what, what exactly um, the process was that got us here. Are there any other questions? Okay, then I'm gonna ask for uh, a, a presentation on, on this, right? Where, where, I mean. I could provide a brief presentation if you'd like. Yep, just in regards to the uh, original ordinance that was presented um, and then these changes, changes. and what the, yeah. Sure. So <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mayor and Councilmember Lee Butler. I'm the planning director. And um, as you've been discussing, the, uh, the ordinance before you would um, require that if a landlord chooses to increase their rent by more than 5% in one year or more than 7% over two consecutive years, so cumulatively 7% in two years, and the tenant chooses to leave within 60 days time of that rent increase, then the tenant would be um, provided with relocation assistance in the amount of two months of rent for um, uh, prior, within 21 days, so prior to their um, leaving typically, so within 21 days of the notification to the landlord. Um, there were a couple of changes um, at the last meeting. The one was those percentages. Um, it was um, previously uh, proposed as 10% in one year and 15.5% in two, and Council's action moved it to 5% um, in one year or cumulatively more than 7% in two years. And there was one other change, and that was related to um, the termination of tenancies for reasons other than the breach of the rental agreement. And so the language that was added would mean that if a landlord requests that a tenant leaves for any reason other than a breach of lease um, and excluding the extension of time beyond the initial set period. So if a landlord said um, that, or excuse me, if a tenant were not paying rent, that would be a breach of lease. If a tenant were um, damaging the house, that would be a breach of lease. If they are not allowing the landlord to come in and make repairs, that would be a breach of lease. So those things would not trigger the relocation payment. But if they're otherwise in good standing and the landlord asks them to leave, the, the changes put in place <coughs> at the last council meeting would entitle that tenant to two months of relocation assistance. So whether or not they have the large rent increase or not of five or 7%, um, if they're asked to leave and they haven't breached the lease, then they would be entitled to that. So those were the changes and, and there are a series of them in, um, that um, related to that. And in, in the intent and purpose, it identified that those who terminate a, a tenancy for reasons other than the breach of lease and then the percentages were changed and the specific provision that was changed 
um, reads that for tenants who relocate due to a large increase, and then it was added, or who are required to vacate due to the termination of a tenancy for reasons other than the breach of terms of a rental agreement, except for continuing to occupy a residence after the expiration of that term. So that's where you've got a year long lease and you stay on for month to month. That would not be considered a breach of lease under these provisions. Then they would be entitled to that relocation assistance. So. Um, those are the changes. Um, that change was made um, as an option for the council to consider in response to the public comments, as well as um, as a, a option to address some of the comments that came in at the September 11th hearing. Council will recall this was considered then, and council said, um, let's hear it after the election. And one of the comments was that we should look at the Los Gatos ordinance, and we looked at the Los Gatos ordinance. It didn't entirely line up with what we were um, looking at, because that was really a just cause eviction provision. And so we have now, um, we, we included in the presentation some options, but then during that meeting, we came up with a, uh, a better option that uh, the council could consider. So that's what's before you today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Looks like Sarah may have something she'd like to add. <laughs> Uh, the only item that was not mentioned was we did change, I believe it's in section three of the ordinance, the date uh, for when the ordinance was effective. And then we changed it from certification of the election results to November 27th. Are there any questions before we have some public comment? <laughs> okay, I'd like to open it up for public comment. We did have, um, <laughs> two uh, individuals that requested additional time. Um, Mr. Norse from Huff. You're up. Yeah, four minutes. <laughs> Members of the community and city council. Um, this, as has been said before at several hearings, has no enforcement provisions. So similar even to the rent freeze of February, people who are shortchanged or unlawfully treated by landlords have no real recompense from the city council, from law enforcement agencies and others, unless they have the money and the power to get an attorney together in a court case going, is my understanding. I could be wrong about this. This has the same defect and problem, and I anticipate the same kind of problem, even with an extension of the rent freeze. That, of course, is the real issue that many people are here for. This, as was pointed out before, is a sort of a sop to those who want to believe the city council is doing something, though it antagonizes landlords as well, and I understand that. Um, the issue to me is whether this council wants to accept an emergency resolution and whether council members Brown and Crone, seem to be the only council members interested in this, want to put forward an emergency resolution in spite of the misinformation provided by the city attorney, which I pointed out in a letter to the mayors, both David Terrazas and, and Martine Watkins, the incoming mayor. That is, that the Brown Act, according to the First Amendment Coalition of San Francisco, actually the state which follows these issues, uh, reads as follows. A legislative body may discuss an, a non-agenda item at a regular meeting if by a majority vote, the body determines the matter it mentions constitutes an emergency. Now there may be five votes here, or maybe four, I'm not sure, at least determining so you can actually discuss the matter. The Brown Act provides for emergency meetings to be held by a legislative body with little or no notice to the public. Mr. Condotti's claims for crushing the discussion in the last two meetings notwithstanding. And I would really appreciate it if the two council members who are supposedly standing up for the renters would actually make such an emergency resolution. Yeah, you might get voted down, and of course you can try to bring it up again this evening under a uh, new and hopefully different city council. But at least empower those of us who are listening and make us feel that you're doing everything you can. 
And I know that uh, in the last meeting, one council member decided not to use a technical trick to vote uh, in, in favor of something so that she could later vote against it. I understand her reasons for doing that. But this has to do with the safety and security of many people in the city. And it's gonna be happening over the, the, the vacation, probably even with a city council rent freeze, unless enforcement provisions are added. And I don't see her that likely to be happening unless someone pulls it out of a hat, which I certainly hope they do. Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, the group I work with, of course, is concerned with homeless folks and the increase in homelessness that throwing tenants out on the street produces. Uh, <laughs> We're having a meeting tomorrow at 11 o'clock at the Sub Rosa Cafe in concert with renters, and this is a first for us, because we think that alone all our groups are so much spit in the wind, but when we get together and stand together and point out that disabled people, uh, people of color, elderly people, homeless people and renters need to act together against the mighty power the very mighty power of the landlord establishment, which rammed through the defeat of Measure M and Proposition 10. And I would hope that some members of the city council will, you know, get the ovaries up or the balls up to do this at this council and perhaps tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norse. Next speaker again, contact me in advance um, for four minutes additional time. It's uh, Lynn Renshaw, Santa Cruz together. <coughs> So Lynn Renshaw, SantaCruzTogether.com. SantaCruzTogether.com is concerned about the affordable housing shortage and we advocate for solutions that don't make the bad problem worse. The housing crisis is self-evident but overreaching laws will make it worse. Based on your preliminary discussion, I, it seems you share our concern about the process surrounding the amendment to the relocation <laughs> ordinance that passed first reading. There was no discussion about the amendment requiring two months rent for relocation fees when a mutually agreed upon rental agreement is not renewed. This, we perceive this as a substantial amendment and there was no public notice given with a red line text available in advance. The city council spent only a few minutes before voting to make a citywide change to housing law. The lack of discussion might have meant some council members were not crystal clear before they voted aye. The section of the relocation ordinance is poorly written and hard to understand and may have contributed to the confusion. I hope you will reconsider this amendment as it seems um, from the, the earlier discussion might be happening. The city council needs to be transparent and careful, particularly about broad sweeping policies that affect everyone in Santa Cruz, including homeowners. Requiring two months rent for relocation if a mutually agreed upon lease is not re renewed is a very significant change with wide ranging impact on thousands of rental agreements. This penalty apparently applies whether or not rent is increased. The amount of the relocation fees is unjust compensation for a situation involving zero wrongdoing. The majority of the public likely opposes changing basic contract law in this manner. Santa Cruz Together paid for professional polling that accurately predicted the 62% opposition to Measure M. Our polling captured responses to particular provisions. We polled on numerous points, including the following. 72% of the public, public thought it was bad to make end dates of leases unenforceable. 60% of the public are opposed to excessive relocation fees. Unreasonable rental regulations jeopardize the rental housing supply. Remember with the California Ellis Act that preempts city council action, people can withdraw from the rental business. In particular, renters depend on nearly 8,000 single family rental homes that can be sold and converted to owner occupied housing. When those giving public comments talk about selling their rentals, their point is that the city is at risk of losing a substantial amount of rental housing. This will create more competition for rentals, which will push rents even higher and 
since by California state law, rent is unlimited on houses, condos, and any apartment when people move. Every future renter would find it more competitive with higher rents. Everyone should understand that the city council cannot create laws that conflict with state law since state laws supersede the city. The California state has occupied the law and said that rent cannot be controlled on single family homes or when anybody moves to an apartment. The city should comply with substantial state housing laws and consider pursuing more balanced solutions that don't reduce the rental housing supply. SantaCruzTogether.com. Thank you. Okay, so that, um, those are the organizational speakers. At this point, is there any member of the public that wishes to speak to this item? Okay, if you do, I'd like you to line, line up um, to the left um, and we'll start with Ernestina. No? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you'll, uh, let me just take, show of hands, please, how many people pl wish to speak to this item? One. Let me go with uh, 90 seconds. That's what we agreed to last time, so we have 90 seconds to speak to um, on this item. Um, you, you know, we, we've been here since 8.30. We're trying to... Yeah, no, I, well, 8.30 a.m.? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go and uh, see how it goes. Um, please begin, 90 seconds. Hi, Council, my name is Mickey Larson, and uh, there's been a lot of talk about language, and I was just wondering about that phrase, displaced tenants. I get the image of a boatload of refugees without um, flotation devices when I hear that. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> So relocation fees for not renewing a lease is another spin-off on Measure M. It is a divisively ill-conceived concept to usurp a landlord-tenant agreement. The lease is an agreement between the tenant and landlord in which both parties agree to certain conditions. It is signed by both parties. It can be altered if both parties agree, and it can be challenged <clears throat> in tenant landlord resolution centers or court. Why relocation fees? These are not small amounts. They are thousands of dollars we're talking about. There are many positive reasons for not renewing a lease. For example, if a landlord wants to move his sick aging mother into his rental unit to be close by and gives proper notice and waits for the expiration of the lease, why should the landlord also pay exorbitant fees for the tenant to leave? Caring for the sick is difficult enough without throwing hefty fees into the mix. These, these fees are predicated on tenants being victims to life's exigencies. Thank you. Next, next, next speaker. Hi, Donna Bloomfield, thank you for your time. Why would a tenant ever leave willingly if they can receive relocation fees under any circumstances, such as the property owner not wanting to renew the lease? This has no checks and balances. You would be an idiot to leave thousands of dollars on the table. And why am I considered a government subsidy? The lease is ended, the contract is expired, it's private property. I believe that pro-measure M people want to abolish pr private property rights and they have so much said so. Um, I also can't, I don't believe that about the Los Gatos thing. I've read the Los Gatos um, and it has lots of great checks and balances and it protects both tenants and landlords and I'm all for it. I am a landlord who lives in the ADU behind my main house because I can't afford that mortgage and I would never have been able to stay in Santa Cruz without being able to do that. I also happen to know from seeing the finances of my tenant that he has hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so in addition to what it would cost me to even change a tenant over, which I never do because it's so costly, I would now have to give an additional two months relocation fees, which he can totally afford on his own. Um, this should only apply to, apply to erroneously high increases. You are punishing the good with the bad and it is not fair. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. 
Hi, my name is Tom Powers, and the relocation fee of two months paid to tenants upon a mutually agreed upon legally binding contract is unreasonable, untenable, and unfair to landlords. Those uh, mom and pop landlords operating on really narrow margins, it makes absolutely no sense to have to do this. This is absolutely unfair, um, and, and really, really, I believe, truly will deplete rental stock if it goes through. I, I I personally, uh, my wife and I will sell our property immediately upon if this were to go through. And I just, I, I can't believe that city council is not representing the will of the people. Vast majority of the voters in the city of Santa Cruz <laughs> voted no on Measure M. And so I, I think you really have a responsibility to represent the community. And um, you know, the other thing too, I mean, the, all the proponents of Measure M, they really demonize landlords as blood sucking, greedy, scum of the earth, and I think that is really not the case. I mean, basically, uh, um, you know, a lot of us are caring, we're long-term community members, responsible, trying to provide, you know, provide um, great housing, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's really unfair, and it's, it's really turned into a us against them versus looking for viable solutions. So uh, uh, put your heads together and come up with something that will work. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Christina Cobell. I'm a landlord in Santa Cruz, and um, I agree with Santa Cruz together, what they have to say, and all the people that spoke before me. Um, the increase to pay out people two months' rent would literally, for my con situation, would wipe out any profit that I would have on the property. And I bought during the recession, so I probably have a lower payment than some people. But I just can't imagine people even buying now and being able to rent at a market rate or even lower market rate um, in a responsible way if you have to pay out two months rent. And again, like the other people said, you have an agreed upon lease with two parties entering in that lease. There's a timeline, there's agreed upon rules and regulations. I don't think that the city should step into that agreement. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um, good afternoon, uh, City Council. My name is Dee Murray, and I'm speaking for the responsible and conscientious landlords who do not gouge their tenants with high rents. They have had tenants for many years without complaints since their living conditions are well maintained and the rents are kept at below the market. So uh, to impose these conditions on these ten, um, landlords is not fair. Um, if some Landlords are gouging uh, their tenants, they should be responsible and maybe rules and regulations should apply to them, but not the conscientious landlords that we've had in Santa Cruz, city of Santa Cruz for many years. Um, it's a costly to maintain their properties and taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanna say we certainly agree wholeheartedly with the presentation that was just made by Santa Cruz together. It was well said and done. And thank you very much. Thank you. Next, next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Elise Casby, and um, I just want to try to keep my thoughts straight because I have a cold. I'm sorry, so I hope this is coherent. Um, I'm very interested in seeing this measure pass because I think, and, and I'm speaking here to some of the landlords, for example, Measure M was funded um, to a large extent by outside enormously wealthy landlords. So they weren't the mom and pops. And what landlords I hope will understand is that that align, alliance, that a political alliance is exactly what the kind of thing that renters don't have. Um, and, and that's why we're asking for some support here. Um, the rent freeze is about to end, people are gonna be out on the street. Just to, a, another point I wanna address about people being against private property. I think that it, when, when the deck is stacked in the way it is, it's very hard for renters to even have a choice about re where they can rent. We have to decide, okay, I'm gonna take this lease because that's the best I can do. I have to go to school here, I wanna work here, whatever it is, um, for the, re the reasons for being here. What I'm trying to talk about is it, it, it is 
it's difficult to find just solutions because the aggregates, the collectives here are so unjustly stacked. So I don't agree with what some of the renters say about some of the landlords, but I just wanted to say, I think this measure will help renters. Please help us. Thank you. Next speaker, please. It's me again. <laughs> I'm here before you again to express my concern about both the substance and the process for changes proposed at the end of the November 27th City Council meeting that address the relocation assistance for displaced tenants. The language of this section is confusing. The end of a mutually agreed upon lease completion date should not precipitate payment. Requiring such payments in light of agreements between property providers and tenants is unfair for housing providers who have not done anything wrong. As a more practical matter, for example, if a property owner chose not to renew a one-year lease and the tenants decided to stay beyond the completion date without a lease, they would only be required to vacate only if the landlord paid the tenants two months rent, effectively meaning that the landlord only receives 10 months rent for 12 months of occupancy. This approach would create serious disincentives for property owners to provide rentals. Tenants who are required to vacate due to continuing to occupy a residence after completion of the lease term should not be eligible for relocation assistance. This new language was drafted hastily and passed at nearly 11 p.m. without any public notice, public review, or comment. The City Council needs to be more transparent, particularly about broad sweeping policies that affect all of Santa Cruz housing. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Wallace, and I'm here to express my concern about the process surrounding the relocation ordinance that passed a first reading on November 27th. The amendment requiring two months relocation fees to end any tenancy, even to not renew a finite lease contract, was not on the agenda. The original in intent, I believe, was, was to only penalize owners who made rent adjustments in excess of a certain percentage. Punishing owners for no wrongdoing is a surefire way to further shrink the housing supply. <coughs> Sweeping changes to housing policy shouldn't be made without careful thought, research, and public input. The Santa Cruz City Council is now faced with a choice of implementing policies to encourage mom and pops to stay in the market, new investors to buy properties to rent, and developers to add to the housing supply, or, as seems to be the case, to impose Measure M style restrictions, such as just cause eviction and relocation fees against the will of 62% of our community. No one is required to provide a rental. Restrictions the new council is set to gleefully implement will result in rentals continuing to be sold, withdrawn, used by family, or left vacant. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Holly Locatelli, and I just want to echo the um, sentiments here about not going through with the um, relocation fees at the end of a um, lease agreement. That doesn't seem fair. We happen to be the landlords that have not raised our rent. We're way below uh, market value. We haven't raised rent in over five years. And this just feels like a punch in the gut when we've been doing the right thing. We didn't um, raise our rents. We didn't do anything like that, threaten her. We have a great relationship with our tenants and I just want that to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mr. Mayor, City Council, thank you for uh, taking the time on this. Um, we all know we have a major shortage of housing. I've been up here before. I'm a little bit less nervous this time, but I still feel it. Um, we, I really want to be part of this solution. A lot of people in this room want to be part of the solution. Taking rights away is already 
taking properties off the market for rentals. It's gentrifying neighborhoods. Owners are buying things to live in that used to be rentals. It's happening, I see it every single day. You guys are causing a problem bigger than what we had prior. And it's really on all of us. I, I really, the hasty decision making isn't working. We need to be leaders. Santa Cruz is so progressive, we're so good. Let's come up with a solution that works. Let's, let's put a committee together, let's make it happen. Let's do something that other people haven't done and that will work. We really need that. Every landlord needs tenants. Every tenant needs a landlord. It's how it works. Let's not have a big battle, let's not fight, let's work together. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Jeff VC. I've been a, a landlord and uh, resident of Santa Cruz for 28 years. Uh, Anyway, uh, as other people have said, I really think it's unfair to put on this two-month relocation fee for uh, uh, a mutually agreed lease that ends, and if, if, I mean, if the landlord doesn't uh, renew it. Uh, I think the City Council needs to be much more transparent when it comes to broad sweeping policies like this that affect all Santa Cruz housing, including uh, homeowners. Santa Cruz needs stability in the rental market, not on-the-fly policies. For example, if you look at the 5%, 7% rent control policy that it recently was stated, how long will it be in effect? I'm talking, speaking about stability. Are we talking two years, five years, or are we talking the next city council meeting when they decide to change it again? Uh, and another thing, uh, will a new city council put back in the rent freeze? These are examples of why there's no stability, and this is what's scaring landlords to death, including me, is we have no idea what's coming at us. Uh, for landlords and developers to embrace the rental market, we need stability, we need stability. Without stability, landlords will continue to sell or convert their rental properties or to other uses and contractors will be reluctant to build new rentals. The way to retain our existing rentals and encourage developers to build new rentals is with long-term stability in the city council's rent policy. So please think of that when you make changes. Th thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, I'm Ginger Dicar. I'm a resident of the city of Santa Cruz and I just remodeled my house and I added an accessory dwelling unit. I, the reason we did this was because it's an investment as well as I'm very um, aware of the need for housing in Santa Cruz and the need for higher density housing and I feel like accessory dwelling units are an important component of that. Um, I, I really um, believe that the city should be making it easier for people to add accessory dwelling units and not adding more restrictions to these units. Uh, I have a lot of objections to the city council um, and their decisions on rent control, but my main one is the landlords, this recent um, addition of the landlord cannot terminate a tenancy for reasons other than the breach of the terms of a rental agreement without bearing the responsibility of the two months rent. Um, I just can't believe that I can't have my sister live in my accessory dwelling unit, make that decision without two months rent paid for. I can't have my son live there. I can't have a good friend. I can't even myself live there without having two months. Part of the dream of this was that my husband and I eventually, as the kids got out of the house, we would move to our accessory dwelling unit and, and rent out the main part of the house. But it sounds like there's potential for me to have to pay two months rent in order to do that. Um, the city of Santa Cruz Measure M did not pass. Neither did the Costa Hawkins law get repealed. There was four people at the city of Santa Cruz Council that made this decision, and I feel like you need to be looking at the, what the will of the people is in making this decision. Thank you. Next, next speaker, please. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Brennan. I'm a Santa Cruz tenant and organizer with Students United with Renters. Um, tomorrow is being called eviction day in Santa Cruz as the current substantive protections for tenants in this city expire. Thousands of the workers who make this city run, as well as students who depend on stable housing in this city for their education, will be vulnerable once again to massive rent increases and evictions for no fault of their own. As so many tenants told you two weeks ago, the ordinance before you is still not what we need to keep us in our homes, even with the amendments that were made at your last meeting, but I urge you to pass the ordinance as is instead of making it weaker as some landlords have called for today. The relocation assistance that this provides to tenants who are thrown out of their housing will at the very least give us the ability to find replacement housing after an eviction, instead of ending up sleeping in a car or a friend's living room or on the streets. 
For the many tenants on month-to-month -month leases, reversing the decision you made two weeks ago after hours of public comment calling for just that would mean the continuing threat of an eviction at a time when it is so difficult to find housing. I have twice needed to find a place to live in this city starting January 1st, and it's extremely difficult with the number of houses fully occupied by students for the entire academic year. Without relocation assistance, tenants who are displaced are at an extreme disadvantage in the housing market with no opportunity to build up savings in advance. With this situation facing tenants in the city, it will be an unconscionable and harmful choice to remove what I know myself and other tenants consider the only effective part of this ordinance. Please keep it in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for keeping on time. <laughs> Next speaker. Hello, Barbara, um, River Woman Child. Um, I want to tell you the story of Laura, uh, a woman I know who was evicted uh, under the rent freeze, which was um, more rigorous than the ordinance you're considering right now. And uh, she was 64 years old. She is 64 years old. She is disabled. She worked in this town for um, 23 years. She lived here, raised her children here. Um, and she worked at Rite Aid, she worked at Jack in the Box, she worked at in-home healthcare, and as you know, she probably made $14 or less an hour. Um, she lives with her boyfriend. The owners, she was evicted um, in August under the rent freeze. Um, the owners, I'm going to call out their names because we need to begin calling out the names of landlords who are doing what they're doing. Um, they are David Flores and his wife, Melissa Flores, um, and they own a fourplex on Pearl Street, right next to the Jesse Street Marsh. Um, Melissa Flores on, gave Laura, her name is changed to protect her, an eviction notice saying that she was required to do a city required um, repair. She left, she had to live in a hotel, she spent $4,000 a month. This is a really poor woman, not well. And she's now in Fresno. She had to flee this town. It was a total sham what that woman did. And she said she hates that woman so much. It's, it's horrible what Th happens, even under rent. -free. Thank you, Barbara. Next speaker, please. Hello. I'm one of the displaced people. I've lived here for 42 years, have been a very contributing member, I think, in a positive manner. I've had two people from Apple come and buy where I live. They want me out. Now, if they can afford to buy a place, they can afford to help me to relocate. Right, yeah. Two months rent won't even cover a deposit to find a place. Now, I'm 71 years old. What do you expect me to do? Where is the morality in this? I just don't understand how. Here we go, back in the back with the pink shirt. How many thousands and thousands of dollars did he make off the profit of selling my place? And yet two months rent is too extreme. The seller made over 500,000 off of it. Yet two months rent is too extreme. I just don't understand where the care is about community members. I'm an artist in this community. I'm not a big money maker. Yet you don't seem to value people like me in this community, so I have to leave. How was that fair? How, how was it fair that the seller didn't help me with relocation costs? And then someone comes in and buys and says, you're leaving because we want to do a remodel so we can make more money. Yet they can't help out a senior citizen who has contributed to this community for 42 years and they are just not even even moved into their place yet yet I'm out right. don't understand that right. thank you okay next speaker please I'm John McKelvey um, just to reiterate I think a lot of people are not necessarily opposed to reasonable rent stabilization but this was posted by Students United with Renters uh, on Thursday. Our opposition, Santa Cruz Together, has naturally put out a call to their right-wing property-worshipping base. We need community members to mobilize against this coalition of right-wing homeowners and real estate business giants that lies through its teeth to defend massive rental profits made on our backs. 
What many M opponents actually said was that they were not against some reasonable form of rent stabilization, period. Just cause eviction and the rent board were non-starters, including specifically trying to invalidate the end date of a rental agreement, which has now been added back into the proposed relocation payment ordinance. M supporters all say that just cause eviction is the only way of stopping evictions, just like they said rent control was the only way to provide community stability. These statements are wrong. Both sound, were soundly defeated at the polls. Just because one can't formulate an effective or fair set of rules doesn't justify passing a bunch of bad ones because they're easier to enforce. The city council, either outgoing or incoming, have zero mandate for enacting any part of Measure M. And as far as I'm concerned, if they don't substantially increase the construction of new housing of all kinds, we will see no improvement in affordability in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker, please. Yeah. Um, Mayor, City Council members, Gillian Greenside. I'm not a renter, nor am I a landlord. Uh, however, listening to the summary of uh, what was presented from the planning director, it seems to me very reasonable. And it seems reasonable if you come from the perspective of the goodness, the, I don't like using the word health, but the stability of our community, with 56% of renters demands some sort of protection. And so I would see it as the cost of doing business if you're a landlord that incorporate into your business plan two months rent relocation if that becomes necessary. Um, a couple of other thoughts. I understand that Measure M did lose. However, the same community elected two new council members who will be seated tonight who were strongly in support of Measure M. So I'd say the will of the community is a little bit less clear on this question. And uh, just a comment about the mutually agreed on contract. Uh, in the days when I was a renter, when I came to Santa Cruz in 1975, apart from the fact that a two bedroom house was $120 a month, the landlord sets the contract and you sign it because you don't have any other choice. So it's not quite an even playing field. So I'd encourage you to continue down this path and pass. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Tarazis and Council. My name is Jeffrey Smedberg. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see the wording in the uh, proposal that's before you, and I think that it really will actually help some tenants if you do uh, adopt it as is. Uh, the um, it is not, uh, it's not really just cause for eviction because there's no limitation on evictions. Landlords can still uh, tell people to leave. Uh, and most of the, um, the local non-corporate landlords who charge low rents and like to have tenants uh, stay long term because it's to their benefit, <laughs> These people will never face the the, uh, the need to pay this re relocation fee. In the cases when a family situation changes and uh, you know you, the landlord needs to move in a, themselves or a family member, um, if they are respectful to their tenants, they will realize the the. Um, big uh, upheaval in their life in them through no fault of their own being pushed out on the rental housing market and a couple of months rent is not that much uh, really. And there will be a benefit to those landlords who really do charge a lower rent because the two months is based on what they're charging. So that would be an incentive for those landlords to keep the rents low. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Neil Langholds. Um, I urge you to remove the amendment requiring two months rent for relocation if a mutual agreed upon lease is not renewed. Uh, this is unreasonable. This penalty seems to apply whether or not rent <coughs> is increased. If two parties mutually agree to a one year lease, why is there an unbalanced penalty at the end? Uh, the property owner is not responsible for any wrongdoing, just complying with contract law. 
I attended the city council meeting and the discussion of this amendment was very short and unclear. Uh, the public didn't uh, get any advance notice of this significant amendment. No written text was available in advance. Uh, the very short discussion might have meant both public and council members didn't understand what was voted on. It was hard to comprehend the language of this amendment. Uh, is the intent to confuse people? Please remove this amendment, which will make the affordable housing shortage worse. I hope the city council will remain transparent, transparent and careful, particularly when passing laws that affect housing, including those who rent out rooms to make ends meet. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, Jill Wynn, Santa Cruz landlord, senior and retired uh, low income person. <laughs> And um, I'm not going to repeat what's been said. I agree with what the uh, Santa Cruz Together uh, presentation said. Um, I just want to tell you a bit about my story. I, um, it's public record that my tenant from 2018 owes me $10,000. Um, and now it's news to you, but my current tenant knows that I plan to move into my home. And so you're talking about a $5,000 payment to my current tenant following this lack of funds from my prior tenant. And um, that's obviously a um, very uh, hurtful financial situation for me. So please don't pass this. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, I'm Nora Hawkman with the Movement for Housing Justice. And once again, hearing from the landlord community that they're okay with rent control, just not certain kinds of rent control. Haven't really heard what part of rent control they're okay with, but I imagine maybe we can get to that in the future. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, just to be kind of factual about the whole will of the voter thing. 51% of voters who cast votes in the city of Santa Cruz voted to repeal uh, Costa Hawkins, 51%. It's just a fact, it's not my opinion, look it up on votescount.com. Uh, Measure M was defeated, but 40% of city residents voted for rent control and that cannot be denied and it cannot be ignored. And then the cherry on top. We swept into office with two new candidates, one of whom was a top vote getter, both of whom ran openly supporting rent control. So there is still work to be done on behalf of tenants and you have to do it. You have to care enough to help tenants out. If landlords are owed $10,000 and then have to pay money to the next set of renters, they're gonna have to transfer some of those funds. I feel bad about the woman who's owed that money. But that's kind of the gig here. Once you become a landlord and you rent your property, you have now put it in the public square. It's. It can be regulated, it is regulated, it will be further regulated. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, thank you for your time. I am confused and I don't consider myself to be an uneducated person. I'm confused that we're here again talking about this matter because it was an issue where rent control is something we all can agree upon in our community. What's being argued is these absorbent costs that landlords are having to pay tenants. I am neither a landlord or a tenant. I help manage properties. I can tell you right now, properties are sitting empty because landlords are confused. They don't know what's coming down the pike and this is a very stressful situation for both tenants and landlords. We are now taking the time to make it impossible for landlords to make a profit and that is the whole point of owning real estate. If you don't own real estate, you don't understand the concept. It's an expensive 
expensive investment, especially in Santa Cruz. And when you invest in something, you are hoping to gain a profit. That is the point. You are not looking to lose money on an investment. We are all willing to help our community, but when you are looking to stifle one aspect of your community to help another, that is not a solution. And I hope our council today to can take into consideration that landlords are not heartless. Landlords are wanting to provide housing, but they need to do it in a way that they feel protected as well. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Itlali Aquino. I'm the Vice President of Internal Affairs for the Student Union Assembly at UCSC. Santa Cruz Together will giggle about it, but we are calling tomorrow eviction day. And it's not, it has nothing to do with the landlords and it has everything to do with our reality that tomorrow they will start retaliating against us. You can say that you only want a 5% increase in rent and seven after two years like you did last time you passed that. But if you don't enforce that, it doesn't matter. You have to make it so that if somebody breaks a law, they are punished for it. If you don't have these relocation fees, there's no punishment for when landlords violate things like the rent increases. And end of a lease is eviction. If you don't have a reason for ending the lease, then that's eviction. You're putting someone without a home for no reason other than to raise the rent. I. Have, I don't have sympathy for landlords who say that they're not making money because they are. After 30 years of being a landlord, you have a property that you paid no money on. I'm gonna have to use funds from my office to hire lawyers to protect students from these evictions and to go with them to small claims court because of because these landlords are gonna start kicking people out and I should be using that money on fun events on campus, on things for students like study nights during finals, which it is finals, but instead I'm here talking to you and I'm gonna have to spend an exorbitant amount of money protecting my students. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Chelsea Wagner. I'm an apartment complex owner. Um, honestly, the thing I'm confused about is if you have a lease that expires at a specific date, and the tenant refuses to leave, that's a breach of the lease. And according to what I heard, that you can then evict the person. Yet, there seems to be a conflict because now you're saying you're required to renew the lease. So I don't know which way it is. But personally, as an apartment complex owner, I'm not in the business of evicting people. And this fee is, is a fee that if I lose a tenant on a rent increase, okay, I can live with it. But if I'm a single family dwelling or an ADU, that's a huge amount of money. And I think that's going to be the people who are gonna suffer the most from this. And those are the renters, the landlords who are gonna leave the market. People like me are gonna say, yeah, whatever, somebody moved out, I'll move over to student rentals. And every two or three years, they're gonna be gone and I can go back up to market rates. So, good luck, make a decision. Thank you, next speaker. Hello, I'm not gonna say anything um, that has already been said. I just wanted to point out something, which is that not a lot of the people who have things to say about this are able to be here right now. And I think that just the timing of this on the agenda is a little unfair because no matter what side you are on about this issue, you have something to say about it. And a lot of the people who have things to say about it are people who are working or in school, like it's finals week. I know you can't affect finals, but it's just the time of day. People are at work, people are at school, and not many of us can be here right now to give our comments. And I don't think that's fair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before the next speaker comes up, is there any other members of the public who wish to speak to this item? This is item number 27. Okay, I'd like you to line up so we can see it on the left side. Any other members besides the three that are standing to my left? Are there any other, and, and Ernestina, who's in front and center? Um, okay, so there's four more members. Are there any other members of the public? Okay, sir, please go ahead. I have an extra 30 seconds since Mr. Condotti mentioned my letter. 
Um, no, you can't. Sorry. One, 90 seconds. Okay. Thank you, Council. Uh, good afternoon. I support the um, intent of the original amendment to deter and mitigate the effect of large rent increases. And I have to, um, I beg to differ with Mr. Gondotti. This amendment, and also Mayor Taras has mentioned that the meeting in July or June, it's actually got a longer history than that. It was first agendized on your February 13th meeting. And there was so much public outreach about this amendment, so much. I met several times with Council Member Chase, uh, Planner Harriman did great outreach. I gave him comments. In fact, a lot of the amendments that were inserted into the November 27th one were from me. I know they took those comments seriously. There was never one single notice or hint that anything other than a relocation payment amendment for large rent increases would be considered on November 27th. The Brown Act is designed to encourage public participation in government. We had absolutely no notice. In fact, not even during the public comment period on November 27th did anyone have any idea that anything other than a large rent increase would be subject to relocation payments. So I do not agree with Mr. Gondotti, even though I am not an attorney, um, I think he is wrong on this. I think that the notice provision of the Brown Act was not met, and whatever you think about the substance of this, and like I said, I do support the original intent, but that's not what you have here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and Go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. My name's Carol Long, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'm confused, too. Uh, I don't understand why these substantial matters are not being heard by the new council tonight instead of by the lame ducks, to put it frankly. Um, and I don't know if you can give me an answer on that. These are really important. The, the people have spoken that they favor some form of rent control because they have elected these new council members. And there is now a pro-rent control council majority, even though Chris Crone has been um, ruled unfit or unable to, <laughs> I'm sorry, not unfit, but unable to vote on this because he's a landlord. It, it's a ridiculous restriction. Everybody who needs housing has a financial stake in rent control. It, whether you rent uh, a room from someone, whether you rent a room to someone, whether you rent a house or an apartment to someone, or whether you have a house and might potentially rent it or whether you just need to rent something and have nothing. So um, I would like an explanation on that. I don't know why this is coming only before the uh, council that is outgoing and that there is nothing of substance for the new council to do tonight. I know they're willing and able to do it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, yes, hello. I also wanted to mention that I supported the original measure uh, before you, but I do not support the version uh, you were considering this afternoon. Uh, due to the jam-packed council agenda, I took the liberty of going over all of the public correspondence that was um, submitted to you for your review, and there were over 360 plus pages, and I counted as very informal tally, but I did subtract duplicate letters and those that were sort of ambiguous. There were 305 letters opposed to approving the measure that is before you today and six that were in favor. And I wanted to mention this data because I, I think that, you know, if we review the best practices that go from other cities that have gone before us in, in any uh, degree of rent control, and we insist on empirical data, I think it will lead to less confusion in the public and it will lead to greater compliance and diminished tension and vitriol in our community in general. And I think that's something that we could all agree would be of collective benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, is, are there any other members of the public besides Ernestina who would like to speak to this item? This is item number 27. Okay, ma'am, are you, are you wanting to speak to this? Okay, please step right up. <coughs> are there any other members of the public besides um, this individual and Ernestina who wish to speak? Okay, please go ahead. Uh, City Council, um, Coral Brown, 
resident of Santa Cruz. I, I had planned to come and speak. I uh, just uh, arrived and I assume that the, uh, uh, the uh, point, the, um, this is a second reading of the final. And I, I was at the uh, last meeting. I wasn't understanding how uh, it was all working. Um, the confusion that the public has sometimes, um, um, you know, there are exceptions. There's many people that studied all, all the uh, facts, and I'm sure Ernestina will, will present them. Um, what I don't understand <laughs> is why uh, the uh, the uh, the next phase is not allowed tonight. Why the agenda item will not be added for. Uh, considering any kind of uh, extension of what has originally planned. And what I'm saying is um, you need to consider all possibilities. I see uh, lots of people overflowing from the camps where I live. I have to go every day. Uh, it's just going to be if people are out in the street, they'll end up on the street. I mean, if they don't have a place to live, that's what's going to be happening all over. There's got to be some kind of uh, collective effort, consensus where people get together their values, make provisions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ernestina. Uh, good afternoon again. My name is Ernestina Saldana. And uh, um, I don't know if they can get you on the camera. I think you have to. Oh, do you want, him, do you want me there? He's got you. He's got you. He's got you. He's got you. Okay. Good. You're good. Stop it, Ben. Oh, okay. Hey, look at that. That's me. Okay. Now you see me. I can do. Um, I have a list of things that I was going to talk about uh, this thing about the mutual agreed lease and the pay too much to people who make too much or, or the costly to maintain the property, but I believe this is misunderstanding by the people who talk about this. So I'm not gonna be talking about it. And the hand and the other hand, what Jeffrey say I think was very important, and I'm gonna tell you a story why I think this is important. I have a friend who lives in Laibok. And um, her uh, landlord has only two units. When September comes, the landlords allow my friend to be late on her in, in uh, her uh, rent or to pay not the full amount, because when the taxes comes, she catch up. And that happens because this landlord knows that tenant, and they have a good relationship. That's the meaning of a good relationship. What we are seeing in here in Santa Cruz mainly is the um, mom and pop housing providers against the real estate moguls. And those real estate moguls who are laughing in the back, those are the ones who cannot have this kind of communication with the landlords, with the tenants, I'm sorry, because they don't know them. They live far away or they have so many units that it's impossible to know what is going on with each one. So I'm gonna urge you again, I did it just a couple of hours ago, but I'm gonna urge you again to please, before you leave Detroit you who are living, do something for the community who is here. Thank you. That closes out the uh, public comment period on this item and I'll bring it back to council. Um, I had a couple questions that I wanted to lead off with, and um, I think first of all, I know one part of the, uh, um, I think it was the revised ordinance had to do with making changes by resolution, and I wanted to ask you about that because obviously we we have this uh, long public discussion about um, you know changes in the ordinance. How does that impact whenever there's changes that are made when you use, um, you know, make resolution changes, um, or ordinance changes by resolution to have the opportunity to have public comment or testimony to see what those impacts are. And I'd just like to pose that because that's how I read the current uh, version where it looks that future changes can be by resolution. Well, um, the distinction is that in order to adopt an ordinance, you have to have a first reading, publish the ordinance or a summary of the contents of the ordinance, and then bring it back at a subsequent meeting for final adoption. So there's more of an opportunity for public process than a resolution, which would have to be part of a, of a 
an appropriately noticed city council agenda, but it could be done at one and the same meeting. So the, the version that was presented at Loudon Nelson Center, well, first of all, the version that was um, reviewed by the city in February that was referred to the housing committee, did that have changes by resolution? Hi, Sarah Fleming, principal planner with the planning department. Um, as far as I understand, I had just started then, but no, I believe that the resolution piece was added after the September 11th meeting. So you may, council may recall that we did have a meeting on September 11th that happened after the community meeting uh, in July. Then this item was continued. After that meeting is when the bit by resolution was added. And so when we brought that back to council on the 27th, it was a part of that um, based on the conversation that we had heard from the community with the concerns about the um, uh, the th rent thresholds. So, so, okay, so the September 11th that we didn't take action on that got referred to November 27th, that's the incorporated the, um, the, the, the resolution uh, or the ordinance uh, changes by that resolution. That is correct, that okay. is correct. And what was the basis of that? Why, who recommended that? Was that something we heard from the public or was it something we heard from staff? It was a response uh, by staff to the concerns we had heard by public and by council that um, if we locked into the 10% and 15%, how would we modify that if the market changed? And so um, staff worked with the city attorney to propose uh, a way for us to be able to do that. Um, and I, that's where it came from. Any other questions right now? Okay, Council Member Matthews. Um, obviously, uh, uh, we're not able to act on this uh, current version we have before us uh, as a second reading. I, I think it's true that the public um, at the previous meeting had not a clue that it was gonna be expanded in the way that it, it was. I think that's a legitimate uh, point. Uh, I am quite uh, prepared to uh, make a, uh, introduce a, an ordinance, a first reading that we go back to the original, very simple, limited um, expression, which um, I think no one believes will solve problems, but it will be a, um, a small assistance for those tenants who do have a very large increase um, to uh, give them a little cushion for relocating, that was that was really the only intent of that. Um, it was widely agreed upon, and I think it serves some function uh, in that capacity. I have no doubt that there will be a vigorous discussion about many, many other aspects of rent stabilization, renter protections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, going forward in the coming months. So um, I would like to see us go forward on this very limited step that does give some assistance. Um, it, um, it doesn't automatically mean that every uh, rental increase will result in people moving, but you know, we all heard enough stories My my, rent went up by some extravagant amount, and I just had 30 days notice. And that is a lot. That's that's a huge amount to react to. So uh, uh, I would feel very comfortable just going forward, back to our original or ordinance, um, limited uh, two months reimbursement for those tenants who get a rent increase above a certain amount, uh, if they give the la the uh, landlord uh, notice that they are unable to accept that rental increase, then they get the relocation assistance. Um, I would be willing to consider also, uh, given the point that the mayor raised, um, uh, when we bring that back as a first reading that we have uh, future changes in the percentages um, done again by ordinance amendment rather than by resolution. I see this as it's gonna be a very volatile um, topic for a good time coming. So I, uh, I think that just builds a little more public process into it. I appreciate that, I'll, I'll second that motion. And I, I guess one of the things I'd like to- Could you define what the original thing was that we're talking about? I think um, five percent, seven percent. Yes, five. Uh, five. The large. Can you read the numbers or maybe the letters or something so we can. The. Uh, oh, it's okay. it says. No, let's, maybe maybe if the staff you have the original one you could put up. Can you put up the original one? 
original meaning September 11th or November 27th? Oh, the September 11th one is, wasn't that what was presented on November 27th? No. Okay. On November 27th, there were modifications that included uh, changing the uh, rent increase threshold from 10% um, and 15.5% over any two consecutive years to 5% uh, yes. or 7% over two what consecutive I'm years. About. Yeah. Right. And then uh, we changed the. Um, Oh no, that was happened at the end of the meeting. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was a so I, very I, limited and very straightforward. I would process. be happy to um, walk the council through the changes that were made at the meeting so that you could make a motion to adopt the ordinance with those additional changes omitted. Yeah. Why not just start from the the original one rather than I think go you could do that as well. I mean, that's essentially what you'll be doing. Yeah. I mean, why? In the I think interest the of time, the planning director is trying to pull that up on the screen. Oh, okay, so we can understood. Council um, Councilmember Brown. It's really not that complicated. The um, <laughs> the, the motion is to bring back uh, for uh, this is a first reading. Yeah. The language stripping the additional language regarding the. Um, uh, for the purposes of rent increases, uh, so, the, so the, the provision that was added that we watched on the PowerPoint at our November 27th meeting. So going back to simply saying uh, the only change would be from 10 and 15 percent to 5 and 7 percent. And as, as the future, thresholds and future, future modifications. be done by right, ordinance resolution. amendment. So, so to be, to be specific here, you would be deleting the red lines from paragraphs 010 um, on subsection E of section 020, you would be deleting, go back up, please. I, I have them highlighted in yellow here. I think it's just Further, in two please. places. Subsection A, you would be deleting everything after this, uh, the last semicolon, you'd be deleting that language. Um, yes. Continue. Go go back up again, if you could, please. You'd be up further. You'd be leading, deleting that red section or tenants. Oh no, that I, that stays. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was my mistake. Uh, you want. So this is the. Um, November 27th oh, okay. version. Fine, fine. Not this is the November 27th yeah. version. So there have been things added. There was a section added into 010 that referenced the um, the terminating the rental termination yeah. rental yeah, agreement. So that's Thank not you. There. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're hearing also deleting the um, allowances right. to make changes by resolution. And then this section, um, uh, there was a section here. Um, that um, also specified um, that tenants who are relo who are requested to leave uh, for reasons other than breach of lease. So that's not showing here because this is the November 27th version. So you would be going back to this for this. So that's my portion. motion is to uh, present as a first reading the original um, language the only further change being that future changes are made by ordinance amendment rather than resolution. If you just omit the oh, language okay. referring to um, by resolution, then it's okay. Yeah, that then would be the, okay, the effect of that. Councilmember Brown. I'd like to make a substitute motion that yeah. we um, uh, move this, the current uh, version as a first reading uh, with directions to staff to bring it back to us as is for a second reading in January. Right. Second. Okay, there's a motion by Councilmember Brown and second by Councilmember Crone to move the what's before us as a fir uh, first reading. Um, and then that would come back in January for um, further council action. Is there any discussion? Oh, we'll just have to uh, first vote up or down on that. Um, I, can I just say, Mayor, too, that, yeah. um, you know, renters are asked for first, last, and security deposit. It seems to me that that money can be, you know, if you're going to, you know, it can be transferred to the tenants who are, the, who, are, who are being booted out or leaving because you, they have to have family members move in. So, you know, there's hardships if they, you know, on both sides. I mean, it, it just, it, and, and those two things equal out. So um, I, I would hope folks could consider that. 
Any further discussion? I, I'm, I seconded the, mo the main motion. I'll, I'll, I remain comfortable on that because I, does, I do believe it follows and provides some process in terms of a review and the opportunity for the public to weigh in on what those impacts are. Um, so I, I, I've heard from people that do want the opportunity to, to, um, to understand what this is, and I think it's important for the council to understand what the potential impacts are on our housing. So I, I'm not gonna support that motion. I have one additional comment. It seems to me that, um, you know, taking, you know, we just uh, voted 5-2 uh, to approve a development project with hundreds and hundreds, I mean, really thousands of pages of, you know, a very complex information that we were supposed to digest um, without a thought about it. But we're talking about two sentences here. I don't think it's that complicated. I think this is just... Um, a chance for the opposition to um, to oppose it, and if we'd have to delay for a new council, then so be it. But I don't see why we couldn't just say we've now had time; it's been publicly noticed. Um, you get an extra twenty, however many days, and then you know uh, there it is. There's plenty of time to figure out what two sentences change means. So uh, you know, I just don't think that's that's not a persuasive argument to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, so there's a motion on the floor by Councilmember Brown, seconded by uh, Councilmember Crone. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. 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 Okay, wow. that motion um, fails with Councilmember Crone and Councilmember Brown wow. supporting it. Um, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Chase, Councilmember Norian, and Vice Mayor Watkins opposed. So we'll go back to the main motion. Um, Councilmember Matthews um, made, I seconded. Is there any further discussion on that item? Just very briefly. Um, I think the reason to go forward with this version is it does a little something. And we're going to be uh, dealing with many more possibilities going forward. But the component about requiring two months payment at the conclusion of a rental agreement to me is quite a different animal and much more complex. And uh, I'd, I'd rather go forward with something clean that we can do in the shorter term as we explore all the other possibilities. Okay, and um, I will say, is there any other further discussion? Okay, let's put this to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no. That uh, passes with Council Member Matthews, Council Member Chase, Council Member Noroyan, Vice Mayor Watkins, and myself in favor, Council Member Crone, and Council Member Brown opposed. Done. Okay, so um, next up, we have, we've had a fairly lengthy agenda today, and we have two um, substantive items that still remain. And I first, before we get on to the next one, we, we have um, homelessness update and ADU ordinance updates. And in my opinion, I think we only have time for one. And so I wanted to, I, I mean, I have my opinion on which one is a priority. Motion to continue the uh, ADU until uh, first meeting in January. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on one second. <coughs> it, it's too loud. Is that what you're saying? Okay, we're going to wait for a minute while people are exiting. I don't think hey, it's Excuse me. If we could, um, yeah, thanks. We're just... Transition. Okay, so um, Council Member Crone made a motion to continue uh, the ADU. Uh, um, item number 29. Item number 29. Um, is there, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to support that. I, I'll second that for discussion purposes. Okay? I, I, I prefer to discuss the homelessness matter. Um, I think that's the biggest priority right now, and that's, for me, in my opinion, where I'd like to kind of uh, land on the remainder of our discussion. Is there any further discussion? I, I mean, I think, sure. Okay. Yeah, because everyone else is talking. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Can we, can we get the motion restated? Um, planning director has a question about whether or not the motion was to um, continue it to a date certain. Okay. Right, just just for re-noticing purposes. Um, I, heard, I heard it to date. date I'm, I missed it with the commotion. Sorry. Well, what was the motion? Was it to continue to the? Well, to be fair to the new council members, possibly maybe the second reading, uh, continue to the uh, second meeting in January, which is um, the twenty third, twenty second. Twenty. Is that the second meeting in January? Do you, do you have the calendar? 
Fine. Yeah. Second. 20 second. Okay. And again, I'll second that. I'd, I'd like to discuss the homelessness item now. Any further discussion? I mean, I will just, if I may, yeah. would just say that, you know, this is now the third, this would now be the third time that we've told the public and the community that we're going to talk about this item yes. that we're moving. This would now, if we were to not have this item heard today, this would then be the third time we would um, tell the public we would be hearing and deliberating the item and not following through on that. So although I realize both topics are very important, I feel to be sort of in integrity with what we said we were going to do this t this afternoon that that feels appropriate to hear that item specifically personally. Okay, so I'd like to hear from each of the council members. Council Member Chase. Yeah, I was just going to say the exact same thing. So this would be the third time we had people who came last time and said that they took time off work to be here to speak to us because it was rescheduled from the previous meeting. Now we're doing it again. It, that just to be fair to the public, that doesn't seem right. Council Member Brown. Oh. I'm, I, um, you know, I don't have a really strong opinion one way or another, to be honest. Um, but I do agree that, you know, we have now continued this item several <laughs> times. Um, and um, I also think that given that, well, I guess maybe I have a question for staff, but it appears to me that since the homeless um, services update is really not an action item, that that could happen in another way. Um, but if that is going to interfere with anything that you all need to do for us, because it's not an action item, I assume we're just hearing from you now um, and you want to hear our thoughts, but we can do that some in some other fashion. Um, so is that going to is that going to interfere with your your moving forward if we do ADU now and wait on the homeless right. update? No, we uh, we uh, did uh, intend to have some uh, recommendations for you, some of which would be coming back in January. In any case, uh, the one item though that what we can just continue to work on, and I think uh, I think it'll be fine, and and that is to. Uh, we're talking with the Homeless Services Center about the poly loft and uh, continuing that because they anticipate having to, to close that pretty soon. But we can obviously work with them and bring that back to you in, in January. I think, I think we can do that. Yeah, well, yeah, well we just want to have some discussion first and I'll open it up. So, Council Member Matthews. I'm fine going forward. I'm going to make a radical thought that we try and be pretty efficient in our comments and I'm going to speak to both council members and the public. I mean, easy for all of us to <laughs> go on <laughs> but if we're pretty focused I you want to try and go it. both okay then we'll yeah. so, okay then we'll carry on Ooh, with okay. the homelessness I, I discussion we're do it, but, okay. but I, I do think it's important to do the ADU that's been bumped and bumped and bumped and bumped so mm -hmm. we I know I see order. members of the public that are here for the homelessness item I know that um, mm -hmm. and so I I guess um, well that's yeah. Mm -hmm. let's, so I'd like any members of the public that, that wish to speak to the item about postponing, please just be brief, like 30 seconds. I, I'd urge you to postpone it. I've been here for each of the times it's gotten bumped, but we got a heads up that it possibly wouldn't be get, gotten to today because of the late hour. The ADU ordinance affects the whole of Santa Cruz, I think to put it under, let's speak quickly, uh, is doing it a disservice. I've, I just don't think that's fair to the public, so I'd urge you to postpone that one and not try and cram two important items Postpone in. the ADU. Postpone the ADU, yes. Yeah. So or maybe you could ask how many are here to speak to the yeah. ADU. Yeah. Okay. You know, they give you a sense of uh, the, did people come out or did they really think you weren't going to get to it anyway? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let me, let, I will do that. How many people are here to speak on the homelessness issue? The homelessness issue. Okay, how many are here to speak to six people? How many are here to speak on the ADU issue? Well, you just asked to postpone it, and so. Um, how many people are here to speak to the ADU issue that do not wish to postpone it? Three. Oh, four. That do not wish to postpone it? Two. Two, two people. Three. No. three. Okay. All right. I'll bring one, it back here. Actually, two. one and one agnostic. Yeah, one was agnostic. Okay. So we'll bring it back for discussion. <laughs> yeah, serving. Um, I know. So I mean, I think we'll carry. I I'll, I agree with Slow Councilmember up. Matthews. Let's um, maybe we carry on and go, get into the homelessness, and we'll see where we are. Is that, okay, is that fair? Okay. So, so, we so have to, don't we have a motion? No, I'm going to pull. Yeah, you want to pull your motion back? We'll continue on to homelessness and then reconsider it. 
Are, are you are you thinking that we're, are we going to talk for an hour on homelessness and then uh, rush ADUs through? I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Let's let's carry on. No. Uh, Okay, I'll withdraw my motion then, okay. I guess. Okay, then we're moving on to the item of, um, this is item number 28, the homelessness update. And I'll call up um, Assistant City Manager, Tina Scholl. Good afternoon, Mayor Tarasas, Council Members. Um, Tina Scholl, Assistant City Manager, and coming around to you right now is a copy of the PowerPoint presentation as well as the agenda report. It's about 12 pages and sometimes it's easier to follow along in paper. And what I will do is today was largely an update, so Council Member Brown is correct, but I will go very rapidly through the update section so we can get to the, the sheltering and the action, which I know Council is eager to sink your teeth into. So today was being brought forward as sort of a year and summary, a recap on all the actions around homelessness because it has been a long year. There's been lots of um, lots of action, lots of discussions, lots of things going forward, a very iterative process. So we plan to talk about four different topics this afternoon. The first being a policy and, pro, a policy and homeless coordinating committee progress report, talking about the state funding opportunity, sheltering actions, and then the council also did direct some topics come to this meeting under homelessness as well. So the first one, and again, I'll move swiftly through this. So as a reminder to the council and the community, homelessness has been a chief aspect of the city's work plan. Um, we've talked at length about the magnitude of the issue and the challenge in Santa Cruz, the need to do things. So it does appear in your work plan under a strategic goal to public safety and well-being. It, there's a description here as well as some projects. And so that really has been driving our work. Secondarily, um, the council formed a subcommittee in 2016 called the Homelessness Coordinating Committee, and Cynthia Chase, Rochelle Naroyan, and Pam Comstock served on that, and you're all familiar with this. This came to council in 2017 for final adoption, the report and recommendations, and there were 20 recommendations in that with the focus on the visible adult unsheltered population. We good with the handouts? Uh, one packet was missing this report, okay. so we're okay. just getting oh, that out. I just want to make sure there's copies. I have, a, I have a hard copy, so here's another one. I oh, have we all we have it. Show. Okay, we all have it then. The okay, we all have it. I'll staple next time, I apologize. <laughs> I just want to make sure that you have all the materials you need. And, and we've talked about this in the past, so these they're all very familiar with you, and as well uh, appended to the report was a summary of the recommendations. And here on the next couple of slides, I just have um, a similar chart to what you've seen in the past, showing that on the short-term recommendations, a great deal of progress has been made. Um, 13 of the 20, there's been, they're either complete or their substantial work. And also I'll note that as time passes, some things ebb and flow on these as well. And there's, there is more to be done. So it continues to be something we work toward, but we have dug into quite a number of these and, and have some results um, to show. I won't go through each of these now. Um, and then um, also in the long horizon, there's been a lot of work on trying to move toward a permanent shelter. And you're all uh, very familiar with that. And then another thing I want to just uh, make the council and community aware of as a reminder is that we're also doing all this work operating under this policy statement that we will work um, with efforts that seek equal participation from all jurisdictions. So that's been a factor in these conversations. Santa Cruz isn't moving forward alone. It's moving forward in conjunction with the other jurisdictions and within the, the HAP structure as well. And that can add to layers of complexity, more conversations, but that has been our policy direction on that. So I'm moving right along. Um, the next one is just a quick update on the state funding, the cash and heat programs. And we've been alluding to this funding opportunity um, since about, I think, July or August when we first caught wind of it as being a reality. And we've worked very, very quickly, feverishly to understand what are these programs? How is this money available to us? How do we access it? What's the process? It's, it's fairly complicated. But to summarize, um, there's about $500 million surplus in the state 
state. We're grateful that the California legislature agreed to disperse this across the state of California. And the way this is distributed is it, it's going across the state to the COCs. And the COC, again, for those who may not know, is a continuum of care. That's an organizing policy group required by the federal government to access funds. So it's basically um, here, it's the county, all the governments, providers, anyone who's interested, there's different levels of it. But it's just this organizing policy and service body that handles it. And that's that's another conversation. But anyway, that, so that state money is coming through the COC. The county is the administer of that. But all of the jurisdictions have a say in how these things are happening. And the money is coming through two programs. There's CASH, which is the California Emergency Solutions and Housing Program. And then there's HEAP, the Homeless Emergency Aid Program. And you can see the, the numbers there. To do a quick side-by-side -side on these funding programs, you can see, again, the, the amount of money coming to Santa Cruz County. So this is the total amount coming to our county and the eligible uses. And there are, there's a lot of overlap there um, with services and you know, rental assistance subsidies and capital on the HEAP. Uh, again, with the intent that these are emergency one-time monies and to be used really for emergency purposes. Now, what's tricky is if you look at the last row in this table is the expenditure deadline. So cash funds should be spent within five years, heap she was spent within two years. So that's a really tall order, if you think about it, to figure out a way to spend $9.7 million within two years in the most effective way across the county. It's a great opportunity, but it has um, taken some time in planning. So to, we were aware that there was funding availability, but then we had to get into actually applying for the block grant to the state. And we had to submit to the state um, a, a spending plan that says how we propose to spend this money on a percentage basis across the, the bullets. You see they're under cash and heap. So to do that, there was a number of uh, community engagement exercises and workshops that have taken place since September. Five have actually have taken place in September across the county. So, and some of you participated in some of those, and it really has been a big effort to try to figure out how as a county do we respond to this opportunity and best position ourselves for regional and localized optimal results. So as a result of that, not going into all the detail, this is the draft spending proposal for the cash and heap funds. And um, the cash has already, that, that um, submittal went into the state, it was due October 15th, as you saw on a prior slide. And the heap, we anticipate submitting that application um, by December 14th, so that's uh, later this week for those funds. And so you can see the various percentage breakdowns. The heap was, that percentage um, breakdown was an aggregate of looking at Santa Cruz, the county, and Watsonville together. So that really is a blended percentage. And then you can see the total funding that's coming in for each of these categories. And then so the next steps on this, I already referenced that the block grant application was submitted, will be submitted within a couple of days. Um, we then have the big task of developing an RFPs. So what the state is asking the COCs to do is to actually issue requests for proposals and say, we want to buy this particular service, this particular initiative, this model, whatever it is we want to buy. And the figuring out that what it is we want to buy, will, it will be the topic of a big conversation. So there is a lot of design process conversations happening around that, as well as we are setting up briefings with all of the council members. We need your input um, on that as well. And we've been, um, I personally have been meeting with staff from across the city so I can get a sense of what our frontline folks that work with homeless individuals or deal with the impacts of homelessness, what they would recommend. So we're trying to gather all this feedback, again, figure out on a countywide scale how we develop this. And we're trying to turn this around about within a month. So we get the RFPs on the street, we have a period, and we hope the selection of March and April to get the money out there as quickly as possible. Again, that we're under that two year, that two year period. So when we sit down, we can talk in more depth, but I wanted to just make you aware of where we are. Okay, and the bigger um, discussion, this is about sheltering. So this is a somewhat of a complicated chart. Um, this corresponds to in the agenda report when we provide a table of all the significant homeless actions. Um, your council has been talking about this issue nearly every meeting for the entire year in some form or fashion. So it has been in front of you a lot. And also um, things that move very rapidly just to the nature of it's a, it's a difficult challenge. Um, there's partnerships, there's siting, there's funding. There are operating models. There's uh, so much to work out, um, and it's really been 
a, a tremendous effort. But just to summarize in brief, where we've gone from mid-December, so mid-December of last year around this time, <coughs> we were grappling with the encampment in San Lorenzo Park. And um, we were looking around and saying, how do, we, how do we deal with this in a better way? And we looked at the city of San Diego who had had this three-tiered model, this three-phase model to move from a managed campground, which I personally did visit in San Diego and worked very well around Thanksgiving of last year, um, and then moving to an interim shelter and then phase three. So this is all familiar to the council. So we started this work in mid-December. The council declared a shelter crisis in January. By the way, that shelter crisis declaration has made us be able to access the cash and heat money. That's an unanticipated but positive benefit of you declaring that is we did it early. The county in Watsonville then did it like in October. They said they followed on later, but that made us eligible for this funding. Um, in February, you officially supported this three-phase plan to get to achieve that permanent navigation center, which again is something that was in the homelessness courting committee recommendation as a permanent or a, a long horizon solution. Um, and then in April, we, we've, you know, so we we did this. We got the camp open on February 26, and then we've working on the interim shelter model. And you recall those council discussions and meetings and all the community engagement on that. So we presented sites to you in April. You directed us to pursue six months at the arm of the four sites available. We learned weeks later the armory wasn't available. So we had to shift course again and, and work. So we, we've had a lot of this. We're down a path, dead end. Try another path, dead end. So we did a lot of that through the spring. Um, and then we uh, got to June. And the camp was only supposed to operate for four months through June. And then in June, we thought, let's let's try a little bit longer. We, we had some potentially promising work we were working on. We're hearing this glimmer of state money possibility. Let's keep working. So we asked for an, or an extension into August to see if we could work it out over the summer. And, and then in August, um, we, after working through July and the month of August, we, we were not able to come up with a feasible, viable model that quickly. And it was a huge disappointment, and we hoped we could. At that same time, we also realized, though, that since all of this work from the HAP had been invested in finding this phase two, this interim um, site and facility, we didn't have a plan for winter shelter. We didn't have um, an operator, we didn't have a site, and so we said, okay, let's, let's just continue to operate the winters, or I'm sorry, the River Street Camp into April of next year so we have some sort of shelter. However, we, no one felt it was optimal at the time. Um, so we came to this council at the end of August and we presented this as part of the North County Winter Shelter Plan to keep the camp going till April and to expand it, to explore uh, safe parking, um, and also to see if we can get expanded capacity in the Homeless Services Center. And council said, yes, we'll do that. And then in, and something to note too is, this gets a little confusing, but the city operated the camp and funded the camp all the way through June for four months. Once we hit July in the new fiscal year, it became a program of the HAP, meaning that even though we are the operator, it was a program that was funded by the county, the city of Scotts Valley and Capitola to serve as a bridge solution. At that time, we didn't realize it was a bridge solution. Again, everything's moving and changing every week, but, but it, it wasn't just our program at that time. But um, everyone is supportive of continuing with it because we didn't have another option. And then in September, it turned out that an operator came forward, the Salvation Army, very grateful for that, as did a facility. And all the jurisdictions were talking about this, and the pref this very strong preference was to have indoor winter shelter. Thinking about the rain and the cold, and you have an option, where, where do we think um, vulnerable individuals should be? And also the public health officials were also very concerned about the camp and the wet and the cold, and, and we were very concerned about how we're gonna keep the camp intact, keep it dry, keep it warm. So this manifested as an option and it moved forward. And so in October, there was you know, discussion that um, the funders had wanted their funding to shift to the indoor physical site. And we agree in terms of outcomes for these individuals and the camp phased out. And in that, um, we readily acknowledged things moved really fast on a staff level, coordinating across the, um, coordinating across all the cities. And while we were doing updates, we didn't have a deliberate council conversation until like the ship had sailed somewhat on that. So uh, I just want to acknowledge that, that we were acting in best, in good faith and trying to do the best that we could to provide um, the best sort of shelter model. And again, it wasn't a sole city decision. All of the other funders really felt this was a better model.
So, so the city supported at that time? At that we time. did, we did absolutely, because we felt we have individuals here who are, are vulnerable, and we were terrified. How are we gonna keep this dry? How are we gonna keep this warm? How are we gonna keep the tents not from blowing away? And in fact, that bore out just the next weekend after we closed, we had a very, very windy weekend. It was about three weekends ago, and just tents would have blown, it would have been um, a real problem. So we felt that people had um, a better outcome. And then also during, it's a different model. So during the day, um, people in the river, or in the winter shelter, people during the day are, you know, leave. But, and we were concerned about that because at the camp you have the option to stay. However, we learned from experience that a lot of our campers left during the day anyway. So, you know, we, you know, it's, it's, it's where we are. A quick and we question, continue to move um, forward. About funders, when you say funders, who, the, who are the funders? Absolutely, it's the county of Santa Cruz, the city. Um, Capitola and Scotts Valley fund the North County Shelter. But the camp that was on 1220 River Street, what, who were those funders? Those are the funders. Okay. Yeah. And, and who sits on the committee from the city staff? Who attends those meetings that was part of that deliberation? Sure, um, so that was the HAP executive. There's three layers to the HAPs, the HAP executive committee, and those are the executives of the different jurisdictions. So you had Martine and myself were there. Susie was at that meeting as well. Um, we had city managers from Capitola Watsonville and the assistant county administrative officer, as well as other county staff. Their um, executive level. Just if I could, um, back when we were looking at the the shelter, we talked about knowing that we were going to get these funds or be eligible for these funds from the state, um, requesting reimbursement for our participation or our development of a temporary emergency shelter. What was the outcome of that review? Thanks for that question. Um, reimbursement's not eligible. Okay. Yeah. So it's only prospective expenses. Um, and then I, I do want to be mindful of time. The River Street Camp, um, as, as been reported before, has had very positive outcomes. Um, we ended up having a total of 130 persons served and 56% moving on to improved um, living circumstances. So you can just see this, this table here. Um, some went into SUD treatments or sober living environments. Some went into vehicles. Um, not ideal, but improved. Um, and then 32 went into transitional supportive per permanent uh, or mental health housing, homeward bound, some people availed themselves of that, and then just 14 went over to winter shelter. And what we found, our experience is that when the closure was announced, that was actually um, a, a real motivator for people to get very serious about their housing plans. And so we found this natural attrition from about 50 something odd people down to when we started actually closing it, we had about 40 people um, in the River Street camp at that point. So. So the outcomes were positive. We think it is a really intriguing model to consider for the future. And so then moving on to the North County Winter Shelter. Um, so I, I kind of went through this, this summary is that the River Street Camp was proposed to serve as the winter shelter. And um, along with that direction, there was talk of safe um, parking. That proposal was tabled. <laughs> And then also the expansion of beds at HSC was explored but not pursued, mostly because of cost for the number of beds at this time. And we thought maybe this could be a good heap um, opportunity for us to discuss. And I talked about how an operator and a site emerging and then the preference for indoor. However, this council has made abundantly clear um, to us as staff, and we agree with you and the HAP agrees that we want more shelter options and we've been working on those. And so that's what we want to talk to you about today. I think Martine will present on this. Before we go there, I, I just want to, I have a question regarding that last slide. Do, when it was tabled, is that the HAP tabling it? Who's tabling it? Just that there's no viability to The handle. operator. So it was a nonprofit operator. Okay. The question about the HAP, have you all contemplated having elected officials from the various cities on that HAP as well? Well, and that gets to the question of governance. And we've talked about that a little bit too, and we're in agreement that we need to find a better way to manage homelessness policy and services and distribution across the county. So that is also another topic of conversation. And yes, I think elected officials need to be part of that conversation. I think that there needs to be it across the county. So, it, I mean, your council is very involved in this issue and talks about it a lot, and we're in the paper about it a lot, because you're very active in it. But, uh, but it affects everyone across the county. So we do want to see some changes and are starting those conversations. Just on that too, I, I had uh, mentioned it to one of the you know local uh, local papers, but you know there was an article in the paper yesterday about or this morning about mm -hmm. homelessness, and 
you know, it discusses the cities, all the cities' efforts. So in terms of, you know, how this is being looked at regionally, I, I really do feel that is key to kind of get, you know, buy-in as a kind of a unified voice that this is a critical issue for all the entire region and not just maybe the impacts that we're seeing here in the city. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to um, clarify too, um, how much is the, uh, this is like, 11, 12 million dollars that's going to go uh, to the house? About 10.6 million. How much has it been in the past? Like, how, how much has gone through the house? Zero. So before, we might receive grants from HUD of maybe on the order of one or two million dollars, but that's distributed through another process like right to the services. So this really is a unique, pivotal, game-changing opportunity. And the reason is I, I'd like to see them brown acted too because I get questions from the public and they're wondering like, oh, it's just a way of like, have some transparency and, and have people know how we're spending this money and people can come to the meetings and see what's going on, um, make their case. That's great. Just as a follow-up, when you talk about that they've had never had money that's flowed through there before, they, they have had uh, money that comes through from state grants, right, because the HAP is the one that's determining how they spend those funds. Um, no, I think you're referring to county and their pass-through monies. No, well, what, what did the HAP do? What was their role? Well, did, they had no money management? The HAP would get maybe one or two million dollars from federal grants from HUD, and those would be distributed, and those are support going to... Um, current homeless services providers, and I know we got some money to help launch the coordinated entry program as well, but it's not been something that jurisdictions have touched as a ground game opportunity like this is. So this really is a different a different animal. So the, the HAP is really a legacy from the continuum of care federal process. And so in that process, typically what would happen every year is that there'd be grants available. The federal government required this process whereby really the service providers got together with a consultant that was led by the county where they worked together to come up with uh, applications uh, and they would try to get as much funding as they could for a variety of, of homeless programs. Uh, and so every year, I think they obtained about a million to $2 million a year for a variety of different homeless programs that primarily went to a variety of nonprofit profit organizations in our county. Uh, in addition, so that was really the, the basic purpose for it. The executive committee tended to uh, essentially just approve because it really came from the subject matter experts in terms of what they were going to apply for and and, uh, and and the executives mostly just obviously agreed with that uh, in, in, in order to be able to apply for the grants. So it was really just the mechanism to apply for grants primarily. The other uh, function that they had was a winter shelter and funding the winter shelter. So those were really the two key pieces. However, we're in different times now and I think there is a general recognition that with respect to governance and everything that uh, has changed with respect to the need for homeless services, there has to be a change. I think there's agreement with that. Uh, and there were some talks that were begun as part of that process with the council, the two by two committee, for example, but those have not concluded. They need to continue to happen and decisions do be, need to be made about what form should uh, be in place in the future for the governance of homeless uh, services in our region. So that is a question that needs to be answered. Okay. All right. So with that, as uh, as Tina mentioned, uh, we uh, and there's a desire to continue to work on trying to increase uh, shelter capacity, particular uh, indoor capacity, uh, and even with our last set of recommendations uh, and uh, with the closure of the River Street Camp, we've continued to to do that. And so we do have some specific recommendations here that we'd like you to to uh, consider and provide feedback on. Uh, again, things that we've been working on on an ongoing going basis as as, uh, as early as uh, as yesterday, uh, and I'll go over these one by one. There's five. The first is to again through the HAP process uh, and the winter shelter program uh, to, and I've mentioned this in the past too, that we'd like to try to increase capacity by opening a emergency shelter for women, families, and mobility impaired individuals with about 40 beds over at the Laurel Street Salvation Army. And so we'd like the council uh, to provide some direction on whether you'd like us to, pr uh, to pursue that. Uh, now we have some operating issues that we have to work out. Uh, so this would give us direction to, to do that and bring that back to you with respect to cost and with respect to how that operating model would work in order to address some of the potential uh, public uh, safety or other concerns in the immediate neighborhood. So that's the first one. Any questions on, on that one? Is there any sort of public outreach or any sort of 
discussion that would take place before that? I mean, because I know last year we talked about that and there was some, there was some concerns. Yeah, we would, certainly, we would certainly do that, particularly uh, people want to know what the, what the operating model, because I think, uh, you know, it is, it is true that the shelters can operate with very little impact and we have examples of that. I mean, the current winter shelter program, for example, uh, operating on 7th Avenue operates with uh, little impact. The River Street should, uh, camp did, did that as well. So we would have to do some of that, I think. Well, and this would be the third year it would be at Laurel, right? If, if uh, it was approved? This is the third year, but it's a very different model, yeah. mm -hmm. different population, um, smaller size. And we did have some uh, issues that have cropped up in the past, so we'd have to uh, address those. Um, so there is a little bit of, uh, yes. there is some history there with having some issues. And that had to do with the, the facility is, uh, th because the, it's used for other purposes, so it's not consistently available every night, and also the meal service. So the, the other recommendations kind of get to that. So we just have to figure out a way to uh, operate it without those impacts of how to provide the meal service and how to address those days where they are not, it's not available. The benefit is that this isn't our first time there. We've been in the neighborhood before and we have some lessons learned. So we know correct. that there's things to learn from, from that. Correct, and correct, before. correct. And hence uh, recommendation number two, which is to, you know, again, authorize that we look at city facilities to to, to host the meal service because uh, we were hosting this at the Lot Nelson that became uh, problematic. And so we would look at alternative sites to do that again, and to work it out uh, so that it, it is compatible, but works with the shelter program. That's number two. Quick question about number one, um, just the, the 40 bed target. How, how did you come up with that? And what are we, you know, data driven, you know, what, what, what are we basing it on? Or is it that just what the city can do right now and that's our capacity? Well, well there are currently 60 beds with the, the, the VFW based um, winter shelter. And traditionally we've had about 100 beds. Last year we got up to 110. And so that seemed to be a goal and it'd be an issue of let's try to at least replicate what we've done in years past. So we're starting with 40. There's actually additional space within the facility, but we're being mindful of impacts as well to the community. And so we want to start out, let's target with 40, see how things go. If, if there's a possibility to flex up, it could flex up to maybe 50 there. When is this open again? Well, we would have to work it out. If council um, approves the use of this site, it, it would maybe be no earlier than late January to work through everything. So we come back in early January and hopefully open it up as quickly That's as possible after that. Uh, do you want to go through all three of these and then have sure, discussion? We can do that. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. So the third one is uh, to uh, the other component of this, again, again, trying to maximize uh, beds is would be, again, th as part of the HAP to uh, yeah, winter shelter program to work with the uh, warming, warming center uh, to uh, provide some additional uh, beds or, or capacity there. And that would be uh, the third one. And we would also bring that back in January with, with costs. And the warming center is trying to expand from its traditional 20 nights. So the warming center again is a, a pop-up shelter operated by Brent Adams who is here. He's standing right there. Um, and during the coldest and wettest nights of the year, he hosts a pop-up shelter, usually in different faith communities across the region. And he's asked for city assistance so he can, he can expand the number of nights and the number of people served. And so he's asked the city to be part of that conversation. I will note that back in 2016 or so, there was also direction given by this council to um, authorize, I think, additional use of 15 bed nights in the city. And we got all the way through the MOU process, getting it done, and then I think the winter improved, it, it was a very late acting um, action. So we've already gone down this path quite a ways before. So we look at city facilities mm -hmm. as well for, for that. Council Member Crone. Um, are we, well, two questions really. Um, is there, how, how many beds are available through the warming center? We don't really know that and we don't know what their need is. I think about, it serves about 80 people. We serve 80, 85. You can, step up. can you step up to the mic please? Uh, yeah, we've traditionally uh, been ready to serve 80 people. We've already made purchases, uh, hired materials, uh, uh, staff, and a vehicle. And we're ready to double that if, if needed uh, for extreme. But we're hoping, uh, we're focusing about 100, 120. I hope this is an okay question, but uh, members of the council have expressed uh, interest in seeing um, other parts of the county step up. Do, are you going to specifically look for faith in the faith community in different places around the county? We already operate a warming center in Watsonville that has a capacity to, to 50 plus. 
and so we can we can uh, tra transport out there. We we really want to be ready system wide. If there's a 10 night uh, cold snap to 30, uh, uh, 30 degrees or less, that we might uh, like a like a Red Cross or a fire department be ready to actually shelter as many as 200 people uh, in a night. So our system's ready for that. If I could follow up, um, I know the city of Watsonville operates a program out there. What about an unincorporated county? Has there been any interest in other facilities out there other than the Live Oak uh, facility that operated last year? Um, you know, we've, we've done some foray out into the San Lorenzo uh, Valley, um, but the county um, uh, didn't entertain that possibility last year with our uh, uh, expansion to Watsonville. Um, let's see. Uh, now we're, it's, we go far afield as, uh, I think, uh, Morrissey at this point, so nothing in Mid County, nothing in uh, nothing uh, outside. Of, but uh, we're we're open to that. We're actually reaching out to anybody who wants to open their. Uh, it's really uh, relationships with community centers and faith. Uh, uh, so we have just make an MOU process. It's a so far we've had perfect uh, uh, experience with all of our uh, site locations. And and um, just in regards to these three recommendations, does the HAP support all those for funding? Well, this would have to be worked out, but the HAP is very interested, all the jurisdictions in increasing um, sheltering capacity. Um, it, it has been, I'm sure as Brent can attest as well, very fast moving and very fluid as we're all trying to figure things out. So we're trying to get as much online as possible as quickly, but yes. You know, you know just in regards to the, you referenced the earlier council direction that's been consistent from 2010, and then we did it again in 2017 about the idea of a regional approach. Um, was there any interest in uh, any of the other HAP executive um, groups to say, hey, what are some other um, siting, issues, siting locations where there might be opportunities for expanded meal service? Um, because I could support the, these here, but I'd also like to see, I know that our needs much greater than just perhaps what the city can offer. Uh, absolutely, and I think where we are at this point too is we really are on this cusp of having a lot of money flow into the county that can really catapult a lot of countywide conversations. So what this represents is us trying to do the best we can within the next few month horizon, and what can we get as quickly as we can to help the real need out there. But to your point, that those are exactly the conversations we're having about ongoing and next season and what happens post April. And if I could go off a little bit off topic, I mean, we, we, we have this listed as recommendations for no, North County. Would it be more, um, would it make more sense to start thinking of this as like we're looking at um, kind of these emergency shelter space in the third and fifth district. So identify a particular geographic location. We're saying these are places where we need to find expanded siting because it's hard to kind of grapple around looking at the whole county. The South County is doing their own, but like let's identify what are the particular locations that where we could do this. Um, and, and by having um, specific districts identified, then at least it focuses our efforts on where we might find um, a suitable place. Well, the the funders of this also are in the second district and the first district. So I would say the first, second, third, and fifth districts. The fourth, which is Watsonville, is the only one that's different. That's why the city of Watsonville is not a funder of it. So it actually touches all those supervisorial districts, since we have Capitola and Scotts Valley also servicing them. So you've raised the point in the past around, should there be some sort of geographic delineation somewhere in the county to say, this is covered here? And again, I think that's a conversation that is very worthy when we're talking about how, how to allocate the state money, um, what makes the most sense. And I guess if I could just follow up, it is something where it's not just about the funders, it's what's the strategy on how we're approaching it. Because we do have a, we have an interest of identifying siting locations that might not just be in the city, but external to the city um, based on a review. And by limited maybe where, where the geographic areas are, we could have the other districts kind of identify other sightings because we do want to have some geographic equity in terms of looking at these various um, services. So that's why I'm, by describing it as North County, it, it's a pretty large area and we, as we talked about before, it's unclear what that means. When we were had the discussion about the bench lens last year, um, we had um, people from Aptos that were in, um, in in our, our city that we're seeking care. And it might be a way for us to better manage the, uh, the impacts that we're seeing so that we can have um, different jurisdictions uh, take on uh, their appropriate share. So I, I wanted to bring that up here. Yeah. 
Um, and and as Tina mentioned, I mean, uh, some of that will be in the uh, in the heap and hash process because that's really where the bulk of the funding is. And so these are really more interim measures uh, in, in many ways. Uh, so four is uh, kind of the, an extension of the third, which is uh, if you're amenable to that, to uh, try and expand the uh, the warming center, then we would uh, look at uh, using city facilities uh, to to help with that for 50 nights. Uh, uh, just, and you mentioned city facilities in number, another of for the For the food, ones. feed meals right. twice. Yeah. For, the, for the, right. Any particular thoughts there? Um, we were looking at the, the freight Yes, yeah, so we're looking at the freight building in Depot Park as a good site for the meal service for the 40 or so women family mobility impaired as a lot of uh, benefits. Um, and as for the shelter possibility, we think the Harvey West Clubhouse Scout House is likely the best option. That was a facility identified in 2016 to serve as well. We, of course, have to work around calendar and reservations, um, but as this is a mostly nighttime use, we think that's the best one. And I think it would accommodate the size. Is there any concern about being adjacent to a park and having other impacts where we, you know, we've seen some issues in terms of managing uh, some of the impacts when yeah. programs are delivered yeah. there? It's all in the operating model. We agree with you. It's all about how we manage and what are the requirements we have, and that's hashed out through the MOU process around what sort of security, are people allowed to go outside and smoke, are they monitored, you know, can people walk in, can they walk off? So there, there's a number of things that influence the, the impact to the surrounding community, and we would work to minimize that. I see that with all of the locations that are being mentioned. It's, in in fact, perhaps not so much the people that are participating in the program understand the agreement, but those who just show up and are not participating, and that's that's where a lot of the impact is. And I can see that at Depot, at Salvation Army, at Harvey West, too. Just, just given the proximity to all the other services, and I'll just second... Um, David's uh, interest in seriously exploring some more mid-county sites because that's that's part of the, the transit corridor, lo location to health and social services, the sheer numbers, et cetera. And I'll, I'll just say too, I've been hearing from folks that, you know, the, the population is, is moving in different parts. And while in, historically we've had a high concentration of programs here, I've heard that some people have challenges coming to Santa Cruz to access services because this is where we're located. So I think part of part of it, the, this review might include maybe we'll reconsider maybe some historical programs that have been here finding ways where we could um, move them to different parts of the county where they might be um, closer to where they're, they're needed. Um, I, I, is this the listing of the total recommendations or are there more? Yeah, and then the last one is, uh, and I've, we've talked about that before, the, uh, uh, the poly loft and their uh, funding gap and uh, a desire to uh, see the interest on the part of the council to continue to continue that program for a period of time here. So that would mean uh, funding at the poly loft beds for an additional four months. And I believe the county has also helped help with that as yeah, well. Yeah, thank you. So um, the poly loft did run into an operational place where they were going to close their doors as of, um, I believe, the end of September. And the, pol the Homeless Services Center came to the city and the county and said, can you help us keep our doors open? We saw the mutual benefit. Obviously, with the poly loft, this is 40 individuals that but for the shelter would be homeless, likely in Santa Cruz. The county funded um, for four months, so they funded October. October, November, December, and January. So right now, as of January 31st, the poly loft may very well be closing for lack of funding. We're concerned about that outcome. The county stepped up, so we wanted to propose to the council that we fund an additional four months, so that would keep operations in February, March, April, and May. And then you might ask, well, what then? Um, well, then, by then, the HEAP application should happen that period, there should be a notice of award. We should have a sense of whether or not we have a forever problem with the poly loft or if they've got stable funding at least for the next couple of years and kind of work through it strategically. So we do see this as, as truly bridge funding to keep this, um, to keep the program going, to keep these 40 people housed in order to preserve that option for continuing it and hopefully or possibly um, the state money is an option for that. 
Uh, if I can just follow up on some of this. So you talk, this has been presented to the HAP Executive Committee. You've discussed this? No, this is not. None of it's all new? Um, this is not, no. I had a chance to preview some of it with the county because mm -hmm. I was there yesterday so they wouldn't be surprised with this discussion today. I talked with the Executive Director of the Homeless Services Center to talk about this option um, and, and the, the sense that we wanted to have this discussion here um, today. But no, this is really kind of late breaking. And so these are all located in the city, did they have any suggestions on places they might consider? I mean, Who's I know they? the HAP Executive Committee, other jurisdictions other than just the city of Santa Cruz. To, for other shelter options. No, um, again, just looking back to the timeline. So as of the end of August, we thought the River Street Camp would serve as our winter shelter. In September, there became an option for a physical site, the VFW, and an operator, the Salvation Army. And then, um, so, People left on that, yes, let's do that. We think that's a better option. October, we're working to get that ramped up. We are working here at the city, Susie O'Hara in particular, to have a sensible wind down plan to, in order to transition folks over to really make sure that they're being, being taken care of. So it has been all, and then in addition, we've been exploring this heap in cash and trying to understand that and having innumerable meetings to understand this opportunity to position us. So right now, um, we have been in a, what can, what can we handle, what can we get on the table as quickly as possible. I think that countywide conversation is what's coming up with the, key, the cash in the heap. And I know we'll have some public comment, but I, I do wanna ask, in the, your report, you say the proposed spending plan allocations for the heap will be presented on December 11th, 2018. Mm -hmm. And here it right comes. Right there, yeah. <laughs> that was this, and I, I flew through this just because yeah. of our time. Yeah. Okay. But you can see, um, I, I'll just quickly, you can see the rental assistance and housing subsidy funds. You can see that's about $2 million. Emergency services, 2.8 million. Capital dropping down 3.3 million, and that's one-time funds to maybe build, acquire, do something, because um, this is one-time money. Um, the youth services got a, a healthy, and this is in addition to $2.2 million also that came in from a HUD grant to use on transition age youth and youth. Um, in some other categories. Okay, thanks. Did that come from the, the group that met at the uh, police community room, or how, how much input was? Yeah, that was that? that was part of it. Yeah, so there were three very similar meetings to that: one in Watsonville, one in the county and incorporated, and one in Santa Cruz. And those results were aggregated to come up with this. And I will say, this is a hundred percent flexible spending plan. Nothing. We are not locked in. If we issue RFPs and we find out that no one is submitting for a category, um, there is latitude then to reallocate that. In addition, if not all the COCs in the, can in the state grab the money, there's a second round of heat funding too. So we wanna be prepared for that if we can grab that money as well. Does that conclude the presentation? Uh, not quite. Okay. A couple more things. Those five recommendations. Um, here in your presentation is just a chart of what some of these things look like, the expansion and preservations. I thought this would be a nice reference point just to show the programs, the agency, the beds, the duration, the, the cost information we know. Um, I won't go through that, but you have this in, in the presentation in front of you. Um, and then finally, um, well actually not finally, penultimate finally, um, we also want to present the opportunity if the council wished to discuss the encampment that has grown on the Caltrans and city properties, the Highway 1 and River Street. And, and you can read the, the comments here that the county has been providing, providing services. We've been managing somewhat, but not actively involved. And so the council said before, you'd like to get involved in these discussions more, so we wanted to present this opportunity. Um, and then finally, um, at your November 13th council meeting, you directed that some other topics come back for possible discussion. So we're presenting these here for you to discuss these things and provide any direction if you wanted to on them. Great. Council Member Brown. Um, thank you for the report. I um, appreciate all the work you've put into it and um, understand this is a very uh, challenging uh, process. And um, so it's good to see uh, the thinking that's gone into it. And, um, you know, I, in terms of the, uh, action as appropriate. I assume that these these uh, recommendations that you're making here are the actions you're hoping that we take now to move for ahead so that you can move ahead with the funding piece. I would like to hear a little bit more about the 
River Street, the unmanaged, uh, um, un, uh, the informal uh, camp that has emerged because we do get some a lot of constituent messaging about it, um, and you know, similar to what happened in the Benchlands. Um, so it, you know, and I know that when that uh, we that was in operation, that Chief Mills uh, gave us some remarks about uh, their plans for. Um, low fi um, low key management if if you i don't know if you um, would be prepared if you could tell us a little bit about your thinking um, i know this is a uh, joint effort with parks and rec but it would just be great to hear a little bit more about what's aside from what we can see and those of you who go visit it you get a sense of what's going on but what's the plan would be nice to hear a little bit more about Okay, well, I'll say a few words first, and then we do have police and, and parks here. So about this, um, the genesis of this camp, so there were a, a couple of tents there for a while, and then we noticed, I believe, in about um, October, I would say, it was increasing in building and growing. And to what to attribute that, we're not entirely sure. Um, we know that we've had increased enforcement in other areas of the city, like downtown, um, Coral the Coral Street. We did close our open space for the explosive fire danger around Thanksgiving, and we did find about, I think, 40 people out of all of our open space together. So we think that um, people need a place to go. That became a place to go. It grew. It felt safer. And then also, we, we, we learned later that the county had been there, um, HPHP out there supporting and helping people, passing up food, doing services. And they asked us, can you come in and please help with some of the hygiene and refuse? So we did. So we brought in portable toilets and hand washing just to maintain some basic level of hygiene in this area, as well as some refuse. And the management of that has been off and on city parks doing some of the refuse and some contractor. And I know in terms of public safety, let me see, I'll go to this slide. They, they monitor it daily. They go in there. They're making arrests. Um, I know the police are interfacing with the businesses in that adjacent shopping center as well, talking about it. But right now, we're in this place where it is there. It's not a sanctioned campground. There isn't a place for these people to go. And, you know, that's a discussion we wanted to have with you today. I don't know if there's anything anyone else would like to add to what I've said. No? No. Okay, so that's exactly why we want to be here today. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm just curious why we're doing the sanitation services. It sounds like a very much a health and human services sort of um, uh, function. So why is the city providing that? <laughs> well, I think we. You know, the city, we want to step in because we want it to be better. It's our river walk as well. We have our community members traversing that pathway there. It's adjacent to a river, which is a major part of not only our ecosystem and environment, but something we, we work hard to protect. So we had a vested interest in stepping in. I just find it strange in. that they requested that we provide it when yeah. they're county health. So I just, that's where, um, you know, I get a little, not a little, I get annoyed um, with that. It, you know, the idea is, I mean, the county gets millions of dollars for health and human services and we don't. So I just find it strange that they would ask us to provide something that, in my opinion, is, you know, right up their alley in terms of their responsibilities. And it's on our property and Caltrans property. And in the past, that's also Can how the health... A question. Oh. Council, it comes from Brown. Well, I, I mean, I, if you want, this, it's a question that, um, you know, I'd like Council Member Renora to get her question if, answered if there, if you have more to say, but well, I just it have sounds two like, quick follow-ups. It sounds like we just, they asked us, we, you know, <laughs> staff accepted and they did it. And I, I'm not debating the need for it. I want um, these facilities out there, but once again, it feels sort of like the city is taking on a responsibility that's, um, you know, health and human services is, is strictly county. Well, I would also say that, you know, I think from the, our, the staff perspective, we're just trying to respond to the immediacy of the problem. You know, we've got the, the businesses, neighbors really, really concerned about just the basic necessities that are there. So that's the first sort of, when we go in there, it's let's, how do we, you know, fix it uh, as, as best we can. And, and this really just goes to this uh, issue of uh, on an ongoing basis, we really don't have a governance or a, or a structure to sort of deal with these issues. We've got the, like the Hep and Heesh process going on, but that's for that specific area. So this just goes to, we, we do need that approach. There isn't a structure in place. We can certainly have discussions with the county about it. But as far as uh, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, it's really just trying to address the immediacy of the issues. Yeah, no, I know. I can understand that. But I, I do think, you know, like, we're 
part of it's Caltrans land. We're providing part of the land. We're using our um, police officers to monitor the situation so people who are there and around the area are safe. So, you know, I think um, going forward, we really need to have the county step up a bit more. And this is identical conversation that we had last year with the hepatitis A outbreak. And I think the discussion was um, where, where is the funding? Because we were going to request reimbursement for those as well. I know. Um, I, and you don't have to answer it, but I do, I do agree with Council Member Naroyan that, that one, it's like a coordinated approach. And it seems to be that we're using city resources in ways where we're kind of deploying things here or there rather than being strategic. And I know, Tina, you've been really active with the HAP, but I mean, I would hope that, you know, that's something we could stress with the HAP Executive Committee in terms Again, of Again, I think it goes back to governance. It's about the elected officials getting together and figuring out how are we going to govern this. You know, again, at the staff level, we are implementing, we're trying to be responsive to day-to-day -day complaints. You know, as far as the overall policy and direction, that has to come from the electeds. Well, we do have that regional, that discussion about the regional approach, but I totally uh, I agree that um, this is the structure we have. We have the half executive committee and that's, that's what exists. Councilman Brown. Mm -hmm. Follow-up questions to my previous open-ended question about what's the plan. Um, one, uh, are there, and thank you for the, the response, uh, the general response. Uh, two follow-up questions. One, um, the last time I was out there, I didn't see, and we also, I think, received a couple of messages about this, um, any dumpsters or refuse facilities. So I'm wondering about how the refuse pickup is actually occurring. Could we get a dumpster out there, for example? Um, I personally don't have, I mean, it seems to me that we're, this is triage mode here. So, you know, some of these basic- I, I do know that we're monitoring and adjusting as needed. Uh, maybe uh, Tony and the parks folks have been working on it. Maybe can provide so some So that's one. And then two, um, are there plans for uh, an organized cleanup similar to what happened in the bench lands where people were moved out and then brought back in following cleanup? I'd just like to know if that's happening, if people should expect that. Uh, for the record, Tony Elliott, uh, Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, we have approximately three to four people out there, uh, two, three, four hours a day, uh, picking up trash. Um, we do have the 96 gallon uh, toters out there, but we're taking them off site um, to dispose of them. There's not a whole lot of space for a dumpster, so that's why we just have a system of toters out there. But it's about, really about five or six labor hours per day, seven days a week, just managing the trash. Jeez. Can I, can I ask a follow up on, on this? Um, what part of it is city land and what part of it is is, uh, is uh, state? Because I, I was I thought it was all state at one point when I asked. Uh, as I understand, the, the section that uh, borders the levee path uh, going down towards the, to River Street uh, River, is River state. Walk. And then the, then at a point, probably like Midway, it transitions to city between Midway in the shopping center and River Street. Mm. Hold on a second. We're, we're still debating. You'll have your opportunity to speak. Um, okay. And then I'd like to ask also the police chief. Last year when we had the bench lands camp and the movement, there was outreach that took place. And I know we had our public safety meeting about understanding who are the people that are out there so we can make sure that we're doing. Is that something we're planning on doing again this year? And I know the report came back several months later, but um, we talked about even having an independent group kind of do that to have a better understanding of who um, who were who the people were were, were uh, that are in this site? Uh, for the record, it's Andy Mills, police chief, and uh, thank you for your question. We have been out there on a daily basis talking with people in the camps. I went out there and addressed everybody in the camp myself. I uh, got everybody gathered around to let them know that there needs to be some level of decorum and rules of behavior uh, for this location and the. Uh, and the community that surrounds it, how far that went, uh, we don't know uh, in terms of the compliance with that. Um, however, <clears throat> we have it routined, uh, routinely programmed into our c computer aided dispatch system to send officers there multiple times a day uh, to the camp to do checks and to uh, do enforcement as needed. We've made multiple arrests uh, uh, while our officers are out there, not only there, but down in the parking lot uh, at the Gateway Plaza. So uh, we have you know, talked with many of them and talking with the people who are there, it seems that many of them are long-term homeless persons from our community. Not saying that's exclusive, we didn't take an exact survey, uh, but uh, I talked with uh, dozens of people out there 
uh, who, who explained that to us. At, anecdotally. Antidotally, uh, anecdotally. If you would like a further um, you know, survey, we certainly can work with other departments to try to conduct that to find out you know, who's there. Uh, well, we talked about that at the Public Safety Committee, and I thought that you uh, periodically were going to do that. We had discussed that, yes. Um, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, we also talked about having an independent body yeah. do that because sometimes what people are going to tell the police is very different than what they're going to tell somebody that they're, you know, less intimidated by. So we want to make sure that, uh, uh, that the information is as accurate as possible. Thanks. Good connect, Chris, before you go, I know we got uh, oral communications at 530 and then we still haven't gone to public comment on this item. So I'm going to ask, um, before let me behold questions and just say, is any member of the public here to speak to this item? Okay, and I know um, you, uh, Mr. Norris asked to speak to this. Um, I, I'd like to try and, you know, you know, one minute per person. Robert, if you go to two minutes so we can kind of get through this, I'd appreciate it. I'll let the one minute speaker go. Okay, go, please go ahead. Hello, I'm NateAlex.Kennedy at gmail.com. Call or text me at 3469888. What I've got to say about this whole situation is we've been closing parks, pushing people out of the parks in the bushes, and they have nowhere to go but the sidewalk itself and doorways of businesses. We really need to address this. We need legitimate campsites, not just for the homeless people of Santa Cruz, but for travelers, for refugees from fires and floods and otherwise. We need to have a campsites that are legal, completely legitimate, regulated, that would have a police trailer located nearby or right on the site. Maybe even put a needle uh, drop box right on the police trailer itself for people to get rid of their needles or needles that are found. Um, Thank you. Next oh, wow, speaker. that was it. Next speaker, please. <laughs> Mayor and Council, uh, since April, when it was expressed that the, the camp was uh, maybe the River Street camp was going to be extended through April, uh, but that there wouldn't be a winter shelter possibly. I'm really uh, uh, happy to see this, this step up, um, that there looks like it's, the, the city's really going there. I'm talking with Paul Loft, and then potentially with the warming center. Since August up uh, and, and through uh, ever since then, we d declared our own shelter emergency, double down, like I said, spent almost $10,000 on extra materials, hired somebody by, and said, we are going to now be ready to shelter twice as many people as I said before, but uh, uh, potentially ready to be uh, to raise our temperature threshold, but we've worked with the the Salvation Army, the county, and the city to actually be ready. To, uh, we've been uh, shelter, sheltering their sorry, storing their large belongings, bicycles. There's the, they put a. Uh, uh, shuttle stop right in front of our, our spot. Uh, it's the fourth one uh, to make sure that uh, that we can actually make sure that everybody who needs to, uh, to isn't denied st uh, shelter because of their bikes or things like that. So we've been really doing a lot of this work to this point. So I just want uh, Warming Center to be recognized for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next speaker. Okay, let's see if I can talk fast. Um, I would suggest that uh, if you can get some sort of advisory group to try to get together to try to solve some of these problems because some of these problems are starting to domino, that you have that group that's over there by River Street, but you also have less bed space this year, that it's true that 40 beds would be easier to start at Laurel Street, but we actually did 50 last year, so there's not actually a staffing difference for that. And if you're busing them in anyway, it's still a manageable thing, which still takes program design, and that's what I'm talking about sitting down. But I'd say if it was possible to do an intake site like we did two years ago, which wasn't the best thing in the world at 1220 River, because right now people are just sitting in the rain at different bus stops, pretty confusing thing about reservations, and then they're getting their intake, a very confidential conversation that's just sitting in the middle of the VFW at a table with people around them saying, hey, have you been raped? Have you been, you know, have you used drugs and people are just sitting around listening to these conversations. I think it would be really compassionate and a lot more professional if there was an intake site too. Thank you. Um, next speaker. 
having only a minute to speak about this is a little unfair, but let's go. The, that property, the middle of the property, uh, the city owns the top part, Caltrans owns the middle part, the bottom part's owned by the city. Those people came from Coral Street, the train tracks, and the other River Street camp that's closed. We have an, I'm a business owner, my name's Michael Spadafore, I'm a business owner at the Gateway Plaza, dead body found in a, in a, uh, in a car. Uh, uh, car stolen this past weekend. PetSmart employees afraid to talk to their customers. Um, the security guard having to stay in Ross for 20 minutes till a cop came to, to help him because he's being bullied by the people in the, in the parking lot. You guys wanna do something at like about one o'clock in an afternoon? Go sit in that parking lot and watch the people go from that parking lot up to that levee. My customers see that every day. My owners were there the other day. Some lady lifted up her dress and peed in the parking lot right in front of Ross. That's something we deal with on a daily basis. And for nobody to have an answer of why that's there is completely beyond me. It is too close to the people leaving the tannery and leaving the bridge. It's not safe for kids anywhere around there. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Elise Casby. I'm a longtime researcher and activist. I've gotten a lot of firsthand observation and so forth. What the gentleman was just saying there is exactly the kind of information that I would like to see us have an actual process. We need an evidence-based system. And also, this has been a political football from my research, at least deep as far back as the 80s. And uh, as, as good as this is, it's more of the same, I'm sorry. A lot of the people who are currently sitting on this council are Take Back Santa Cruz people. A lot of this information in terms of what's being provided is coming out of that very, very political anti-homeless stance. We need to take it out of there for, for the fact that these are people who are going through a lot of trauma. These are people who are then further traumatized by the fact of being homeless. Uh, I could talk and write reams and reams on this about how people are treated in churches, in, in government places. I wanna see an independent body like that, that hires uh, sociology majors do evidence-based research and maybe that's where a substantial part of the 10.6 million can come from. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker please. Hello, um, my name is Andy Paradise. I'm a Santa Cruz City resident and I'm actually here for a different reason. I'm here to thank you all and especially Cynthia Chase uh, for the resolution. Oh, you know what, that's, we've already had that. Um, can you put it on pause? This is item specific, but I appreciate that. And I, I, I we're here for the um, item number 28. It's a homelessness update. And then we're gonna have a public um, uh, oral communications after that. Um, but you can't speak to an item that wasn't on the agenda. So if you could generalize your thanks and praise, that would- give Are you, you going to have a public thing where I would be able to come back a after? Cause it is on the agenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at 5.30 sometime after that, we'll do it. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. So uh, um, I'm like uh, concerned about the millions of dollars that are being um, contributed to the city and um, for these programs and I hope that it doesn't go primarily to administration or to other kinds of things like that. Then we get that, con you know, we often hear like millions of dollars going to homeless services and stuff and then you uh, homeless people themselves are kind of frustrated because they don't see where it's happening. And um, I point out like the River Street camp um, uh, was uh, approximately uh, $1,500 per person per month that was living there. And that could have actually paid for rent for an apartment for many, you know, each person. So we might want to see how this is figuring out. Also, uh, you know, um, Heroes Camp is amazing. And I think that it would be great to honor the heroes at Heroes Camp by calling a day sometime soon uh, in honor of the people that helped rescue uh, victims of the car crash and so on and, and give them the kind of respect that is due them. Thank you so, so that much. Suggestion. Um, next speaker, please. Are you here to speak to item number 28, the homelessness update? Indeed, sir. Uh, and uh, I'll just keep it brief uh, and go back to predictions. I predict that uh, there will be a Poganet redevelopment fund of probably will come out to like $433,000 on Kickstarter and the other GoFundMe maybe. Uh, and uh, also uh, I expect there to be uh, some better community relations with IBM. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Norris, you have two minutes as part of Huff. Um, nice to have 
highly paid staff members talking to death proposals to get more money without any kind of homeless input. But I guess that's standard for this council. Uh, survival camps throughout the city are where 1,000 to 2,000 homeless people live. About uh, 70 to 80 tents when I was out there a couple days ago. 100 to 200 people are out at the Ross camp or Heroes camp as it was called. These camps are what the real winter shelter that people have in spite of all this yabber, yabber, yabber about plans that never go anywhere. How you can listen to Tina Scholl and Susie O'Hara after they betrayed the campers at the River Street campground, which you spent so much money and time in, I just, I don't understand. Why should we believe what they have to say? What difference does it make if they're gonna change their minds the next month and dump these people out on the ground, on the street? Or or into vehicles where there's no place to park because you've also dumped because of bigotry and your fear of the neighborhoods, the car park proposal at the edge of town. Sharps containers need to be in these campgrounds. Perhaps uh, Tony or Andy can get their butts together and head them out that way. Obviously two porta potties for more than 100 people are just not enough. They weren't, uh, there was a greater number at the San Lorenzo campground last year. Uh, open bathrooms are still needed throughout the city. We don't have them. Uh, we continue to see, see a stall from the Parks and Rec Department on the Loudon Nelson problems there, and I continue to hear complaints about elders who don't get access to those unless they come in during the very small, limited time during the noon meal. There's a cutback in real services from last year. It was pointed out to you in the one minute interval you gave this guy. But there's an increase in funding. What the hell is going on? Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna bring it back to the council for deliberation and action now. Is there anyone who would like to um, perhaps look at those uh, recommendations? Um, go ahead, there was a package of five recommendations. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, and uh, my questions were answered about which city facilities. Um, I should just mention staff has offered to meet with each of us individually to go into more detail and get our personal observations, interests, concerns that we appreciate um, as part of moving forward on this. And I'll have some, some thoughts of my own to convey. So um, given all that um, and that we do want this to move forward, I'll go ahead and move the package of five uh, recommendations here. Okay, motion by uh, Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Chase. Uh, I have a question. Vice Mayor Watkins. I just have a quick question, and I know that we're in the interest of time trying to keep things moving, but um, thank you for your work and the presentation. I know this is not the last time we're gonna be having this discussion, so I will go into some of the other questions I have. I just wanna sort of share one observation just because I've worked in that area, that it is located in a highly busy intersection and there is concern of public safety, not just in terms of those that are residing in the camp, but crossing the street and potential for that kind of, you know, impact. So I, I you know, I, without kind of going into any more detail, knowing that we don't have the time for that, I just sort of want to highlight that seeing people cross the street there, um, it's concerning to see for their safety. And some more Brown. But I do want to support the motion and um, just have a quick question though about the process. So it, we're, you sent apparently a message that I never received, so I'm looking forward to connecting with you individually. Um, would that be the appropriate time to give you feedback about um, perspectives on uh, governance structure around and, and council elected representation within the HAP or is that something that we should do Elsewise, I just want to make sure that that doesn't get lost. The purpose of the briefings were around the cash in the heap <clears throat> and talking about the needs in the RFP so I can get feedback for that development. I would also love to hear your observations on um, governance because that's something that needs to be tackled. Thank you. Just on that topic, it occurred to me as that conversation was going on, is this another JPA in the making? I mean, it, yeah. it almost sounds yeah, like it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that had been talked I'm, about. I'm sure you're it, talking is a, about a formal it, JPA formed. Yeah. There are models that work that yeah. way. Yes. Yeah. I know. I know. Martin Bernal. He brought up a few earlier in the year. Uh, San Diego. The model down in San Diego that was used. I thought was one that well, this, was this looked at. This isn't the time to pursue yeah. it. But I think as soon as you feel you that's ripe, back, to, ripe could, to bring back some ideas for discussion, that sure. good. Moving forward. Um, the in terms of the direction potentially on the that encampment out there. 
I, I mean, I don't know where the council is, but I would like to understand who the people are. And like we did last year, understanding, you know, what are the, what are the, the needs or how we can kind of get at least a, some sort of independent review of this so we kind of know where they are. We did that last year from the bench lands and I'd like to do the, do the same again. I know that we had this discussion at the public safety meeting and it seemed like either the police or uh, independent group could do that. So would that be something you'd be willing to put in the motion? I think that's additional direction. These are more yeah. Is that something you're actions, to... but I'm, I'm uh, happy to add that we uh, request that, uh, that depending on <laughs> resources available, but that a, a legitimate effort be made to get um, a better handle on uh, who are the um, uh, campers at that site. And is that okay? Well, by, well that was Councilmember Chase seconded that. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And since the county is already out there and their health and human yes. services well, are meeting with them, it feels like that is the appropriate request to make to that very staff. Very much so. Yeah. The, I'll just, I mean, I'll just echo the interest in that because I think that helps also our ability to understand the various subpopulations of need and to tailor those services yeah. appropriately. Yeah. So it's helpful to have that. And then just one other thing, and that is there was further direction about the, uh, you know, what to do about this area out there. And I, I think that um, is it possible to at least issue some sort of request for information? Are there facilities that are out there so that, you know, obviously staff can't do it, but putting out some sort of RFI to see, well, what kind of eight places are there? Maybe they're not within the city, but maybe they're in a distance within transportation services so that we can have um, some housed um, sheltered space that's consistent with HAP and why they uh, kind of cut the uh, the program in the first place, but to provide it on a fast track to see, well, what kind of facilities are out there? Let's put an RFI out to kind of get something in place so that these people aren't in the space, out in the open and are in some uh, sheltered space now. Councilmember Brown. Sorry, I just have one more thought, um, but if you want to respond to that now, I'll wait um, for a second. Well, I'm, I have some questions. So you'd want the city to issue a request no, for I'd information. The HAP, the, HAP the HAP to issue a request for information to find out where there's available real estate that could potentially serve as an emergency shelter. Or review even existing county facilities that might be underutilized right now that you know could provide us an immediate opportunity. So it sounds like you would like us to go back to the HAP and say the Santa Cruz City Council has this request of the HAP? That would be, that would be uh, most appreciated. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I'm under the impression that that's consistent with what you're doing for the warming center, looking for incidental spots or... I don't know. It sounds like they haven't came up with any, just like to ask them directly. Well, I, I would say... Um, and Martine was, I had an aside with him, is that that's what we envision for the heat process, mm -hmm. is that if you saw the categories again here, there was a very strong emphasis on emergency services as well as capital improvements. And we're trying to ascertain if capital improvements can pay for leasing costs. That's one of those many, many details we're trying to refine with the state, but that's exactly what we would want to do. What can we get online to focus on emergency shelter? That has been, I, I mentioned also all these processes, like the singular commonality has been the sense of we need more emergency shelter across the county, South County, Mid County, everywhere. So that is exactly a major priority we'd go for. So I think that fits in with so, that process, so, which is gonna launch in mid-January. So, so I couldn't do it any faster. Way. So okay, yeah. so, that, so, it's that's happening. Fine. so your expectation is that there would be location outside of the city limits that are um, in the unincorporated county that would be presented to you for review? We would issue a request for proposal. Yeah. Um, and I, this hasn't been ascertained, it's not my decision, but we would request to issue a request for proposal for additional emergency shelter services across the county. Now, that depends on submittals coming back to us to have operators and sites to do it. Um, alternately, one of the jurisdictions could decide we want to operate said shelter and they could respond and say, we would like that money to come in and we will operate it. So that is an option available to Santa Cruz, Watsonville and the county. Um, that doesn't guarantee, it, but then you have to identify the site. When we've done, when we spent all year looking for phase two in the interim shelter, we looked all across the county, all in Santa Cruz. We had a very difficult time. So we were working with property, uh, real estate folks across the county, our economic development, looking at our warehouse. I mean, there just really isn't, there, there isn't some space we haven't thought of yet that's gonna manifest, I don't anticipate, because we have, we have looked. With that said, we will put this out with a real funding offer behind it, we'll see what we find. 
and even could be even existing facility that's publicly owned, a, g a government county facility that might be underutilized. Could would that be something that? Absolutely, yeah. we'd be open to um, even. I mean, we need to need a flat parking lot. Frankly, mm -hmm. we can put up a sprung tent structure, which we've had many conversations about. That that's what we need. We could be very creative. Well, I'm we just prepared need some to support the motion that's on the floor. So, Councilmember Brown. <laughs> Still prepared to support that motion, but I do have one other question that I wanted to ask um, and, and take this opportunity to call out, uh, you know, the Warming Center for the work that they're doing with, you know, only nominally supported by uh, the city and county. Uh, and I know, um, Tina, you mentioned that um, we may be looking at providing them some support for the um, services they're providing and some additional um, bed space. So I'm just wondering, is that something that will happen through Heap and Kesh, or is that something you're gonna be coming to ask us about in the future, or is that something you want action on tonight? In terms um, of the funding? In terms of get, I understand the county is maybe gonna provide some resources and they have asked that the city um, mm -hmm. provide some kind of mm -hmm. commitment as well. And uh, you know, I wanna make sure that happens. So just ha wondering how that's gonna either sure. come to us or if it will just. Moves. What's like built January. into yeah. every component of this motion is coming back in January okay. with here's how so we think it'll work. Okay. So and that would be January. the operations and also here's how much it will cost. Because if you look on this chart, the, the, we've got a lot of TBDs on some of those expanded costs and how's that being paid for exactly. The $100,000 we're asking for um, under recommendation five we envision would help be uh, our contribution to these programs. Okay, so th that's that. So right there in the number four, that is what you were talking about earlier. Yeah, number four, yes. Okay. That's the primary thing, right. yes. Thank Council you. Member Crohn's. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the, the, the camp there at River Street. Uh, somebody mentioned 100 people. Is that Does that sound accurate? Because I was wondering what, the, what a, a preliminary count was. Uh, I mean, of how many campers we had? Yes, uh, I think right our there. number was more around 60. When it was originally proposed, we thought we'd have more double occupancy per tent, and what we found is when people moved no, in. No, not River. I'm talking about Camp Ross or the Heroes Camp. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. With um, um, I, I don't know what the latest estimate is. I apologize. Sorry. Uh, I don't think anybody has a good, uh, re you know, reliable number. The last time I was out there about a week ago, I counted 60 tents. Now, are they double occupied, single occupied? We don't, we don't know for sure. When we gathered everybody around us, uh, the crowd was about 60, 65 people when we counted. Thank you. Um, uh, it sounds like Mr. Spadafora has furnished some really good information. He's been looking into it too. So I mean, that, I don't know if that's where he's got that, but he sounds spot on from the information I've gotten just anecdotally. Um, it, between now and January, what, what? well, let me back up. Uh, Tony Elliott, do we have, do you hear that we need more services there? I mean, we did have, I think, four or six porta potties at the, the Benchlands, and if there's only two, that the, and, and it sounds like there's even more people poss possibly. Yeah, we've got uh, two to four more portalettes, if I recall, coming out by the end of this week. So they're they're in process. We've recognized that. And what's the plan if it just starts to rain, or is that on the horizon? Are you looking farther out? I think that's a, a good question. I think that's something we'd have to uh, explore with our team internally to evaluate what does that look like, what's the impact, and what resources. Do we're not going to get provide? together here for a, a, another, you know, three weeks, right? I mean, it's not going to come back here until the, the, the oh, we eighth. Are also yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, right now. yeah, this is good. I'm just worried. That's so, all. so we've been monitoring, sure. and this was Councilmember Brown's question too. What's the plan that we didn't actually get to? Um, and and right now we've been in this this um, period of monitoring, doing some light support of it. And so we were wondering, um, do you want the city to be to intervene more? Do you want the city to get involved similarly to what we did with the? the um, San Lorenzo Park Benchlands, where we actually went in, cleared people out, as was referenced, cleaned up, set up campsites, to that sort of thing. This is tricky because it's not our property. You know, it's Caltrans. Or we could go in and we could go through an eviction process and start closing it down and moving folks out. Um, with the result you can anticipate is that folks will just be dispersed across the city in different parts. So, um, so it's tricky. 
It's tricky, and so we wanted to get a sense of the council. It's, it's, been, it's been growing, and we've, as I said, been lightly managing the impacts of it, not the individuals, but what we heard tonight was that you'd like to understand better the populations. So we'll go back and we'll talk with the county and ask, um, really, what are you doing day by day? Can you go in and start working with these folks on an individual basis to understand them, their stories, their pathways, what services they need to get a better handle on that? And I think that we'll continue to manage it in that way, um, watching the hygiene needs, adding a little bit of capacity here and there until we can come back and have a fuller discussion with you in January. That's what I think the course will be. And thanks to Parks and Rec for, as you heard, the five hours a day of staff work to do that, as well as our police officers who are out there daily, as well as interacting, and, and knowing it's a difficult situation. We're also hoping that if we can get, excuse me, some of the shelter ca capacity online, we can really move these people. If we have people that are currently in the winter shelter that are eligible for this expanded program, should it happen, that frees up space there, and then we can move more people into there. So we're, we're hoping that all these things can converge, that we have a better outcome, but it's not a immediately on our doorstep. Yeah, I'd just like to ask, I mean, just because I'm, we're about ready to vote on this, but um, has there been any discussion about mutual aid? I mean, one, some of these things that we have out there, I mean, I know our police officers are kind of, if they're spending that amount of time, they're unable to attend to other things. Are we able to kind of bring in other groups to help support some of the kind of needs that we have to manage this space? Has that been uh, looked at? You know, not not to date. We're just managing within current patrols. As the chief mentioned, it shows up, and so we just have a regular rotating patrol as part of the different beats, and I think that is meeting the need now. I think if things increase or change, we would have to look at every available resource to intervene. I'd like to make sure, you know, one, you look at it and see, because I know I've heard anecdotally from some people in the field that there is a need. There's, there's a kind of a burnout factor with all the other issues that are going on in the community, and it would be great to have mutual aid because these are, again, a shared burden that we're all trying to address regionally, and I think it would be good to hear from them to see in the county if we can get some more resources, um, not just the uh, social services ones to help support the city's management of this crisis. Well, and also, you know, I referenced earlier talking about the heat money that I'm doing a road show and talking with different groups of employees. I have the chance to meet with the police department tomorrow afternoon, so we can talk more about that as well, and I can learn more. In addition, I want to thank Mr. Norris for raising a point about people with lived experience. He's right. Um, um, there weren't, there were some at the September 21st meeting, but to my knowledge, there weren't at others. So I had already planned on doing two specific groups, one with the downtown streets team and one with, one with Rabbi Posner who op made this offer to help con convene some people with lived experience who are currently homeless to hear their perspectives as well. So that is part of my information gathering on this. I don't think I'll get that fully accomplished by the next time you meet in January, but that is um, something we're doing to understand that better. We have a motion on the floor in a second. Is there any further discussion on this matter? Okay, seeing none, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Again, thanks everyone for being here. It was, it's been a long kind of meeting, 8.30 now to 5.45. We're up a little bit later than usual, but oral communications. How many people are here to speak at oral communications? The first person we have up um, for oral communications is Ellen Premack. She's speaking on behalf of Friends of Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium. And, and Ellen, we went a little late. Um, I, I, you know, I, you generally we have um, f four minutes. I'm wondering if you can condense your, your comments, like two, no? Okay. She... Yeah, okay, please go, no, knock it out. Yeah. Four. Sorry. Take your time. Four. Four. Oh. I'll, I'll read quickly. Thank you for this opportunity to speak briefly on behalf of the Friends of the Civic Auditorium. I am Ellen Primack, Santa Cruz City resident, executive director of the Cabrillo Festival of Contemporary Music and a friend of the Civic Auditorium. The Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium is our county's largest cultural gathering place. Built nearly 80 years ago, issues of safety, audience comfort, accessibility, and technical relevance have become ever more urgent. In 2012, a civic-minded leadership team of community, city, and nonprofit leaders convened to envision a renovated and modernized Civic Auditorium that could turn an iconic historic fixture into a vibrant performing arts and cultural center to serve our community and the next generation. We want to thank city leaders, Dorothy Wise of the Santa Cruz Symphony, who accompanies me today, and many other 
others for their commitment to supporting the Civic as a vital community asset. During these past eight years, the planning stages have included community surveys, producer input, and architectural concept design, engineering and seismic studies, situational analysis, and a business plan. All the essential <laughs> groundwork for renovation has been laid. Even with all the challenges of the Civic Auditorium, it serves approximately 85,000 annually and has an unparalleled economic impact on the county and on our downtown center. Ask any downtown business, restaurant owner, or their employees, waiters, salespeople, sandwich makers. Yet what we have learned is that its real potential is enormous and we are leaving so much untapped. The Civic Auditorium is used half as much as comparable facilities in other communities. And the longer we wait, the more we undermine its usefulness. So in 2018, under the auspices of the Arts Council, an affinity group called Friends of the Civic Auditorium was established to share our dream to renovate, activate, and stimulate, and to promote and to provide civic-minded community members the opportunity to voice their concerns, volunteer their efforts, and to support this vision of a safe, comfortable, vibrant civic auditorium. It is our goal to fund the renovation through private funds and a bond measure in 2020 using a TOT increase to help make that possible. These efforts will serve our local community, make downtown a more welcoming and safer place, create jobs, support our hospitality industry, and help generate added sales and admissions taxes to the city coffers. I recognize that the city council has profound challenges ahead and that there are many concurrent needs, including the most serious of our social services and housing. But I believe that it is the city government's imperative to not only work to mitigate the negatives, but to initiate the positives, to help provide a quality of life here in Santa Cruz that makes it a place worth living in. I am reminded of the line, bread for all and roses too. The Civic plays a vital role in the social and cultural life of our community that indeed helps define our community and what makes it worth fighting for. So on behalf of the Friends of the Civic Auditorium, we present this ribbon of requests from many communities members who ask you to move this important project forward. We ask you to prioritize the renovation of the Civic Auditorium and plan for a bond measure in 2020. And I thank you very thank much. Thank you. You had it almost timed perfectly with the, the uh, number of postcards. <laughs> thank Which you. Which are addressed to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, there was a woman who spoke, who came up earlier, and she's in yellow. I don't have your name. I'd like you to come up because you, you, uh, you basically were, were here, I think, early for the comment. Thank you. Um, and, and again, how many more people are here to speak for oral communications? One, two, three. Okay, you, you have uh, 90 seconds. Go ahead. All right. Well, here I am again. My name is Andy Paradise. I'm a Santa Cruz City resident, and I am here to thank you all, especially Cynthia Chase, for the resolution, if that's what it's called. I don't know my city council lingo, uh, to oppose the federal government and Trump's rollback of transgender, non-binary gender and intersex rights put in Title IX by the Obama administration. I am the parent of a transgender child who lives in this city and I'm very concerned for my child's safety and treatment as our federal uh, government is determined to strip protect protections and erase this very vulnerable community. I speak not only for myself, but for the many parents from the local support group, trans families of Santa Cruz County, as well as all of our transgender and non-binary children. We are extremely thankful for your shore of support with this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And congratulations. Sweet. Bring that forward. Hello, I'm NateAlexKennedy at gmail.com. Uh, also call or text uh, 346-9888. Uh, the big thing I wanna say here is what we need to have is radio access to these meetings. KZSC, KSCO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need to approach all these different radio stations and see which ones will allow time to broadcast entire meetings. We also need to broadcast live off the internet or on the internet uh, with a radio with a uh, uh, radio on internet type of live streaming that we could get through the the uh, city council website. Um, and uh, uh, another suggestion with that is when we put the MP3s up on on the site in the end, we should lower it to a, to a really low kilobit rate and make it mono to make the file as small as we possibly can. Um, 
Let's see, aside from, from all that, uh, tandems for the police. Thank you. Thank you, I came back. <laughs> Next speaker, please. Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. <clears throat> I'm gonna cover something I've covered before because it needs to be covered. We're, um, Trump just uh, spent, what, 700 billion plus dollars on our uh, military for the for the coming year. A lot of that just goes to fighting stupid wars in the Mideast for the benefit of nobody, but at least the perceived benefit of Israel. In truth, it's not the, it doesn't benefit Israel either in the long run, but Israel thinks it does and Israel gets its way. That's why we've basically destroyed Iraq and Iraq did not have anything to do with 9-11. Israel was primarily responsible for 9-11. <laughs> How ironic. If you simply go to Bolin, B-O-L-L-Y-N, Bolin.com, an investigative reporter right out of Santa UCSC, excellent investigative reporter, and he's got a highly documented evidence uh, somebody saw this sign as immediately as I pulled it out as she was leaving and she said, I looked that up, that's pretty impressive. And I think anybody that does look this up might agree, it's worth a look. You don't have to hear the official version of 9-11 all your life, Bolin.com, thank you. Thank you, next speaker please. My name is Elise Casby. I wanted to take the opportunity to thank every single one of you. Um, I also want to share a couple of things. Most of you, I, my politics is different. My ethical system is probably different, and I believe that people's ethical and cosmology forms their political views. But I want to say that as much as you probably have not understood this, that I actually consider you some uh, really worthy opponents. I think there's been an amazing tolerance for my behavior a lot of times. I just want to say too that that, that is not completely impulsive. Um, for me, and I'm just speaking personally, I look at things and I do my research and I I reiterate, a lot of times I feel I'm looking at corruption. I look at, I feel I'm looking at what I call snow jobs. I'm not saying I know everything or whether that's true. But what I do want to say is that's part of why I justify my outburst because I'm so frustrated because I feel, for example, that we're gonna have no affordable housing after the research I did. I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong, Cynthia Chase. And it was great, really interesting listening to you. I just really want to say, even Rochelle, I went up to you to try to say this earlier, but I, I respect your opinions. I think you are an excellent politician and a worthy opponent. I hate your politics a lot of the time, but I really deeply appreciate you all, and I hope you'll still speak to me in the coffee shop, David. Definitely Thank will. you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. Next speaker. Uh, <laughs> I'm Aaron Singleton, I'm sure you all Next know. coffee's on me. Go ahead, Your Honor. Aaron Singleton, um, third generation. Um, I think you all know why I'm here. Um, what are we gonna do about the illegal internet games of torturing and tormenting people, especially myself? They have not quit. I was told I was gonna get paid by Bonnie. I have not gotten paid. I still get tormented, torturing, and I don't wanna take the city down when I can. I don't wanna be a bad guy. And I think you know a few other things have been illegal around here, like Colfax property disappearing and being sold under its feet. Um, I'm not gonna get into that. I think we all know it's, what's going on. Thank you. So make it right. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Gillian Greensight, I know you can't take any action tonight, but hopefully uh, at Oral Communications put a little um, thought in the city manager's ear or the parks and recreation director's ear. I'm on the wharf a lot. Usually I'm at my favorite restaurant, uh, but the other day I needed a new beach towel. So as I was walking home, I went into a couple of the stores that sell such things. And it was a very cold day, uh, it was raining and all of that. And in both of the stores, and I noticed other stores, the doors are wide open and the heaters are blasting. And there was no one in the store except myself and three <laughs> very bored looking people who were behind the counter selling things. Um, so since you own the wharf 
and most of the buildings on it. It seems to me, maybe you couldn't get downtown merchants to do this, but if the shop owners, the restaurants, most of them, or a lot of them have their doors closed, but not the other stores, uh, if they have a very big open sign in a couple of languages, I think people get the idea. And uh, there was a letter to this effect in this morning's Sentinel. I didn't write it, but obviously somebody else noticed the same thing in other places. And lastly, I just say all best wishes to the three of you who are leaving. I know you've never voted to save a tree. Um, however, I do respect um, the work you've done and the hard work you've put in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Okay, I, um, I handed out a letter that I wanted to include in the record, um, and I just was going to say, as you may recall, Edward Peter McGettigan, also known as Peter McGettigan, passed away on June 14th, 2018, in Santa Cruz. <laughs> He'd been a resident since 75, and I'd like to please, I ask that the next council please consider during the next council term the renaming of the room um, where community television records our city council sessions in honor of Peter. Um, it's something where we have to wait a year before that happens, and I'd like you just to consider that, and I just want this letter in the record to think about it moving forward. Yeah? Uh -huh. Thank you for doing that, Mr. Mayor. I really appreciate it. Peter was a close friend. Yeah. I was with him the night before. I'd given him right home. He was at the bus stop. And so, okay. So that closes our, um, our oral communications period at, you know, what is it now, 557. And um, we, again, we talked about this, the, um, the ADU item. Um, so, yeah, so do, what, what do we do? Just make a motion to move? So is there a motion to um, put this out to the next we meeting? We defer this item to as early in 2019 as reasonably practical, given that we have a new council coming on. Is that, is that? I believe the planning director has uh, requested that the council set a date certain, so. What would you suggest as a doable date? We have all the materials available. It's really the council's discretion. Uh, it, it does save us a little bit of effort um, in preparing additional notices. We have a, a huge mailing list of folks, but if we have a specific date certain, then the publishing would not be required in the paper and the, the right. cost and associated with that. And I'm just thinking that. everything that the new council members are gonna need to get oriented on, and this is gonna take some time. Uh, My motion second, was the second, second meeting, meeting in, in January. In January. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Does that sound doable? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, motion by Councilmember Matthew, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. So we will recess. Um, I'd say, let's say we'll return back at 7.15 um, just to give some time to get back for a meal. everyone um, hey, I just want to make sure that everyone is comfortable um, we've got another 50 or so people coming so just make sure there's a room next to you all right I'm joking <laughs> um, so 
We are here for the evening session, our 7 p.m. session of the December 4th, excuse me, the December 11th meeting of the City Council. I'd now like to ask the clerk to please call the roll when she gets back. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Very happy to be present. Matthew? Here. Sit here, yeah. Chase? Here. Brown? Here. Noroyan? Here. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Trump. And here. I'll have to say that we've been here since 8.30 a.m. and we're just about ready to go out. So we're a little, feeling a little punchy right now and um, we're ready to, to finish. Thank you, Chris Crone. Hi, I'll, I'll, David, I'll you, be you had us here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you set the agenda. Earlier this afternoon, the council confirmed and approved the November 6, 2018 general election results as submitted by the Santa Cruz County Clerk's Office. We begin this, e item, this evening with item uh, number one. And item number one is the remarks by outgoing council members, Cynthia Chase, Rochelle Noroyan, and myself. So I will begin with you, Cynthia. Well, I will um, make my comments brief. Um, mostly what I want to say is that tonight I am just filled with gratitude. It's been an incredible four years of um, an amazing opportunity to serve this community. I've been honored and blessed to do that. This is an incredibly engaged community and we are like no other. And I got a, you know many, many opportunities to meet and talk with and listen to a lot of folks who are in this room, a lot of folks who are out in the community and uh, I'm better for it. I hope our community is better for it. I'm really just pleased that I had the opportunity to interact with so many uh, people and I hope that I brought your voices to the council in as many votes as I could. Um, I'm also really grateful that I had the opportunity to serve with past and current council members. I learned a lot from them. This is not an easy job that we have. It's not like any other. People said, is it what you expected? And over and over I said, I didn't know what to expect and I would give that advice to everybody else because there's kind of no way to expect exactly what this position is like. Um, but I am appreciative of everything that we worked on together. I am also really grateful for the dedication and the commitment determination of this staff who works really hard every day to do things that are pretty much just keeping the city running. And so many people, I think, don't realize all the things that need to happen just to have clean water and their garbage picked up and paved streets and sidewalks um, and parks to play in and fire responding when there's emergencies. And so I just want to express my sincere gratitude to the staff who show up every day and do really hard work, sometimes because we've given them really complicated direction um, and ask them to do a lot of things and jump through a lot of hoops um, to make the community even better than it already is. So I just want to say again that I'm grateful for this opportunity. It was a pleasure to serve. And because I have now three times forgotten to thank my husband, <laughs> I will not forget to thank my husband who has not seen me pretty much for four years. So um, it will be great getting to know him. <laughs> and um, thank you all for being here tonight, for being the engaged community that we have. And thank you for the opportunity to serve. Councilmember Noroyan. So, so I would just like, first of all, to thank everyone for the opportunity to serve. Um, this is an incredibly unique experience, at least within my life up to this point. And um, I just want to thank all of you who supported me with your kind words and encouragement during the last four years. Um, none of us who run and or serve in office do this alone. And as the Hillary Clinton book title says, it takes a village. And I really learned that running for office and being in office. Um, I could not be more proud and absolutely grateful to my 
village. Um, I know all politicians, and this is going off of what uh, Council Member uh, Chase just did, like to thank their spouses. And I also too forgot to thank mine at um, a kickoff party uh, four years ago. So we're in the same boat in that, in, in that area. Um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and do it even though I know that he doesn't necessarily like um, getting shout outs and attention, but I do have to thank my husband, Jim Jensen, who not only was in charge of the lawn and big sign distributions for both campaigns, um, but he's been my sounding board, my rock, and my best friend through all of this. Um, he's been my best advisor, and I couldn't thank him enough. Um, just, you know, like I said, people say this, but it really does impose on the spouses and on the partners um, when you're in office, because they see a lot less of you. We depend on them a lot more to do the daily tasks that are needed to keep our households running and our lives going. And so um, I don't know how I'm going to show gratitude for him, but thank you very much, honey. So, uh, he deserves an applause. That's right, he deserves it. So, other parts of my village, I have to give a shout out to Gus Ceballos, who as my campaign manager and who's been a really good friend. Um, and like me, he grew up in Santa Cruz and we actually met at Mission Hill Junior High because we both played clarinet oh. in the band and then the clarinet in the marching band at Santa Cruz High. Um, and I thank his wife, Rachel Thompson Ceballos, uh, who I've even known longer since, um, since second grade. Um, and she let me borrow Gus even when she was starting her new food truck business, Union Foodie, check them out. Um, so, you know, a, a really busy time in her life, instead of Gus helping her, he was helping me. So I really appreciate that. Um, Holly Locatelli has kept us from getting nasty grams from the Fair Political Practices Committee for two campaigns. So she's been the campaign treasurer. Um, she serves her city also on the Parks and Recs Commission and raises money for FOPAR, an organization that gives scholarships to kids whose families can't afford classes through the Parks and Rec Department. Um, a big thanks to the rest of my, of my campaign committee, Robert DeFreitas, Robert Arizzi, Sharon DeJong, and James Goldwyn. They were all amazing and were just um, really supportive and I still am just struck by the hours of people will put in volunteer wise to support people that they really believe in or causes they believe in. It, um, it always just really blows me away. So to the new council, <laughs> I just wanna say when it comes to housing, it's really important today we passed a project that I wouldn't say was perfect, but it's really important to not let perfection get in the way of progress. We need both market rate and affordable rentals, and there are a lot of people who make a little more above being able to qualify for subsidized rental units. So we need to think of them too, and I just wanna say, let's not make Monterey and San Benito have to bear the brunt of us not developing enough housing in our community. Uh, infill, urban infill downtown is a lot better than them covering up ag land and, and wildlife areas. So. Um, I just really as a parting shot, I really hope you do look at housing and look at both affordable and market rate. Um, I just wanna say each issue has its nuances and I've learned I don't know everything. That's one thing this job will teach you is that you don't know a lot. <laughs> and listening to people from different walks of life is really important. I listen to a lot of people who I didn't think I, I would ever see or would request a meeting with me, but I did and I'm really glad that I did because they brought in a perspective I could never have because so many of us, some of us are landlords, some are renters, some are both, some people you know, have worked in the high tech industry, others haven't. So it's just really important to get those perspectives and it's really important, what really distressed me during the campaign around Measure M and I'm not accusing you know one side or everybody of doing this, but I heard a lot of assuming <laughs> I heard a lot of people making assumptions about folks and not sticking to the issue and not, you know, instead going for kind of those personal attacks. And I think it's really important that we don't assume, you know, somebody who owns a house is not necessarily home free. It's very hard to own a home in Santa Cruz as I can tell you my family story sometime if you're interested in it. Um, there are times when renting, um, you know, obviously isn't a breeze either in this market. So I think it's gonna be really important to talk to each other and try not to emulate the people who are in Washington right now. Um, you know, we all need to live with each other and we all live in the same community and see each other. So let's try not to go Trump on one another. <laughs> so, and in regards to um, the county relationship, 
you know, I just want to tell the new council, I, if I had a magic wand and had all the resources, I would love, love to have been able to do more in regards to solving our homeless problem. It's a true humanitarian crisis. Um, but honestly, we don't have the resources to address it on our own. And so really reach out to those other agencies. I think the state needs a bit more nudging to understand its role as well as the federal government. But if, you know, to do more than mitigate it, we're gonna have to bring in these other folks to, to work with us on this. And um, I really, really stress, and it was something that we just started doing, to join with other cities and, and become a loud voice, both in Washington and in Sacramento, um, for the services that we need. Uh, or else, what's gonna happen is if we don't have a World War II level effort to address this, this issue, we're just gonna be mitigating it. And I, I hope that we can get to a point of doing more than mitigating it. Um, and just remember that, you know, the county is the level responsible for health and human <laughs> services. So don't be afraid to lean on them a bit to take a little bit more of a leadership role in this. Um, look at Modesto, Stanislaus County is doing a lot of, um, they're, they're taking the lead. Um, in fact, a former city council member here, Tony Madrigal posted on his page, uh, Facebook page about um, all of the work Stanislaus County is doing um, to address their homeless problem. And so I really recommend giving that a read and maybe seeing if we can use that as a model. Um, you know, and while I believe more must be done immediately, we we really do need to, to lead um, or to, to take the lead in, in compelling other agencies to, to take, the, take this up like the city has. And to the public, I just wanna say, please fact check what you read on Nextdoor. You know, I, I was really astonished by how much time I took answering phone calls and emails, having to explain information on Nextdoor was incorrect. Um, and it was awful because you would see these discussions that there would be 50 comments and it was all based on something that completely wasn't true. And there was just this consternation and upset people and folks, you know, talking on and on about it. And then I would sometimes swoop in at that point and say, well, actually this isn't true. And then the conversation ended. So really, really fact check and um, not base assumptions on what you read there because I found that there were a few individuals too who would use next door and purposely put incorrect information out to create the drama and to create people to oppose a project. It's okay to oppose a project, but let's do it on facts. So I just, you know, to make it a little easier on the next council, that would be a great service to them to do. So maybe they don't have to spend so much time answering emails saying, nope, that's not true. So, but, um, you know, as I go off council, I know the things will go on. I hope um, the city continues to progress um, towards our goals of housing more of our individuals, having more housing choices. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the new council at work and, you know, know that those of us going off are, are available, of course I'm volunteering you guys right now, are available <laughs> for information and good luck. It's gonna be an interesting adventure. Thank you. Now it's my turn. I just want to say again, good evening to everyone. Um, I'd like to really express a warm welcome because this is our final meeting for this group of people right here to the, of the 2017 and 2018 term. It also happens to be the first meeting of our incoming newly constituted city council. And I'd like to really express my appreciation to those. that ran the civic gauntlet and uh, made it here today. <laughs> and again, welcome to everyone, our neighbors, fellow Santa Cruzans, for being here tonight to witness and celebrate the next chapter of our more than 150 years of civic self-government. For the past year, I have been honored to serve as the 95th mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, a whirlwind experience that has been both demanding and very rewarding. When your kids are young, they say the days are long, but the years are short. Here in our council chambers, as many of you can testify, the nights can be extraordinarily long. <laughs> but at the same time, my eight years of service on this council have simply flown by. I'd like to begin tonight by thanking family, friends, and community members who have supported me over the past eight years. And most importantly, I'd like to thank my wife, Monica, who's still with me, <laughs> and in the audience, I think, and my children, Isabella, 
who happened to be six years old when I first got on office eight years ago, Amalia, who was uh, eight, <laughs> or no, three, excuse me, three, <laughs> and then Nathaniel, who had just, just been born. They've all been so patient and kind to allow me to be here um, and to serve our city during this period, and I just really want to tell them how much I appreciate that and thank them. Their love and support um, that they give me every day of the year has not only been really fulfilling, but I hope you know they sometime will consider that public service is really an important part of their future as well. And for me, I'm deeply humbled to have been entrusted by the people of Santa Cruz to serve our city. Holding elected office here is a life-altering pr privilege. I truly love this city and feel very lucky every day to call Santa Cruz my home. Like every single person in this room, my dream for our city, I believe, is to move forward in solving our problems while protecting what's precious about our past and our present. Santa Cruz works best when our residents work together, embracing local solutions and rejecting the bitter factualism that is damaging our national discourse, identity, and in my opinion, our political institutions. I encourage everyone here to set aside div uh, divisive political ideologies and set our sights on solutions. We cannot solve issues like homelessness, mental health, public safety, and housing without regional cooperation. And regional cooperation requires our city to speak with a strong and united voice and to engage others with unified action. Let's seek that united voice as we push forward into the future. Let's talk to our neighbors and not just our friends. Our city and all those who have called this place their home are counting on us. Again, I wanna thank you all for your support and the honor of serving the city of Santa Cruz. Good night. <laughs> At this point is when we make the full handoff. I'm gonna do it right now. <laughs> so, this is where we leave the, the stage and allow some new uh, participants to take on over. pleasure to introduce the next item, which is the installation and remarks of the new council members. Um, the council member elects Justin Cummings, Donna Myers, and Drew Glover. At this time, our city clerk, Bonnie Bush, is going to swear you in. I, I Justin Cummings, Justin Cummings, do solemnly affirm, do solemnly affirm that, I will support and defend, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies foreign and domestic against all enemies foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States 
States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully, faithfully discharge. And I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. <laughs> on which way you're looking. I, Donna Myers. I, Donna Myers. Do you solemnly swear. Do you solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear a true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. That I will bear truth Faith, faith and, and, just, and justice and allegiance, and allegiance sorry, <laughs> to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I will take this obligation freely. That I will take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental purpose, sorry. Any, any, <laughs> any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or a purpose of evasion. Or a purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. That I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. All right. I, Drew Glover. Do you solemnly affirm? Do you solemnly affirm? That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will defend and support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I will Freely. That I will take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. <laughs> and that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. <laughs> the time for the uh, newly seated uh, council members to make their incoming remarks. And I'll start with you, Justin. And Come on in. Great. Well, I would first like to start by thanking my mother, who was able to make it here from Chicago tonight. <laughs> for her being um, so open and willing to allow me to travel all over without reservation, um, I wouldn't have found the place that I now call home. I'd also like to thank my other family members, but I'd uh, especially like to thank my campaign manager, Faz. 
helped get me to this point, and then my treasurer, Ross Albert. I would, and I'd, I'd also like to thank the, uh, the outgoing city council and the current city council members. This is not an easy job to take on, and it definitely is a service that few um, have the honor and privilege to provide to their community, but the people who get to these positions are doing it because they really care about the community that they live in and that they serve. Um, in addition to that, I'd like to thank all the people who supported my campaign, which many of you are in the audience and those people who are at home. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the people who ran. There were 10 of us this year who ran for city council, and out of the tens of thousands of people, we were the 10 who, who stood up and really wanted to make a difference by representing our community, and it takes a lot of courage. So I want to acknowledge all the people who actually stood up and have run this year and in previous years. And fin finally, I'd like to thank all the voters who got us to this point during this campaign season. Um, we are here to represent you. We are your voice here, and we want you to come to us at all times so we can make sure that we represent you appropriately. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to serve on the Santa Cruz City Council, and I'm excited to be here to represent the people in the place that I call home. Um, I'm really looking forward to and, com and I'm committed to working collaboratively with integrity and professionalism with the staff, with the other council members here, and the other people who represent elected officials within our county and throughout our state. Um, I really want to work to preserve the values of this place that we call home. I really want to be the ear an ear to everyone within our community and protect all the people who reside within it. At any point, if anyone wants to come to me, we may disagree on things, but I want to know that I want to hear your perspective so I know how to represent you appropriately and want to work with the rest of the members here so that we make the best decisions to make this a place that we can all live in. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for uh, coming out tonight and um, express uh, my deepest uh, gratitude to my wife, Bertie, of 33 years. Um, she, we have, uh, I believe we've, uh, I believe we've made a little history tonight in terms of who we represent um, on our city council right now. So. Um, I'm very proud to be part of the LGBT community, and uh, this is truly his, a historic night tonight for our community. So I want to start by recognizing that. Um, I want to thank my dear friend, Marta Beckwith, who was my treasurer. Um, we met the first day of college at UCSC, and we've been friends ever since. So Marta, thanks for everything. She's a busy mom, and she uh, really rocked being my treasurer, so thank you. Um, and I want to thank Allison Harley, who's somewhere in the back. Um, Allison was my campaign manager. And uh, we, neither of us really knew what we were doing, but um, apparently we did a pretty good job because we made it, and uh, we also had a really great time doing it. So, um, Allison, you will always be an important part of my life, so thanks for uh, sending me that email and having the coffee with me at Abbott Square because uh, we, we ended up doing a good thing. So thanks for your help. And uh, just briefly, my brother, my sister, a lot of longtime friends um, here tonight. So thank you all for coming out and thank you for helping with my campaign, signs, walking, dinners, uh, all of it. So the little red pot from uh, David and Leslie, my neighbors, uh, that would arrive with soup every week. Um, so thank you, everybody. And um, I am so excited to begin. I feel like uh, I've been waiting for literally 30 days to start this up. And um, I, uh, I'm just really excited. Uh, I feel very privileged to serve everyone here in Santa Cruz. I'm a, been here a long time. I've seen um, Santa Cruz do some extraordinary things. And, uh, you know, we've we designated one of the largest marine protected areas in the world. We recovered from a devastating earthquake. Um, we've had a lot of firsts in this town, and um, this body has always uh, truly been guided by fairness and um, 
really trying to do the best for all of the people here in this community. And um, I really truly hope, and I know I will be a council member who reaches across this place, this dais uh, daily. Um, I will reach across in my uh, communications with my fellow council members. Um, I will be available to anyone in the community that wants to talk to me about um, anything that's of importance to you or of concern to you. Um, and um, we will only solve these problems by working together. And uh, we are not alone as a city right now facing the issues that we face. This is uh, not only a California issue, it's a national issue. And we all need to um, lean in and put our arms around each other and not keep the ar at arm's length because we will not get there at arm's length. We have to uh, link our arms and uh, when we misbehave, I'll bring out the gunny sack and we'll get in that and we'll hop around on City Hall till we uh, figure it out. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've got to keep our humor. We've got to keep our compassion. Uh, we've got to keep our manners. And uh, we need to treat each other the way we would in the grocery store. And I ask that everyone in our community think about that when you step through these doors is that this truly is a place of privilege it's a recognition of our democracy and how we can be as people. And please, please treat everybody well. That will be the most important thing we can do in the next four years together. So please, um, we, were, we will always be here to listen to you, but we will his, listen a lot better if we can actually hear you um, through a quiet voice. So um, thanks for the uh, thanks for the privilege, and I really look forward to serving with these extraordinary people and learning from the people who have been up here before. So thank you. We must all learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will all perish together as fools. We are tied together in a single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. That's a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I chose to open with it because it's a quote rooted in empathy. It's a foundation is in the understanding that what affects one of us affects all of us. And I believe that we as elected officials must understand this and must exemplify this concept as an example for leadership. Good evening, everyone. I, yes, good evening. <laughs> uh, how exciting. Uh, I'm honored to be here with you today to accept the decision of the Santa Cruz community to allow me to serve you all as a member of the Santa Cruz City Council. I wanna thank those who helped me to ensure diverse representation on this body and allow for new perspectives to help guide us and the new the direction of the city. As one of the first two African-American male city council members in our city's history, I wanna say thank you. Also, also would like to say thank you to all of the outgoing city council members for their work. We may not have seen eye to eye on policy a lot of the time, but it takes a lot of energy and dedication to even go into this position, so I want to express my appreciation for the work that you've done. Uh, also, thank you to all of the campaign team, but um, most importantly, thank you to my mom. Uh, she was the one that got me here and is the reason why I am who I am today. So, now it's a time for a change of direction. It's time for a change of values. I believe that the results of the election communicate a shared desire across the community to see us move to embrace the values of equity, justice, empathy, and compassion. Values of fiscal responsibility, community empowerment, and diversity. And a belief in the, that in a modern, moral, and wealthy society, none should be too poor to live. <laughs> The No Place Like Home Project reported that Santa Cruz is the fourth least affordable place in the world, with over 24% of our population living under the poverty line. We have one of the highest rates of poverty in the state, 
Our median, or median rent jumped from $1,899 in 2013 to $2,834 in 2017. That's a 49% increase over the last four to five years with stagnant wages and limited job opportunities. We have an unacceptably high population of people experiencing homelessness and houselessness because any amount of people is too many. People having to fend for themselves in this bitter cold tonight uh, uh, without adequate shelter or food, many of them women and unaccompanied minors who are at risk of violence, abuse, and trafficking. We're faced with the reality of climate change, sea level rise, and the impacts that will have uh, the impacts that that will have on our most vulnerable communities. Our transportation system is broken with too many cars on the road and an ineffective public transit option, so our roads are congested and dangerous. The youth in our community lack adequate outlets for their creativity, development, and have limited places to turn for support. Our natural resources like water are being depleted. We have a severe lack of representation of people of color in leadership positions, and so many other critical issues need to be addressed. While we cannot remedy all these problems at the local level, it's my responsibility, our responsibility as elected officials to do everything we can to ensure equity and justice for all. We are capable of ensuring that we have basic frameworks where people can have shelter of some kind and move them into services. We are capable of offering our youth all of our youth support to gain access to college and trade schools. We're capable of pursuing a bold agenda on climate change to protect our future, and we are capable of having a moral and ethical economy. Each and every day, we all must dedicate ourselves to these causes. So, I'm looking forward to working with my peers on the council and city staff to actively get where we need to be and doing so in a way that builds community and strengthens relationships. After this election and the conversation around Measure M, Gesundheit, our community is broken, torn, and facing the reality of a great divide between certain groups. Now is our opportunity to rebuild, to come to the table with open minds and open hearts, ready to have difficult conversations about the direction we will take our city. We must be ready to face hard truths and make ourselves uncomfortable and ask ourselves if business as usual, tradition, and our current path is in fact the right choice. We must analyze past decisions and ask ourselves not only if they make economic sense, but even more importantly, if they make moral sense. <laughs> and in doing so, we can craft a framework to build a future that Santa Cruz not only needs, but what it deserves. These may seem like idealistic goals, but that's what they said about my choice to run a campaign on $13,000 and reused yard signs. In the words of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I'm optimistic in my goals, but pragmatic on how we can get there. I believe we can get there together. And quickly, uh, a word to my opponents, those who opposed my election and have called me an extremist. At first, it bothered me to think that someone would, uh, or people out there would cast a negative perception on my values that I hold really dear, or who would question my character for trying to achieve them being represented in local government. But then I remembered. I remembered the words of Dr. Martin Luther King in his letter from a Birmingham jail as a response to the Alabama clergyman who had called him and the nonviolent uh, civil rights movement extremists. In his response from a cold, narrow jail cell, he wrote, quote, I must admit that I was initially disappointed in being so categorized, but as I continue to think about the matter, I gradually gained a bit of satisfaction from being considered an extremist. Was not Jesus an extremist in love? Yes. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Was not John Bunyan an extremist? I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a mockery of my conscience. Was Abraham Lincoln not an extremist? This nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Was not Thomas Jefferson an extremist? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremist, but what kind of extremist will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? And so I ask those in our shared community, what kind of extremist will you be and what side of history will you be on?
I look forward to serving you, and thank you again to the community. On to the next item, which is the election and swearing in of the new mayor and vice mayor for 2019. And I'll hand it over to you, Bonnie, our city clerk. So we can start with the vice mayor for nomination for vice mayor. I nominate council member Cynthia Matthews for vice mayor. You need a second for that? A second? You don't need a second. All right. And shall we take the vote for that? Then? Other other nominations. Other nominations. Excuse me. Are there any other nominations? Yeah. Okay. Councilmember Crown. Hey everybody, how you doing? This past election is evidence that many in Santa Cruz want to go in a different way, in a new direction. Perhaps that might even be the road less traveled. Because right now we know almost every bump, rut, ditch, and broken pavement on the road we've been on. We have a chance to embark on a new path beginning tonight. Many new woke people came out and participated in this past election. Santa Cruz County saw the number of registered voters soar past anything they've seen before. This may very well be the largest number of voters that ever voted in a midterm election in Santa Cruz history. I'm sure there's many reasons why the turnout was so high, but I am convinced that one of them is the fact that people want change. Yeah. People are awful tired of the madness they see coming out of Washington, D.C., and many of those same people, newly registered voters and registered voters, wanted to do something and see something uh, they see where their country is headed and where their community is going, and they want to change Santa Cruz. My sense is that most people in this room want to see local government doing something different. New ideas for bringing affordable housing, more imaginative approaches to providing services and opportunity for the community's growing homeless population. Many want to just feel like their government is theirs, and it is here to serve the interests of not only those who already have but the majority struggling to come up with another $100 rent increase, or keep up with the escalating tuition costs, or maybe just searching for a safe place to park their car so they can sleep. Maybe government can do better for them. This past year, many of us unchanneled, uh, were, th th many of us were anxious and fretful and used our chaotic energy fo and focused it on real community change. Years from now, when our children and grandchildren look back on the second decade of Santa Cruz history of the 2000s, they may sense that positive changes were indeed taking root. This past year began with young people and old people, renters and homeowners, students and community activists pounding the pavement and gathering over 10,000 signatures to place a rent control initiative on the November ballot. Out of the initiative, a grassroots movement began and it grew right up to election day. Out of it came two African-American candidates for city council. And guess what? Santa Cruz elected Drew Glover and Justin Cummings to sit on the Santa Cruz City Council. While no one can predict the future, I am confident that history will reflect some big changes in the next few years. The years after two African-American men were elected to the Santa Cruz City Council for the first time. I believe this past election if it means anything, it meant that people want to go in a different direction. That is why I am proud, I am awed, and a bit overcome with emotion, because I will get to nominate Justin Cummings to be our next vice mayor for the city of Santa Cruz. You already likely know of his PhD in ecology, his teaching science, his, his job teaching science research skills to college students up at UCSC, and his love of punk rock. But you might not know he's also a hell of a campaigner, and he's going to make a great vice mayor. 
As Ayanna, uh, Ayanna Presley, the newly minted Congress member from Boston, said something in her victory speech recently that made me stop and think. She said, change can't wait. And it can't wait in Santa Cruz either. The election of both Martine Watkins and Justin Cummings will portray a community that is looking forward to solve their problems, not backward. So I ask my colleagues up here on the dais to join me in voting for Justin Cummings for vice mayor of the city of Santa Cruz. <laughs> I didn't realize I could speak to my nomination for council member Matthews. Can I? Well, maybe I'll just, I'll turn to council Mem member Matthews because I yes. saw her first. If you had a few words and then. That's fine. I appreciate Donna's interest to say a bit more. Um, uh, this, has been, this has been a really tough election season. I, I think there's not a person in the room who doesn't know that. A um, lot, of, lot of dedicated candidates and, um, but also a lot of, um, um, the toxicity level has been there, let's be honest. And uh, that's not a way that I wanna spend my last two years on the Santa Cruz City Council. Um, many people have talked about the uh, really intractable, much bigger picture problems that face our community, but I also think we have so much potential for good here, and we have so much potential for creativity, and we have so many people thousands more than are represented in this room who are invested and generous in so many ways with their community, and that is our strength. And I do appreciate Donna's nominating me, you know, under kind of the old format. Um, I'd be next in line, but I, um, I also don't want to perpetuate what I think is a really um, uh, divisive, perception that things happen on a 4-3 vote or a, a clear dividing line because I think that's not true. So I would be, uh, I thank you for your nomination, but I'm going to withdraw my name and I am happy to support Justin. Um, I have gotten to know Justin a bit in the course of the election, uh, really impressed with what I perceive <laughs> in our little brief acquaintance, um, your, your, your admirable motivation for wanting to run for public office, your intelligence, your spirit of wanting to reach out, be inclusive, be fair, um, and I hope to work constructively with all the council members, I hope we can put to bed as much of the divisiveness that has um, um, typified a lot of the, the recent few months. And uh, we'll take a break over the holidays. And I, I honestly do look forward to working with the entire council and our magnificent staff. Um, they work so hard and um, the community that I think of uh, each in their own way wants to do something to make Santa Cruz a great community. So thank you. Would you like to have the floor at this moment? Well, I would just like to uh, recognize um, Council Member Matthews. Um, <laughs> Cynthia Matthews has been working to protect women's health for generations. She established our health center here for women and families as part of the group of people who did that. She's worked tirelessly for Planned Parenthood. Um, I don't know of anybody in this town who has worked harder <coughs> to make this community a better place. Um, she was front and center after the earthquake, helped stitch this place back together. And um, I think it's important to recognize people who serve the community for generations, and that's what Cynthia has done. And she's done it well, and she's done the best that she can for our community. And uh, I nominated her tonight because I think it's important when someone's ending, you know, such a long run on city council and has contributed so much to our community that um, the fact that she did earn uh, under tradition um, to finish her last year as the mayor of Santa Cruz, I would have, uh, I would have liked to have seen that. And that's why I, I did nominate you. And uh, I think it's, um, 
very telling about who you are, that uh, you recognize that we do need to, uh, to come together now that we have a, a new council. And uh, so thank you for your words, but most importantly, thank you for your service. And uh, I look forward to working with you for the next couple of years. <laughs> I'll just add, I too want to thank you for your service to this community and- um, It's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to working with you for the next couple of years. <laughs> um, and for your uh, humble and hum humility this evening as well. Um, so is there any other nominations for my vice mayor at this time? Seeing none, uh, we will vote on that or I will turn oh, it over to the side. There is a vote, yes. There's a vote. Okay, all in favor of Justin Cummings for vice mayor this evening. Aye. 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 Any opposed? You can vote for yourself too. Oh, I did, I said I, yeah. <laughs> Passes unanimously. Now's the time for the election of mayor. Nomination for mayor. Mm -hmm. Brown. I'm not gonna make a big long speech, but I just, I, um, it, you know, it's, uh, we came onto the council at the same time and I feel like, you know, we've had a lot of first days at school together and um, it's been a pleasure to get to know you, um, Martine, um, and, uh, to um, really get a better understanding of your dedication to uh, your role, uh, serving the city, the people of the city, and the commitment that you bring, and the the um, the, the calm and um, the calm energy that you bring to uh, you know for all of us. So you know, I think it's it's going to be wonderful to work with you um, for the next two years, and I it's my pleasure to nominate Martine Watkins as our next mayor. <laughs> To have enjoyed. Thank you for the nomination. I'm honored and I too have enjoyed. Are there any other nominations for mayor? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Seeing none, uh, we'll go to vote then. All those in favor of the nomination for mayor? Aye. 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 <laughs> I now turn it over to our city clerk. And I will turn it over to Michael Watkins to swear you in. <laughs> the vice mayor, Bonnie. Hmm? Okay, uh, follow after me, okay? <laughs> it's a pleasure for me to be here and introduce my daughter as the uh, mayor. You know, we've been here for 40 years supporting Santa Cruz County, and uh, I'm in education, she's in politics, but uh, it's all the same, I guess, so. All right. Okay, so you announce your name after I say I, okay? I? Martine Watkins. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. And I will bear True faith. And I will bear true faith. And allegiance to the Constitution. And allegiance to the Constitution. Of the United States and the State of California. Of the United States and the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. And that I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Our purpose, our purpose of evasion. Our purpose of evasion. And that I will well. And I will well. And faithfully discharge. And faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. <laughs>
time, we'll have our vice mayor come down to be sworn in as well, or do I make my remarks first? Uh, no, we, we already sworn you in, in, so you're good. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you don't get to see All right. Um, so I was told I can get a few extra minutes, not quite as long as uh, our former mayor and council member Don Lane, but I have a few prepared remarks, so I, I appreciate in advance your attention. Um, I just wanna start by saying and sharing with you all my sincere expression of gratitude to our community, the people of Santa Cruz. I am privileged to be in this position and to serve our great city. And I am deeply honored to serve on the city council and now to assume the position of mayor. I have to begin by thanking a few folks. First, I wanna give my sincere appreciation to my colleagues who are exiting the council this evening. My sincere gratitude to you, David, Cynthia, and Rochelle for all your service to our city and for your leadership. I am thankful to have had the opportunity to work alongside you these past few years, and I wish you the absolute best. I also wanna thank those who are here tonight, and I look in the audience and I'm so warmed to see your faces, as well as those who couldn't come out this Tuesday evening. I am so grateful to have you in my life, and thank you for believing in me and for what I stand for. I have to thank my husband, Brandon, for your enduring support <laughs> and love and so much more. And I want to acknowledge and thank our beautiful, wonderful, smart daughters, Evangeline and Watkins Proctor, and Winnell Love Watkins Proctor, who are also here this evening. <laughs> you inspire me every day, and I'm lucky to be your mom, and I'm so proud of you both. I want to thank my parents, Michael and Ann Watkins, who are my foundation and who have guided me in my entire life. You've helped me embrace who I am as a woman of mixed heritage and appreciate all that accompanies experiencing life from that perspective. I wanna thank my brother who's here from Oakland in the back there for being so smart, my older brother that is, <laughs> keeping it real and always being there to support me. As well as my in-laws, Linda and Colin, you truly make up the village that allows me to participate in civic service in this way. Because as a mother of young children, there is no way I could be here doing this job without your support. I hold you here with me as I assume the position this evening. I want to thank our city staff for all your dedication and hard work. As you know, we have an incredible city. And I'm honored to be one of seven who serve on this council, but merely one of hundreds that keep and contribute to our city running every single day. One thing I know is that we share a deep appreciation and dedication to service at all levels of all of our staff and departments, parks, public works, water, management, senior management, council members, and everywhere in between. We all play a role in our shared success. My ideals and aspirations as a candidate, as a council person, as a, woman, as a vice mayor, and now as a mayor have really not changed. Orienting around really three things for me, which is integrity, community, and vision. And the first point I wanna make is to talk about my commitment to integrity. My commitment to being a person of integrity, authentic, open-minded, and reflective, a leader who strives to understand all perspectives. As an elected official, I believe it is our duty to demonstrate to our community members, to our children, that we can lead with integrity and we can govern from a foundation of respect. The second point I, I'd like to highlight is a bit about community and process. And I don't think I have to explain to anyone in this room or uh, to our colleagues up here that the, we have a number of challenges that we as a community face. Homelessness, the cost of living imbalance, affordability of housing, economic opportunity, climate change, rising pension and healthcare costs. And although hurdles, yes, absolutely, but they're not insurmountable. Our community issues are complex, they're inter interconnected, they cross city lines and boundaries, and I look forward to working with this council on solutions to the issues impacting our city today, but as well as to have the foresight to prepare for the future and what lies ahead. We are so lucky to have an engaged and dedicated community. Over the past few years, I am often inspired by community members who come with incredible insights. They share experiences that we need to know and be made aware of, but they also often come with solutions and ideas to how to overcome those. 
And as a council, we are elected based on who we are and what we represent as individuals. But once seated, we shift our roles from candidate or activist to a member of a governing body. And as mayor, I will inspire to enroll the council to find alignment, to foster a policy agenda that incorporates community input, that builds on the work of previous councils, but ultimately allows us to get things done for the current and future residents of Santa Cruz. Because yes, we can be both pragmatic and action oriented, and it's up to us to seek alignment in the interest of progress. And this leads me to my other point, which is a vision towards health equity and prevention in children. And I close with vision because I believe that integrity, community, and process are the essential elements necessary to have in place before vision can be actualized and ultimately become reality. And as I enter into the role of mayor, I intend to inspire the council to focus on health equity in children. And health equity in children are essentially interconnected because healthy futures for all Santa Cruz children must be rooted in the need for Santa Cruz to be a healthy and vibrant community. And when a community is thriving, we all stand to gain. And community health is influenced by more than just individual choices. And when speaking about health or community health or well-being, I'm referring to what is often described as the social and physical determinants of health, where you're born, where you live, where you work, where you play, and where you age. These circumstance, circumstances are often responsible for inequities, but with intention can be mitigated and avoidable. Every decision we make as a city government influences how we live, learn, work, and play. And policies, and, influence, and policies that influence our experiences are typically developed by um, agencies other than health departments, such as fire, police, planning, public works, parks, or economic development. And I think it's clear that we cannot put health in a silo for others to address, separate from how our residents experience the services of our city. And a few months ago, I was so proud that our city council voted to create a subcommittee to explore the health and all policies public health framework. And you may ask, what is health and all policies? Well, health and all policies is a collaborative public policy approach that incorporates health considerations into decision making across every branch of city government and policy area. And the health and all policies framework is essentially about doing things differently to increase efficiency and Im impact. So whether you're in the police department, fire department, planning, public works, the orientation of services can be centered positively to impact the social and physical determinants of health. And my focus is to find the best way for us to institute this framework throughout all that we do, so that no matter the decision we make, we'll be reminded to design policies that, for example, sustain our beautiful natural environment in the face of global climate change and the potential impact of environmental injustices. Policies that foster safe and accessible neighborhoods and parks for all residents, not just some, from the Upper West Side to the East Side to the Beach Flats. Supporting affordability of housing for everyone at every stage of life. Yeah. Finding creative ways to support people struggling to live and work here due to the cost of living imbalance of our region. Continue to invest in all types of transportation options, walkable communities, safe routes to school, access to healthy foods, clean water and air, economic vibrancy and employment options, and sound fiscal sustainability. It's how we weave these all together. Because ultimately, when departments and agencies understand the health implications of their decisions, as well as support other institutions in expanding their responsibility for health, collectively, we can improve conditions for all people in Santa Cruz. And over the past several years, throughout the country and state, the health and all policies framework has been tailored to meet, meet individual communities' needs. And although they, although they vary in application, many share common elements, encompassing, encompassing collaboration, planning, and advancing public policy decisions, investing in change, and applying data-driven approaches for continuous improvement and accountability. And they're seeing results, and I think Santa Cruz can too. And I'm ready to get to work. And knowing our city government plays a role in ensuring all children raised in Santa Cruz, regardless of their neighborhood or background, we will be able to live healthy lives, which brings me to my other aspiration, which is to have and support upstream prevention policies. 
And it is my hope that the new council will continue to find ways to make sure that every child in our community is given the best opportunity in life. And as our former President Obama said, that the size of your patient paycheck should never determine your child's future. And the science and data is clear in regards to the social returns we yield when we make these investments. Investing in children is public safety, it's community well-being, it's economic development, and it's tied to affordable housing. And we all know that there is a pressing and increasing need for families and working people in our city. I don't think we'll find a hardworking family or parent trying to raise their child in Santa Cruz who doesn't seek a safe, uh, thriving learning enrichment environment for their kids. And I wanna thank the previous councils for their work on establishing a dedicated children's fund for the city of Santa Cruz, focusing on early childhood development, vulnerable youth and prevention. This action truly put Santa Cruz on the map as a model for local governments to create set aside funding resources to support our community's children. I also want to thank the Santa Cruz City Council uh, for making a recent decision to make Santa Cruz healthier and stopping big tobacco from getting our youth hooked on uh, tobacco products by selling them and marketing flavored tobacco to them. We limited and banned flavored tobacco recently. And it's these types of policy actions that we must continue to make. And they pave the way for all Santa Cruz children to be given the best shot in, in life. And as a result, we all win. And I think my supervisor, uh, who knows me well, would say I have a lot of vision. So I'll just stop there in the interest of time. But I'll say one last thing. We as local leaders can see and feel the impact of the decisions we make. It's a gift. And I've been honored until, and until, and to be elected to serve this community. And I look forward to embarking on the journey with the newly elected council to ensure and sustain uh, our beautiful city. So with that, thank you so much. I Unless there's any additional remarks from the vice mayor, I will I'll let ask if you have mayor. any, since you already, <laughs> however you'd like. I would just like to say, um, again, it's an honor and a privilege to be in this position. I want to also um, acknowledge um, Cynthia Matthews and all her um, years of dedication and work to that she's put in in the city. Um, I'm just beginning this trajectory, and I know that I have a lot to learn, and I'm gonna be looking to work with the people from our community, the former elected officials, the people on this um, dais, and the people within our community so that I can be the most effective city council ma uh, member as possible and the most effective vice mayor as possible. And so I thank you all for this opportunity to serve and represent our community once again and I've already said enough earlier, so I, I will leave it at that, but I wanna thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Cummings. Uh, Councilmember Brown, I wanna acknowledge you. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. Uh, before we adjourn, I, I have a couple of things that I wanna say, and I'm, I'm gonna make a motion here because I um, have, tend to, stick with business. Um, I, this is an evening of celebration and uh, recognition of uh, the, um, you know, the change that we're making here. And you know, I know I hate change, but I'm actually very excited for, uh, to work with my new colleagues. And um, so um, I'm glad you're all here. But um, we have some business that is um, what I consider to be quite pressing. And we're gonna be uh, taking uh, hiatus until January 8th. So, and there are a lot of people in this community who are unsure about um, what's going to be happening. Speaking of, you know, how our policy decisions, um, you know, we feel um, the effects of those decisions um, and people will continue to feel the effects of our decisions through the holidays while we're on break. So with that, I wanna provide some um, indication of uh, where I'm interested in going. And, and um, this is, I've consulted with our city attorney about this. I've consulted with the um, new mayor um, about the how we do this. So I just wanna make a, a brief motion. We, with little fanfare, little discussion, 
to assure uh, people in the community that we will be taking up uh, the question of um, tenant protections and um, uh, trying to engage in a, a real meaningful community conversation to take people up on the demands they've made on all sides of the issue um, to come together. And so I wanna just move that we um, direct staff to come back to us at our January 8th meeting um, with a proposal regarding uh, the, the resources, uh, including funding and staff time for, uh, to, for some kind of task force comprised of community stakeholders, um, including but not limited to uh, landlords, big and small, tenants and others uh, regarding um, policy options around tenant protections from evictions without cause and other relevant measures for the longer term uh, for a three month period somewhere around there. Um, but I'd, I'd like that to come back to us on the 8th so that people know that, that we're really serious about having that conversation as well as um, an ordinance um, extending the joint, uh, the, the just cause eviction provisions um, that we pass as a temporary measure. I wanna be really clear when I say that, and I don't wanna take up too much time here, but I wanna be really clear when I say that. This is not about um, passing Measure M de facto, or you know, through the council post election. This is about um, limited protections with with pretty extensive uh, exemptions, and I think that it's worth uh, having that conversation as a council in the new year. So I'd like that to come back to us as well. I have uh, some materials that I'd be happy to give to you, um, Mayor Watkins, and to the city attorney, and I've offered up myself to work on that over the break so that we can come back and, and really have that discussion. Um, that's my motion. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Okay, seconded by Council Member Crone. Is there any further discussion amongst the council at this time? Council Member Crone, again. All right. Well, um, nope, I'm making a public comment here. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Then we'll just take the vote. I assume. <clears throat> okay. Yes, um, it, it is appropriate to add an item to a future agenda right. uh, without it being on this agenda, but um, no discussion. Uh, or very limited discussion can be had and, and oral communications would not be appropriate under those circumstances. Okay. So this is simply accepting that we would be adding this item to the future agenda, okay? But I, I believe it requires a second. And There's a second, Councilman Yeah. Okay, all right, at this time, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Aye. Okay. This time, I'd like to adjourn the meeting and offer you all uh, to go next door to the Civic for a reception. And thank you all so much for being here. So the meeting. Is <laughs>